Hello, and welcome to the CompTA Storage Plus course. In this module, we will look at the syllabus of the CompTA Storage Plus course, and then we will look at the CompTA Storage Plus exam overview. This course is based on the objectives of the CompTA Storage Plus certification exam, SGO-001. Businesses' digital data is growing at an exponential rate, so it becomes necessary to efficiently store and manage this data but there will be a shortage of IT staff with storage administration skills. CompTA Storage Plus certification will help IT professionals be prepared to work with multi-vendor technologies that support storage. Now let's talk about the modules that we're going to cover in this course. The modules are Mechanical Disk Drives, Solid State Storage, Storage Arrays, RAID, Fiber Channel SAN, IP SAN, Converged Networking, Replication, Backup and Recovery, Storage Management, Storage Performance, and Troubleshooting. In the module titled Mechanical Disk Drives, we will introduce you to the hard disk drive, and then we will talk about the hard disk drive interfaces and protocols. We'll also talk about the geometry and characteristics of the hard drive. In the Solid State Storage module, we will talk about solid state storage, such as flash memory. In the Storage Arrays module, we will introduce you to storage arrays, and then we will talk about the storage array architecture. In the RAID module, we will introduce you to RAID, and then we will discuss the RAID organization. In the Fiber Channel SAN module, we will get in-depth into the Fiber Channel SAN. We will start off the module by introducing you to storage area networking, and then we will talk about the Fiber Channel architecture. We'll also cover the components of Fiber Channel SAN and the topologies that are involved. We will also talk about the characteristics of a Fiber Channel switch, followed by a discussion on endport ID virtualization. In the IP SAN module, we will introduce you to IP storage area networking with a focus on iSCSI SAN. In the Converge Networking module, we will introduce you to Converge Networking that combines Ethernet technology and Fiber Channel technology with a specific coverage on Fiber Channel over Ethernet, or FCOE. In the same module, we will also focus on the data center operations. In the replication module, we will introduce you to replication technologies, and then we will discuss the types of replication. In the backup and recovery module, we will introduce you to backup and recovery processes, methods, and implementation. We will also talk about backup targets, and in the same module, we will also talk about content addressable storage and archives. In the storage management module, we will talk about capacity optimization methods, LUN provisioning techniques, storage virtualization, and then we will talk about monitoring and alerting. In the storage performance module, we will discuss how latency and throughput affects the storage performance. In the last module, called Troubleshooting, we will explain how to troubleshoot the common fiber channel problems and LAN problems. Now we will take a look at the certification exam overview. The certification exam consists of 100 theory questions, and you have to complete the exam in 90 minutes. The passing score is 720 out of 1000, and the exam code is SGO001. You can take the exam at pearsonview.com. That brings us to the end of this module. In this module, we looked at the syllabus of the CompTA Storage Plus course, and then we looked at the exam overview of the CompTA Storage Plus exam. In the next module, we will learn about hard disk drives. So let's get started. Hello and welcome to Unit 1, Introduction to the Disk Drive. In this lesson, you will learn about the disk drive, and specifically, you will learn about the hard disk drive technologies. We're going to start this lesson by looking at what a disk drive is, and then we will take a look at the hard disk drive. We will then briefly talk about the history of the hard disk drive. The next thing we will do is take a detailed look at the mechanical components of the hard disk drive. You'll be curious to know how the data is written to the hard disk drive, so we will talk about the read-write process of the hard disk drive. 
we will then talk about the hard disk controller board that interfaces the hard disk drive with the rest of the computer. When talking about the hard disk controller, we will also touch upon the addressing scheme called Logical Block Addressing, or LBA. Last but not least, we will also take a look at the hard disk drive interface that connects the hard disk drive to the host computer. Let's begin with the disk drive. So, what is a disk drive? A disk drive is a storage device that uses a disk for storing and retrieving data. The term disk drive popularly represents the hard disk drive, even though there are other types of disk drives, such as a floppy disk drive or an optical disk drive. A hard disk drive is a storage device that contains one or more rigid disks for storing and retrieving data. Before we go in-depth talking about the mechanical components, let's spend some time on the history of the hard disk drive. It would be surprising to know that the hard disk drive technology is more than 55 years old, and we're still relying on it for our storage needs. The world's first hard drive was named IBM 350 Disk Drive and was invented by IBM in 1956. It was the first storage device with random access to data and was a key component of the IBM 305 computer systems. The IBM 305 data processing system, combined with the 350 disk drive, became known as the RAMAC, which stands for Random Access Method of Accounting and Control. The IBM 350 disk drive consisted of a stack of 50 magnetic disks that were 2 feet in diameter. Data was recorded on each side of the disk in circumferential tracks. The IBM 350 disk drive stored 5 million characters, and in today's computing terms, it was less than 5 megabytes of data. The hard disk drive is the slowest part of a modern-day computer because it contains mechanical components that have physical movements. The graphics on the slide show the internal components of a hard disk drive. The major mechanical components of the hard disk drive are the platter, spindle, actuator, arm, and head. These components are enclosed in a dust-free compartment called a head disk assembly. Now let's talk about these components one by one. So, what is a platter? A platter is a disk that stores the data. It looks like a CD or a DVD and is usually made up of aluminum alloy, which is rigid in nature. Apparently, the hard disk gets its name from the rigid nature of the platters. The most common form factor, or the size of the platter, is 3.5 inches. The top and the bottom surfaces of the platter are coated with a magnetic material that allows data to be recorded magnetically on its surface. The data is actually stored on the magnetic media of the platter by aligning the field of the media particles on the surface. The data thus stored is non-volatile, meaning that it is retained even when there is no power supply. A hard drive is composed of multiple platters that are stacked on top of each other, as you can see in the diagram. The platters are held together by a central axis called a spindle, which in turn is directly attached to a rotating motor called the spindle motor. So, when the spindle rotates, all the platters rotate at the same time with the same speed. The platters of the fastest hard disk drive rotate at a speed of 15,000 revolutions per minute. Now, let's look at the actuator. The actuator is responsible for moving the read-write arm in and out across the surface of a rotating platter. It positions the read-write heads precisely to a specific location on the spinning platter. There is only one actuator for a hard disk assembly. An extension to the actuator is the read-write arm. The read-write arm contains the read-write heads that are mounted at its ends. Now let's talk about the read-write head. The term read-write head is a mouthful, so it is sometimes referred to as head. A head is an interface that reads and writes data to the platters. There are two heads for each platter. One head is mounted on the top side of the platter, and the other one is mounted on the bottom side of the platter. 
Since the heads are attached to the actuator, they all move at the same time. The read-write head never touches the surface of the platter while it is writing or reading data, but it floats extremely close to the surface of the platters. The minute distance between the head and the surface of the platter is referred to as flying height or floating height, or head gap, and it is measured in terms of nanometers. In modern drives, the flying height is generally about 3 nanometers. If you're wondering how small a nanometer is, then here it is. One nanometer is one million times smaller than a millimeter. It should be noted here that if the head accidentally touches the spinning platter, then it would not only damage both the head and the surface of the platter, but it will also damage the data stored on the disk. This type of hard disk failure is called head crash. However, when powered off, the head will rest in contact with the platter. Since hard drives are susceptible to disk failures, it is very important that we back up the data stored on them. During the write process, the heads write the data to the platters by aligning the magnetic field of the magnetic particles that pass under them. The polarity of the magnetic field of the particles will depend on whether a bit 1 or bit 0 is written. An unchanged polarity is considered as bit 0, and a changed polarity is considered as bit 1. During the read process, the heads detect the polarities of the already aligned magnetic particles that pass under them and convert them into electrical signals. It then transmits these electrical signals to the hard disk controller. Now let's talk about the hard disk controller. The hard disk controller board is a printed circuit board, PCB, that is attached to the chassis of all modern hard disk drives. Such hard disk drives are also called Integrated Drive Electronics, or IDE, because they have the hard disk controller attached to it. The hard disk controller contains a microprocessor, memory, and firmware. The firmware of the hard disk controller controls the internal parts. For example, it controls the positioning and movement of the actuator arm. The hard disk controller interfaces the hard disk drive with the rest of the computer. It allows the movement of the data in and out of the hard disk drive. The hard disk controller also provides an important functionality of mapping the physical addressing structure of the disk to a logical addressing that the computer system can understand. The logical block addressing, or LBA, is a simplified addressing scheme that hides the complexity of the physical addressing structure. Now, let's look at the hard disk drive interface. The hard disk drive interface is a part of the hard disk controller. It contains a physical connector that connects the hard disk drive to the host computer. The primary function of the hard disk drive interface is to provide a standard protocol for the hard disk drive to talk to the host computer. There are many types of hard disk drive interfaces, and each one supports a particular protocol. For example, the SATA drive uses the SATA protocol. The major hard disk drive interfaces are SCSI, SATA, SAS, and FC. We will discuss more about them in the upcoming videos. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you learned in this lesson. In this lesson, we saw what a disk drive is, and then we looked at the hard disk drive. We spoke in brief about the history of the hard disk drive, and then we looked in detail at the mechanical components of the hard disk drive. While talking about the read-write head, we also looked into the read-write process of the hard disk drive. We then talked about the hard disk controller board that interfaces the hard disk drive with the rest of the computer. We also touched upon an addressing scheme called Logical Block Addressing, or LBA. At the end of this lesson, we looked at the hard disk drive interface that connects the hard disk drive to the host computer. In the next lesson, we will talk about the hard disk drive interfaces and protocols. Thanks for watching.
Hello, and welcome to Unit 2, Hard Disk Drive Interfaces and Protocols. In this lesson, you will learn about the hard disk drive interfaces and protocols. We will begin this lesson by recalling what a hard disk drive interface is, and then we will see what a protocol is. We will then take a detailed look at the major types of hard disk drive interfaces and protocols, such as ATA, SATA, SCSI, SAS, and Fiber Channel. Let's begin with the hard disk drive interface. The hard disk drive interface is a part of the hard disk drive controller that connects the hard disk drive to the rest of the computer. It provides a standard protocol for the hard disk drive to talk to the host computer. We can think of the standard protocol as a language that is used for communication, and we can define it as a set of rules and communication standards. The major types of hard disk drive interfaces are ATA, SATA, SCSI, SAS, and Fiber Channel. ATA and SATA are widely used in the low-end computing market, whereas SCSI, SAS, and Fiber Channel are used in the high-end enterprise market. We will first look at the ATA interface. ATA stands for Advanced Technology Attachment. It is the most common interface that is used to connect the hard disk drive to the host computer. The hard disk drives with ATA interfaces are called Integrated Drive Electronics, or IDE, because the controller board is integrated with the hard disk drive. There are two types of ATA, PADA and SATA. PADA stands for Parallel ATA. It is an older ATA, and it is characterized by slower data transfer rate. PADA uses a 40-pin ribbon cable that connects the IDE drive to the computer's motherboard and transfers 16 bits of data in parallel over the cable. The recommended cable length is 18 inches. SATA stands for Serial ATA. It is a newer ATA, and it is characterized by faster data transfer rate. SATA uses a thinner 7-pin data cable that connects the SATA drive to the computer's motherboard and transfers data in a serial manner that is one bit at a time. The length of the internal SATA cable can be up to one meter. SATA supports hot swapping. Hot swapping is a feature that allows plugging or unplugging a SATA drive when the computer is running. This feature is also called hot plugging. Hot swapping does not mean we can unplug the drive while the data is being written to it because such action will only corrupt the data. Now we will look at eSATA or external SATA. The internal SATA bus can be extended to connect external hard disk drives through external SATA. The computer's motherboard or the expansion card of the computer can provide us an external SATA or eSATA port to plug in external SATA drives. The external SATA drives use a special external shielded cable which can be up to 2 meters long. SATA drives come in three versions. SATA 1, SATA 2, and SATA 3. SATA 1 has a data transfer rate of 1.5 gigabits per second, with a maximum throughput of 150 megabytes per second. SATA 2 has a data transfer rate of 3 gigabits per second, with a maximum throughput of 300 megabytes per second. SATA 3 has a data transfer rate of 6 gigabits per second, with a maximum throughput of 600 megabytes per second. SATA is backward compatible with PADA drives using a SATA bridge. This means we need to have a SATA bridge attached to the PADA drive to make it compatible with SATA. Hard disk drives implement a technique called queuing for disk optimization. The queuing technique implemented by SATA drives for faster read-write operations is called native command queuing, or NCQ. Now let's talk about SCSI, which really is not a hard disk drive interface. We have included it under this topic because it is mainly used for hard disk drives. So what exactly is SCSI? SCSI stands for Small Computer System Interface. SCSI is a parallel system level interface that connects various devices to a single common cable called the SCSI bus. The SCSI bus is connected to the SCSI host adapter card and all the devices on the SCSI bus communicate with the host computer through the SCSI host adapter card. So, in SCSI architecture, the host computer communicates with the devices 
via the parallel SCSI bus. The SCSI host adapter card is plugged into the expansion slot of the host computer. The SCSI host adapter and the devices connected to the SCSI bus form a single daisy chain. The number of devices that can be connected to a single SCSI bus can either be 7 or 15 devices, based on the SCSI standard that is being implemented. These devices, for example, can be hard disk drives, CD DVD drives, tape drives, printers, and scanners. Each device on the SCSI bus, including the SCSI host adapter, is assigned a unique number between 0 and 15. The number assigned to the device is called the SCSI ID. The SCSI host adapter manages all the devices in the SCSI bus using their SCSI IDs. The SCSI host adapter itself is assigned the number 7, which has the highest priority over all the other devices. In order to avoid signal interference on the SCSI bus, we must have terminators at both ends of the SCSI bus. Some devices will have built-in termination that can be enabled. In the absence of built-in termination, a hardware device called a terminating resistor can be used. SCSI is an interface developed for high-performance servers. There are three major versions of SCSI, SCSI 1, SCSI 2, and SCSI 3, but they are commonly known as Regular SCSI, Fast SCSI, and Ultra SCSI, respectively. Earlier, we saw Native Command Queuing, NCQ, the queuing technique implemented by SATA drives. SCSI also uses a powerful queuing technique called Command Tag Queuing. It queues multiple commands to a SCSI drive. Command tag queuing improves performances because it establishes an efficient way of ordering and processing the I.O. commands to the SCSI drive. Let's look at the communication that takes place on the SCSI bus. At any given time, communication takes place only between two devices on the SCSI bus. The device that initiates or sends a command to another device is called the initiator. The device that performs the requested command is called the target. Now let's look at the protocols that are used for data transfers in SCSI. There are two SCSI protocols, asynchronous SCSI protocol and synchronous SCSI protocol. In asynchronous SCSI protocol, acknowledgement is required for each data transfer and cannot be delayed, which results in propagation delays. In synchronous SCSI protocol, an acknowledgement is required for each data transfer, but it can be delayed, hence there is no propagation delay. Now let's talk about SAS. SAS stands for Serial Attached SCSI. Serial Attached SCSI is the serial version of the SCSI interface. It uses a point-to-point -point serial protocol and the SCSI command set. The second generation SATA disk drives are compatible with SAS and can be connected to the SAS backplanes. On a SAS backplane, SATA2 and SAS drives can exist side by side. However, SAS drives cannot be connected to the SATA backplanes. In serial attached SCSI, the devices are connected directly to the SCSI port rather than connecting to the SCSI bus. The advantage of this is that the bandwidth is not shared with other devices, and as a result, higher transfer speeds are achieved. SAS drives have dual ports that provide redundancy and that make them an ideal option for building external storage arrays. The redundancy results from the fact that each port on the SAS drive can be connected to a different controller of the external storage array. So if one controller fails, the other one can take over the SAS drive. It should be noted that the ports in the dual ported SAS drive work in active passive mode. This means that only one port can be active at a time. Now let's look at the fiber channel. Fiber channel is a serial interface that allows data to be transferred serially over fiber optics or copper cable. It was developed for enterprise storage systems to provide performance, scalability, and redundancy. In addition to providing a high-speed serial data transfer rate, the fiber channel interface also provides built-in redundancy through the dual port access to the fiber channel disks. The fiber channel protocol, or FCP, is the transport protocol that can transport SCSI commands and IP commands over fiber channel networks. The fiber channel protocol permits a huge number of hard disk drives to be connected to a fabric topology. You will learn more about fiber channel in a module dedicated to fiber channel storage area network. That brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. 
In this lesson, you recalled what a hard disk drive interface is, and then you learned what a protocol is. We then covered in detail the major types of hard disk drive interfaces and protocols, such as ATA, SATA, SCSI, SAS, and Fiber Channel. In the next lesson, you will learn about the hard disk drive geometry. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 3, Hard Disk Geometry. In this lesson, you will learn about the hard disk drive geometry. We will begin this lesson by recalling what you've learned about the platters of the hard disk drive. And then, with the help of a diagram, we will see how to identify the sides of the platters on which the data is stored. We will also see how the disks are organized into tracks and sectors. And then we will look into the zoned data recording. Next, we will see what a cylinder is and then we will look into low-level formatting. Last but not least, we will look into the data addressing schemes, such as CHS addressing and logical block addressing. We know that the hard disk drive contains one or more platters, and the data is stored on the magnetic media coded on the surface of a platter. A platter has two sides that are used for recording data. On the slide, you can see the diagram of the platters that are stacked on top of each other. Each platter has two sides. If we want to point out where the data is located, we will have to first mention the side of the platter on which the data is stored. In our diagram, the top side of the first platter is depicted as side 0, and its bottom side is depicted as side 1. Similarly, the top side of the second platter is depicted as side 2, and its bottom is depicted as side 3. Each platter has two read-write heads to read and write data on both of its sides. In our diagram, we have head 0 to read and write data to side 0, and head 1 to read and write data to side 1 of the first platter. Similarly, head 2 reads and writes data to side 2, and head 3 reads and writes data to side 3 of the second platter. The surface of each side of the platter is divided into concentric circles called tracks. On the slide, you can see a platter with the spindle at its center. The surface of this platter is divided into tracks. Each track is of different size and is shown by a different color in the diagram. The tracks in the outer rings are longer. The outermost track is numbered 0, and the numbers increase as we move towards the inner rings. A typical hard disk drive can have more than 2,000 tracks per inch on the recording surface. The tracks are further divided into smaller, addressable units, and each such unit is called a sector. A single sector holds 512 bytes of data. A byte is a unit of memory size that can hold a single character. When you look at the diagram, you will notice that the inner tracks have fewer sectors compared to the outer tracks. This is because the outer tracks are bigger, and as expected, they have more area to squeeze in more sectors compared to the inner tracks. In our diagram, the inner tracks have 8 sectors, and let's say we want to further divide it equally into 16 sectors. This is just not possible because the size of the sectors will become smaller, and as a result, they cannot hold 512 bytes of data. The outer tracks in our diagram have 16 sectors, and let's say we want to go down from 16 sectors to 8 sectors. In that case, we are just wasting space because each sector would have the capacity to store more than 512 bytes of data. In order to prevent the wastage of storage space, we have divided the surface of the platter into two zones, the inner zone and outer zone. In our diagram, the inner zone consists of three inner tracks, and the outer zone consists of four outer tracks. The tracks in the outer zone can squeeze in more sectors than the tracks in the inner zone, resulting in maximum utilization of the storage space on the surface of the platter. This technique of squeezing in more sectors in the outer zone then in the inner zone is called Zoned Data Recording, or ZDR. So far in the lesson, we discussed tracks and sectors. We will now talk about cylinders. So what is a cylinder? We know that a hard disk drive is made up of platters that are stacked on top of each other. The platters consist of tracks, and if we look at a particular track, let's say a third track, on all the platters, then they are stacked directly on top of each other, 
and together they appear to form a cylinder, as shown in the diagram. So the locations of a specific track on all the platters form a cylinder. We saw how the surface of the platter is divided into tracks and sectors. The process of forming the tracks and sectors on the surface of the platter is called low-level formatting, and it is typically done by the hard disk drive manufacturers. During the low-level formatting, the address is written into the sectors, and also the starting and ending points of each sector are marked on the platter. When the low-level formatting is complete, the platters become ready to hold 512 bytes of data in each sector. Now let's look at how data is addressed on a hard disk drive. There are two methods to address data, CHS addressing and logical block addressing. The first method is CHS addressing. CHS stands for Cylinder Head Sector. Each CHS address is composed of a cylinder number, a head number, and a sector number. In this type of addressing, the value of the cylinder tells us on what track the data is located. The value of the head tells us on which platter the data is located. The value of the sector points to the sector to where the data is located. So, in a CHS addressing, the combination of cylinder, head, and sector tells us exactly where the data is located on the disk drive. The second method is LBA addressing. LBA stands for Logical Block Addressing. In the Logical Block Addressing scheme, the sectors of the hard disk drive are sequentially numbered starting from zero, with each sector getting a unique logical address. For example, the first sector will be addressed as Sector 0, the second sector will be addressed as Sector 1, and this continues until the last physical sector. It's interesting to note that the first logical sector addressed in LBA that is, sector 0, is the same as the first logical sector addressed in CHS addressing, that is, cylinder 0, head 0, and sector 1. Both CHS addresses and LBA addresses are logical addresses of the sectors. The hard disk controller does the conversion of the logical address into a physical address through a translation process. Though CHS is a logical address, it was conceptualized based on the physical parameters of the hard disk drive, such as cylinder number, head number, and sector number. Cylinders are numbered from 0 to a maximum of 65,535. Heads are numbered from 0 to a maximum of 15. Sectors are numbered from 0 to a maximum of 255. These maximum values are the arbitrary numbers that were chosen when the CHS addressing was established, assuming that it would be sufficient enough for the future as well. That brings us to the end of this unit. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, we recalled that the hard disk drive will have one or more platters, and that data is stored on the magnetic media coded on the surface of the platter. Then, with the help of a diagram, we saw how to identify the sides of the platter on which the data is stored. We also saw how the disk was organized into tracks and sectors, and then we looked into zoned data recording. Next, we saw what a cylinder is, and then we looked into low-level formatting. Last but not least, we looked into the data addressing schemes such as CHS addressing and logical block addressing. In the next lesson, you will learn about the hard disk drive characteristics. Thank you for watching. Hello, and welcome to Unit 4, Hard Disk Drive Characteristics. In this lesson, you will learn about the characteristics of the hard drive. We're going to start by looking at what a hard disk drive size is, and then we will look into the data storage metrics. Next, we will look at the speed of the rotating platters. We will also look into the performance metrics of the hard disk drive, such as seek time, rotational latency, average latency, and IOPS. We will then look into the sequential operations and random operations of the hard disk drive. We will also look at what is meant by throughput. We will then look into a disk optimization technique called queuing. Last but not least, we will touch on the hard disk drive market. Let's start with the size of the hard disk drive. Like all other things, you might think that size is referring to the physical dimensions of the hard disk drive. 
Yes, it does, but it also can refer to the capacity of data the hard disk drive can hold. So, a hard disk drive size could either be referring to the physical dimension of the disk drive, or it could be referring to the capacity of the disk drive. The physical dimension of the hard disk drive is also referred to as hard disk form factor, and it's described in inches. The most common form factors of hard disk drives are 2.5 inches and 3.5 inches. These measurements refer to the diameter of the platter inside the hard disk drive. There is something more that we should know about these measurements. When we measure the size of the platter inside a 3.5 inch hard disk drive, you will notice that the actual diameter of the platter is 3.74 inches, not 3.5 inches. So, the 3.5 inch size that we are talking here is really an approximate value, and it has a historical reason behind it. The name 3.5 inch hard disk drive comes from the fact that it can easily fit into the slot meant for the 3.5 inch floppy disk drive in our system. The 3.5 inch drives are generally low performance, high capacity drives that come with SATA interfaces. On the other hand, 2.5 inch drives are generally high performance, low capacity drives that come with SAS interfaces. That's all about the form factor of hard disk drives. Now let's talk about the size of the hard disk drive with regard to the capacity of data it can hold. We don't get the full capacity that is mentioned on the hard disk drive. Why is this so? Should we not be getting the full capacity of a hard disk drive? Let's say that we have a 500 gigabyte hard disk drive, but we don't get the 500 gigabytes to use. One of the reasons for this disproportion is because of the way hard disk manufacturers express storage capacities. Computers treat one kilobyte as 1024 bytes, whereas the hard disk drive manufacturers treat it as 1000 bytes. The difference of 24 bytes seems to be negligible when we are talking in terms of kilobytes, but when we talk in terms of megabytes, we see a considerable difference, which results in a lower capacity. In order to provide accurate data storage metrics, the International Electrotechnical Commission, IEC, introduced new metrics such as kibibyte, mebibyte, gibibyte, and tebibyte. One kibibyte equals 1,024 bytes. One mebibyte equals 1,024 kibibytes. One gibibyte equals 1,024 mebibytes. And one tebibyte equals 1,024 gibibytes. There are also other reasons why we are not getting full capacity, such as the overhead associated with formatting of the disks and the disk space consumed by the file system. Now let's look at the speed of the rotating platters of the hard disk drive. We quantify the speed of the hard disk drive based on the number of rotations it makes in a second, and the metric that denotes this is called revolutions per minute, or RPM. Most common RPMs are 5400, 7200, 10,000, and 15,000. As you might have guessed, more RPMs increase the efficiency of the hard disk drive as it provides faster read and write operations on the drive. So, hard disk drives with more RPMs are expensive compared to the ones that have lesser RPMs. RPM also impacts the capacity. Hard disk drives with more RPMs have lower capacity, and ones with lesser RPMs have higher capacity. You might be wondering how increase in RPMs results in a lower capacity. Let's do some simple math to understand this. If the platters of a hard disk drive rotate at 5200 RPM, then it takes 11.54 milliseconds for a single complete rotation. However, if we rotate the same platters at 7200 RPM, then the time drops to 8.33 milliseconds. Though the drive has become faster, the amount of time it takes to write a single track is reduced from 11.54 milliseconds to 8.33 milliseconds. The drive now has 8.33 milliseconds to write the data instead of 11.54 milliseconds, so it can write only what it can during the 8.33 milliseconds, resulting in a lower capacity. 
So, whenever manufacturers increase the rotation speed of the hard disk drive, it is necessary to increase the read-write frequency to avoid the drive resulting in a lower capacity. The performance of the hard disk drive is also affected by seek time. Seek time is the time it takes to move the read-write head to the correct location on the surface of the platter. It is measured in milliseconds. One second is made of 1,000 milliseconds. The faster seek improves the performance. The seek time has a significant bearing on performance when the read-write head has to randomly read the data. Random reads require the read-write head to move to different positions of the platter. The faster seek time will improve the performance, and the slower seek time will be a hit on the performance. The seek time changes depending on the number of tracks that the head must navigate. So, we consider the average seek time to measure the performance. The average seek time is calculated as one-third of the full seek time. Further, we have the average seek time for read and write operations mentioned separately. For example, if we take a hard disk drive with 7200 RPM, the average seek time for the read operation will be mentioned as less than 8.5 milliseconds. And then, average seek time for the write operation will be mentioned as less than 9.5 milliseconds. Right after the head positions itself on a track, it has to wait for the platter to rotate in order to place the sector beneath the head. This waiting time, or time taken for the rotation of the platter to position the sector beneath the head, is called rotational latency. Rotational latency varies with the position of the sector. If the sector is near, then less rotation is needed. But, if it is far, then a full rotation might be required. So, an average latency is considered for depicting the rotational latency of the hard disk drives, and it's measured in milliseconds. Average latency is the time it takes for the platter to do a half rotation. This means that the average latency is calculated directly from the RPM of the hard disk drive. Let's do some simple math to find the average latency of a 7200 RPM hard disk drive. We know that 7200 RPM is equal to 120 revolutions per second, and hence, for one rotation, it takes 8.33 milliseconds. And, for a half rotation, it takes 4.17 milliseconds. So, the average latency for a 7200 RPM hard disk drive is 4.17 milliseconds. Since average latency is directly related to the RPM, the more the RPMs are, the less the average latency or the waiting time will be. It should be noted that while seek times are significant for random workloads, the average latency is important for both sequential and random workloads. We will discuss sequential and random workloads in a few minutes. The next performance metric that we will discuss is Input-Output Operations Per Second, or IOPS. It is used to measure the maximum read or write operations in a second. The read or write operations are performed by the storage device in response to a request from the host computer. IOPS are typically used to measure the random workloads. There are several types of input-output operations, such as read operation, write operation, random operation, and sequential operation. So, the IOPS measurement corresponds to the type of input-output operation occurring at that time. IOPS also depends upon the size of the input-output operation. It is obvious that larger input-output operations take longer time than the smaller ones. Input-output operations per second are complex because they involve more than one type of operations, such as read-write, sequential, and random. Now let's look at the sequential and random operations. In sequential operations, large number of sectors, such as 120 kilobytes, is accessed in a contiguous manner without jumping around. For example, in a sequential operation, the alphabet A, B, C, D, and E are located next to each other, such as A, then B, then C, then D, then E. In a random operation, small number of sectors such as 4 kilobytes are accessed in a non-contiguous manner. For example, in a random operation, the letters A, B, 
C, D, and E are spread out. In hard disk drives, the random IOPS is mainly based on the seek time, whereas in solid state drives, the random IOPS is based on its internal controller and memory interface speeds. A quick way to calculate the IOPS of a hard disk drive is by using the formula 1000 divided by x plus y, whereas x is the average seek time and y is the average rotational latency. For example, if we had a hard disk drive whose average seek time is 8.5 milliseconds and the average rotational latency is 4.17 milliseconds, then the IOPS will be 78 IOPS. Now that we have a good understanding of the IOPS, it's time to look at the throughput of the disk drive. Throughput is the rate at which the data gets transferred in and out of the hard disk drive without failure. We will also hear the term maximum throughput from the vendors. The maximum throughput is also called maximum transfer rate. Sustained transfer rate is also another term that vendors use. It is the rate at which the hard disk drive can transfer sequential data from multiple tracks on the disk. Now we will look at the queuing technique implemented by hard disk drives. Queuing is a disk optimization technique that is used by hard disk drives to create faster reads and writes. Typically, when a hard disk drive receives multiple input-output commands at a time, these are placed in a queue and are reordered based on the disk layout to carry out the read and write operations efficiently. As a result, queuing improves the performance of hard disk drives. Now let's look at the hard disk drive market. The hard disk drive market is characterized by two important things. The first thing is that there is a high performance based hard disk drive market where the hard disk drives are built to deliver high performance. For example, SAS and fiber channel drives are high performance drives that come with high cost. The second thing is that there is a capacity based hard disk drive market which gives importance to the cost per byte aspect, and hence these drives are slower and squeeze in as much bits as possible, increasing the capacity. For example, SATA drives are low performance, high capacity drives. And that brings us to the end of this unit. Let's summarize what we have learned in this lesson. We looked at what a hard disk drive size is, and then we looked at data storage metrics. Next, we looked at the speed of the rotating platters, we also looked into the performance metrics of the hard disk drive, such as seek time, rotational latency, average latency, and IOPS. We then looked into the sequential operations and random operations of the hard disk drive. We also looked at what is meant by throughput. We then looked into a disk optimization technique called queuing. And last but not least, we covered the hard disk drive market. In the next lesson, you will learn about solid state storage. Thanks for watching. Hello, and welcome to Unit 1, Solid State Storage. In this lesson, you will learn about solid state storage. We're going to start by looking at the brief history of solid state storage, and then we will look at what solid state storage is. Next, we will look at the two forms of solid state storage, that is, solid state card, SSC, and solid state drive, SSD. We will look at what flash memory is, and then we will look at the two types of flash memory, that is NAND flash memory and NOR flash memory. We will also look at the types of NAND flash memory in detail, and these are called single level cell, SLC, multi level cell, MLC, enterprise MLC or EMLC, and triple level cell, TLC. We will then look at the data organization in NAND flash memory. Next, we will see how data is stored in flash memory using the erase write cycle. We will also look at a phenomenon called write amplification in flash memory. And then we will look at a technique called garbage collection, which is employed by the flash controller to free up space. We will look at what wear leveling is, and then we will look at the types of wear leveling, such as dynamic wear leveling and static wear leveling. Lastly, we look at what flash over-provisioning is.
Now let's begin with the brief history of solid-state storage. Solid-state technology is not new, and it has been around since the late 1970s. The early solid-state devices were very expensive and provided less capacity. Around the 1980s, the flash-based solid-state technology came into existence. In 1987, the EMC Corporation introduced solid-state drives for the mini-computer market. The presence of solid-state technology in the enterprise storage world was not felt until recently because they had issues related to cost, performance, and reliability. The traditional enterprise storage market is now seeing the emergence of the solid-state technology. Solid-state storage is a non-volatile storage that is built from solid semiconductors. It includes any storage that has no moving components. Non-volatile storage refers to storage that can retain its stored data even when the power is switched off. The term solid-state storage was created by SNEA and is seldom used in the real world. There are two forms of solid-state storage, solid-state card, SSC, and solid-state drive, SSD. Solid-state card, or SSC, is a PCIe card with the solid-state media embedded on it. Since it is a PCIe card, it can be plugged into the PCIe slot of the host computer. They are commonly used in servers and are characterized by high performance. The solid state drive, or SSD, is a solid state device that resembles a hard disk drive. It comes in form factors 3.5 inches, 2.5 inches, and 1.8 inches. Solid state drives have standard hard disk drive interfaces and protocols, such as SATA, SAS, and Fiber Channel. They do not give high performance like solid state cards because the interfaces that connect them to the host computer are not fast enough to fully utilize their potential. However, they are still faster than the hard disk drives. There are different kinds of solid state media such as flash memory, phase change RAM or PC RAM, magneto resistive RAM or MRAM, resistive RAM, RAM, and many more. We will focus our discussion on flash memory because of its widespread acceptance. So, what is flash memory? Flash memory is a solid state storage that is rewritable. In flash memory, data is stored in a collection of cells that is made from floating gate transistors. Flash memory offers persistent storage because the data stored on the chips are retained even when the power is switched off. There are two types of flash memory, NAND flash memory and NOR flash memory. NAND flash memory is commonly used because it is affordable, durable, and faster than NOR flash memory. NAND flash memory is made up of very small sized cells, and the data is stored in each cell. The cells can be written only for a limited number of times. Once the limit is reached, the cells start to degrade, resulting in loss of data. This restriction on the number of times that we can safely write the data to a cell is called write endurance and is expressed in program erase cycles, or in short, PE cycles. There are four types of NAND flash memory. Single level cell, SLC, multi-level cell, MLC, enterprise MLC, or EMLC, and triple level cell, TLC. We will look at these one by one. In the single level cell or SLC type of NAND flash memory, a single cell can store one bit of data. It can either be a binary number zero or a binary number one. It typically rates a write endurance of 100,000 PE cycles. SLC is characterized by high performance, high write endurance, and high cost. In multi-level cell or MLC type of NAND flash memory, a single cell can store two bits of data. It can be a combination of binary numbers such as 00, 01, 10, and 11. It typically rates a write endurance of 5000 PE cycles. MLC is characterized by medium performance, low write endurance, and low cost. Enterprise MLC or EMLC is an improvised version of MLC that was developed to handle enterprise workloads. The enhanced error correction in EMLC 
has improved its reliability and write endurance compared to the standard MLC flash. It rates a write endurance of 30,000 PE cycles. EMLC is characterized by higher performance than MLC, high write endurance, and low cost. In triple level cell or TLC type of NAND flash memory, a single cell can store three bits of data. It can be the combination of binary numbers such as 000, 001, 010, 011, 100, 101, 110, and 111. It typically rates a write endurance of 1000 PE cycles. TLC is characterized by higher density, lower write endurance, and lower cost. Now let's look at how data is organized in NAND flash memory. NAND flash memory is accessed in blocks. Each block is composed of pages. We know that the flash memory is composed of cells. Cells are organized into groups called pages. The pages are then organized into groups called blocks. In simple words, a group of cells make a page, and a group of pages make a block. A page size can be 2K, 4K, 8K, or 16K. The size of the blocks can be 16K, 128K, 256K, or 512K. Data is stored on the flash memory using the erase write cycle. The erase operation sets the value of the cell to binary 1, and the write operation sets the values of the cell to 0. What is important to know is that write operation works at page level, but the erase operation works at block level. Let's explain this concept in detail. When the flash memory is fresh out of the box, it is in an erased condition. That is, all the cells come preset with binary 1s. It is very easy to write the value of a cell from binary 1 to binary 0, but changing it back to 1 requires an entire block containing the cell to be erased. This is because the erase operation of the erase write cycle works only at the block level. Now let's look at write amplification in flash memory. We know that one or more bits of data are stored in each cell of the flash memory. If you recall, cells are grouped into pages, and pages in turn are grouped into blocks. While data is written at the page level, it can only be erased at the block level. In flash memory, data cannot be overwritten directly, as is done in hard disk drives. Instead, the entire block must be erased before a page can be written to it. As the flash memory is being used, the blocks get filled up with initial writes. When there is a write request to change or rewrite the data, it cannot be overwritten to the block, just like in the hard disk drive. Instead, the change data has to be either written to empty pages in the existing block or to a new block in the absence of empty pages. In our example, the change data is written to empty pages. Now that the empty pages of the block 1 have been filled, for any subsequent rewrites, the valid pages of block 1 have to be moved to a free block. In our example, the valid pages are relocated to block 2. Since the valid data of block 1 is moved to block 2, block 1 is erased. As a result, we have an empty block, which is block 1 to which the data can be written to. The necessity to relocate the valid data and to erase the block for writing new data causes write amplification. So, write amplification occurs when the actual number of write operations executed on the media by the flash controller is greater than the number of write operations that was requested by the host computer. Now let's look at garbage collection in flash memory. Garbage collection is a technique employed by the flash controller to free up blocks that contain invalid data. By invalid data, we mean the older data that was replaced. When a block is full of data, it usually contains a mix of valid and invalid data. So, what the flash controller does is, it copies the valid data of the block to an empty block and skips the invalid data. It then erases the original block as a whole, making it available for future writes. This results in effective consolidation of multiple blocks into fewer blocks. Now let's look at wear leveling. 
Where leveling is the process of distributing the data rights across all the memory locations so that the same memory location is not exploited while others remain sparingly used. This is essential because writing to the same memory location eventually wears out the memory. There are two types of wear leveling, dynamic wear leveling and static wear leveling. In dynamic wear leveling, the incoming write requests are directed to the sparingly used memory locations. In static wear leveling, the content of the memory locations that store static data are moved periodically so that the original memory locations can be used to store other data that changes frequently. Now let's look at what flash over provisioning means. Flash over provisioning is a technique of reserving a portion of the capacity by the flash controller for various background activities such as garbage collection and wear leveling. The reserved capacity is hidden by the flash controller and is not made known to outside applications. Though flash over provisioning reduces the usable capacity, it increases the performance and write endurance of the flash memory. An example of this would be a flash drive that has 128 gigabytes, but only 120 gigabytes is available to the user, and the remaining 8 gigabytes is over provisioned. That brings us to the end of this unit. Let's summarize what we have learned in this lesson. We looked at the brief history of solid state storage and then we looked at what solid state storage is. Next, we looked at the two forms of solid state storage, that is, solid state card, SSC, and solid state drive, SSD. We looked at what flash memory is, and then we looked at the two types of flash memory, that is, NAND flash memory and NOR flash memory. We also looked at the types of NAND flash memory, and these are single level cell, SLC, multi-level cell, MLC, Enterprise MLC, or EMLC, and Triple Level Cell, TLC. We then looked at the data organization in NAND flash memory. Next, we saw how data is stored in flash memory using the erase write cycle. We also looked at a phenomenon called write amplification in flash memory. And then we looked into a technique called garbage collection. We looked at what wear leveling is, and then we looked at the types of wear leveling that is, dynamic wear leveling and static wear leveling. Lastly, we looked into what flash over provisioning is. In the next lesson, you will learn the basics of storage arrays. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 1, Introduction to Storage Arrays. In this lesson, you will learn the basics of storage arrays. We're going to start by looking at what a storage array is, and then we will look at the key components of the storage array, and these are controller, controller enclosure, drives, and drive enclosure. Next, we will take a look at the enclosure addressing scheme. And then we will look at what a SCSI enclosure service, or CES, is. After looking at the components of the storage array, we will see how these components work together. We will then look at the benefits of storage arrays. We will also look at what a direct attached storage, or DAS, is. And then we will look at the advantage of the storage arrays over the direct attached storage. Next, we will look at the types of storage arrays. And these are Network Attached Storage, or NAS Array, Storage Area Network, or SAN Array, and Unified Array. When we cover NAS Array, we will touch upon the file-based protocols such as NFS and SMB SIFs that are used by the NAS Arrays to communicate with the host computers. And then we will look at what a storage network is. When we cover the storage network, we will also touch on block-based protocol. Lastly, when we cover the SAN array, we will also look at what LUNs and volumes are. Now let's begin with the storage array. So, what is a storage array? A storage array is a storage system that provides data storage to the computers connected to it through a shared network. Storage arrays come in various sizes, 
from the ones that can be kept on our computer table to the ones that are extremely huge and need to be kept in data centers. Let's look at the physical components of a storage array. The typical components of a storage array are controller, controller enclosure, drives, and drive enclosure. A controller is a printed circuit board that contains a processor, memory modules, and firmware. It is often called a head or storage processor or a node. The controller acts like a specialized computer that manages all the functions of a storage array, including I.O. operations, data recovery in the event of disk failures, and management of disk capacity. A controller enclosure is an enclosure that contains one or more controllers, power supply units, fans, and other miscellaneous components. Drives can be either hard disk drives or solid state drives or a combination of both. A drive enclosure is an enclosure that contains an enclosure controller, monitoring card, multiple drives, power supply units, fans, and other supporting components. The enclosure controller is a printed circuit board with a CPU that typically manages the components of the drive enclosure, such as hard disk drives, fans, power supplies, and so on. The monitoring card is a dedicated hardware monitoring device that has sensors such as for temperature, voltage, and current to report on the status of the drive enclosure and its components and the environmental condition, such as temperature. The drives in the drive enclosure are hot swappable. This means that we can unplug a drive when it fails and then plug in a new drive. Now we will talk about the enclosure addressing scheme and SCSI enclosure service that is implemented in the drive enclosure. The enclosure addressing scheme is used to identify the devices in the drive enclosure by assigning each and every device a unique address. Each hard disk drive is assigned an address based on its location in the drive enclosure. The enclosure addressing is important for troubleshooting and parts replacement. The SCSI Enclosure Service, or CES, is a technology that provides the means to monitor and manage the health of the drive enclosure and its components. CES can be used to detect and manage the state of power supplies, fans, drives, displays, indicators, and locks. For example, we can have a threshold limit on the power supply's voltage, and if the 12 volt output of power supply varies by plus or minus 5%, then an alert can be sent to the administrator. The SCSI enclosure service is either implemented on the enclosure controller or on the monitoring card that is installed in the drive enclosure. Now let's see how these components work. In the diagram, we have a controller. It has a processor, usually an Intel processor, and memory modules. The ports on the controller that connect to the storage network are called front end ports, and front end ports doesn't necessarily mean they are on the front side of the storage array. The storage array receives the incoming read-write requests from the host computers through these front end ports. The storage controller's processor, with the intelligence provided by the firmware, processes these requests for internal action. The controller also uses high-performance memory modules called DRAM. DRAM retains the data until it is written to the hard disk, and it is also known as cache. Since DRAM memory loses the data when there is a power loss, the data in the DRAM is protected through battery-backed power in the event of an unexpected power failure. The DRAM cache accelerates the performances of the storage array through read cache and write back cache technologies. Read cache is implemented by keeping the frequently accessed data in cache so that a read request from a host computer for frequently accessed data can be served immediately without accessing the disks all the time. In write back cache technology, whenever an incoming write from the host computer reaches the cache, an acknowledgement is sent to the host computer without waiting for the data to be written to the hard disk. 
both read cache and write back cache increases the responsiveness of the input output operations, which otherwise would have been slower because of the mechanical nature of the hard disk drives. The back end of the controller consists of ports that connect to the dual ported hard disk drives tray through their interfaces, such as SATA, SAS, and Fiber Channel. The connections to the dual ported hard drive are in active passive mode which means that only one port of the hard disk drive's two ports is active at a time. The major benefits of using storage arrays are high availability, increased capacity utilization, and increased performance. Storage arrays provide high availability by providing more than one of the same components, such as drives, controllers, power supplies, and fans. Storage arrays increase the capacity utilization by efficiently managing the allocation of storage resources. Let's find out what happens in the absence of a storage array. In the absence of a storage array, each server has to depend on its own storage, which is usually one or more hard disk drives directly attached to it. And such storage cannot be shared with other servers. This direct attachment of the storage to a single server, either internally or externally, is called Direct Attached Storage, or DAS. The disadvantage of Direct Attached Storage is that while one server may have plenty of free storage capacity available, another server may be running out of space, and there is no option to share the free capacity available in one of the servers. A storage array addresses this problem by having storage as a single pool that can be shared among the servers. An example would help us explain this concept better. Let's say we have two servers, X and Y. Server X has 500 gigabytes as its storage capacity, and server Y has 500 gigabytes as its storage capacity. Let's say server X has utilized only 100 gigabytes of space out of its 500. So it has plenty of free space, that is 400 gigabytes. On the other hand, let's say server Y has utilized 490 gigabytes of space out of its 500. Obviously, it is running out of space. It would help if we could borrow some free space from server X and give it to server Y. But this cannot be done because the storage is attached to each server and, therefore, cannot be shared. As a result of direct attached storage, the overall capacity utilization is less. The solution is to ensure that storage is no longer attached to individual servers, but rather belongs to a storage array, which has a single pool of storage. So, in our example, let's say we have moved the storage capacity to the storage array. The storage array now has a total capacity of 1,000 gigabytes, and the two servers, X and Y, can access their storage from the storage array. The storage array can now determine the storage allocation of each server connected to it. It can reclaim the surplus space from server X and replenish server Y with some additional space. Overall, the storage has increased the capacity utilization by efficiently managing the allocation of storage capacity. Storage arrays increase the performance because some of the host computer's workload can now be handled by the storage array controller. Now let's discuss the types of storage arrays. There are three types of storage arrays. Network Attached Storage, or NAS Array. Storage Area Network, or SAN Array. Unified NAS and SAN Array. Let's begin with the network attached storage. NAS is a storage array that connects to host computers through an IP network and communicates with them using file based protocols such as NFS and SMB SIFS. Let's understand a little bit more about NFS and SMB SIFS. NFS stands for Network File System. It was designed to support the Unix file system in which host machines can mount a disk partition on the storage array as if it were a local disk. NFS allows file sharing over a network. SMB stands for Server Message Block. 
It is Microsoft's protocol for the Windows file system that allows file sharing over a network using a client-server model. SIFS stands for Common Internet File System. It is a public version of SMB. In short, NFS is for the Unix or Linux-based operating system, whereas SMB SIFS is for the Windows operating system. Most NAS storage arrays support both NFS and SMB SIFS. But for the sake of argument, let's say the NAS storage arrays support only SMB SIFS. Then the Unix or Linux-based host computers can access NAS storage arrays using the Samba client. Samba is an SMB SIFS file server that runs in a Unix or Linux-based operating system. Alternatively, if the NAS storage arrays support only NFS, then the Windows operating system can access NAS storage arrays using the NFS client. Before we define the SAN storage array, let's explain what a storage network is. A storage network is a network that was developed for transporting block-based protocols. The block-based protocol is a protocol that transports an entire block of data. On the other hand, the file-based protocol transports only one byte of data at a time, and it relies on the lower-level block protocol to reorder the bytes into blocks. A SAN storage array is a storage array that connects to the host computers through a storage area network and communicates with them using block-based protocols such as Fiber Channel, iSCSI, and FCOE. When talking about a SAN storage array, it is important to mention how the storage is presented to the host computers. The storage capacity of a SAN storage array has to be shared among the host computers, so it is divided into logical disks that are assigned to the hosts. These logical disks appear to the hosts as local disks. The logical disks, or logical units as they are usually called, are identified by a unique number called a logical unit number, or LUN. LUNs play a vital role in the management of storage in the SAN storage array. They provide a logical abstraction between the host computers and the hard disk drives of the storage array. The terms LUNs and volumes should not be confused with each other. While a LUN is a unique number that is assigned to a logical unit, volume, on the other hand, is a broad term that denotes a contiguous area on a storage device and includes LUNs and partitions. Now let's look at the Unified Storage Array. A Unified Storage Array is a storage array that supports both file-based protocols and block-based protocols. Host computers can access the Unified Storage Arrays either using file-based protocols or using block-based protocols. They are also called multi-protocol storage arrays. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you've learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned what a storage array is, and then we looked at the key components of the storage array. And these are controller, controller enclosure, drives, and drive enclosure. Next, we looked at the enclosure addressing scheme, and then we looked at what a SCSI enclosure service, or CES, is. After looking at the components of the storage array, we saw how these components work together. We then saw the benefits of storage arrays. We also looked at what a direct attached storage, or DAS, is, and then we looked at the advantages of the storage array over the direct attached storage. Next, we looked at the types of storage arrays, and these were network attached storage, or NAS array, storage area network, or SAN array, and unified array. When we covered the NAS array, we also touched upon the file-based protocols such as NFS and SMB SIFS that are used by the NAS arrays to communicate with the host computers. And then we looked at what a storage network was. When we talked about the storage network, we touched on block-based protocol. Lastly, when we covered the SAN array, we also looked at what LUNs and volumes were. In the next lesson, you will learn about architectures of the storage array. Thank you for watching.
Hello and welcome to Unit 2, Storage Array Architecture. In this lesson, you will learn about the architectures of the storage array. We're going to start by looking at what a dual controller architecture is, and then we will look at what a mid-range storage array is. We will also look at the two types of modes in which controllers can work, and these are active-active mode and active-passive mode. We will then talk about how DRAM cache accelerates the performance of the storage array. We will also look at the disadvantage of the dual controller storage array. Next, we will look at the grid architecture, and then we will look at the scalability in the grid architecture. Now let's begin with the classification of storage array architectures. The two common architectures of storage array are dual controller architecture and grid architecture. Let's talk about dual controller architecture. In the previous unit, we explained the functioning of a storage array with a single controller but a typical storage array comes with two controllers, and this type of storage array architecture is referred to as dual controller architecture. A dual controller storage array provides high availability with either controller having access to the pool of storage. The underlying architecture of dual controller storage arrays doesn't allow them to have more than two controllers. However, it allows more hard disk drives to be added to an existing storage array, and because of this dual controller architecture, is also called scale up architecture. On the slide, we have a diagram of a dual controller storage array with two controllers. The purpose of having two controllers is to provide redundancy. That is, if one controller fails, the other one can provide uninterrupted service. In dual controller storage arrays, each controller is connected to each and every drive enclosure in the storage array. The drive enclosure contains the hard disk drives that are dual ported, and each hard disk drive will have two controllers connected to it. This arrangement ensures that in the event a controller fails, the other controller can still access all the hard disk drives. Mid-range storage arrays are dual controller storage arrays with a single active-passive pair of controllers combined with a modest level of cache, capacity, and performance and they are best suited for small and medium-sized businesses. Now let's talk about the two types of mode in which the controllers can work, active-active mode and active-passive mode. In an active-active array, both the controllers can perform the read and write operations on a logical unit at the same time. In other words, both the controllers are said to own a logical unit, and either of them can service the I.O. meant for that logical unit. Let's explain this with the help of an example. On the slide, you can see a dual controller array with controllers 1 and 2. In an active-active array, the controller 1 and controller 2 can service the host I.O. operations at the same time on LUN0, and both these controllers are said to be active for LUN0. Now let's explain active-passive array. In an active-passive array, only one of the two controllers can perform the read-write operations on a logical unit at a given time, even though both the controllers can access it. In other words, only one of the controllers is said to own a logical unit, and it can alone service the I.O. meant for that logical unit. In this case, the controller that owns the logical unit is said to be active, while the other controller is said to be passive. Let's also explain this with the help of an example. On the slide, you can see a dual controller array, with controller 1 and controller 2, like the one we showed before but this time it is for an active-passive array. In an active-passive array, both these controllers can access LUN0, but only one controller can perform the read-write operations on it, and let's say that controller is controller 1. In other words, controller 1 is said to own the LUN0, and it can alone serve the host I.O. meant for that logical unit. In this case, the controller 1 is said to be active, while the controller 2 is said to be passive. When the controller 1 fails or loses access to LUN0, the ownership of LUN0 is now transferred from controller 1 to controller 2. Controller 2 now owns LUN0, and it services the host I.O. meant for LUN0. Storage vendors may call their dual controller storage array as active-active because both the controllers are actively servicing input-output operations at a given time. However, it is important to note that both these controllers may not be servicing a particular LUN. As a matter of fact, each of the controllers will actively service a different LUN, and therefore, the storage array is really an active-passive array. This unequal way of accessing the LUNs is called Asymmetric Logical Unit Access, or ALUA. 
In a dual controller storage array, the workloads are normally uniformly distributed across the two controllers by assigning the even number LUNs to controller 1 and the odd number LUNs to controller 2. As a result, the even numbered LUNs will be active in controller 1 and passive in controller 2, whereas the odd number LUNs will be active in controller 2 and passive in controller 1. If a controller fails, the surviving controller will become active for all the LUNs, including the LUNs that were assigned to the failed controller, and will process the host's IOs meant for all the LUNs. In the previous unit, we saw that the DRAM cache in the controller accelerates the performance of the storage array through read cache and write back cache technologies. The DRAM cache is protected with a battery-backed power source to prevent data loss in the event of an expected power failure. But how can the dual controller array hold the write cache when the DRAM memory itself fails? The dual controller array does this by mirroring the contents of the write cache on the two controllers. So each controller will have its write cache and also a mirrored write cache of the other controller. In essence, there are two copies of write cache that are physically isolated from each other to prevent data loss should a controller fail. If a controller fails, the dual controller array will no longer be able to mirror the write cache and it will resort to write through caching mode. In write through caching mode, the surviving controller doesn't acknowledge the write operation to the host computer until the data is written to the hard disk. The major problem with the dual controller storage array architecture is the irrelevance of write back cache when one of the two controllers fail. In such a situation, the surviving controller switches from the write back caching mode to the write through caching mode. This is because if the surviving controller also fails, then the data written to the cache memory will be lost forever without being written to the hard disks. Writing to disk without using write back cache takes a significantly long time, resulting in degraded performance. The worst is yet to come when the surviving controller just can't handle the additional I.O. load because it may be fully utilized for its own I.O. load. This is possible because I.O. load increases over time, along with the capacity that is added to the storage array. So, making a surviving controller handle the workload of two controllers is not effective, and scheduling a downtime becomes necessary to restore the failed controller. Now let's look at the grid storage architecture. Grid storage architecture consists of more than two controllers controlled by management software. The grid storage architecture functions as a single system, even though it has storage units that are geographically distributed across multiple locations. Grid-based architectures are characterized by the ability to provide scalability of both performance and capacity. These architectures are often referred to as scale-out architecture. In grid storage architecture, the controllers can be heterogeneous in nature, meaning controllers from different vendors should fit into the system. Grid architecture has the ability to recover from failures without degrading performance. Unlike dual controller storage arrays, the grid-based storage arrays function in an active-active mode where more than one controller can own a particular LUN and write to it. A grid-based storage array can also be described as a cluster storage array because of its scalability in both performance and capacity. But a cluster storage array may not be a grid storage array because it may not be distributed geographically. Let's try to explain the concept of scalability in the grid storage architecture with the help of an example. In our diagram, we have a grid storage array initially with two controllers. Though it looks like a dual controller storage array, we can scale its performance by adding more controllers, and also scale its capacity by adding more hard disk drives. As the number of controllers increase, so does the processing power and cache of the storage array. As we mentioned before, regardless of the number of controllers added to the grid architecture, it operates as a single system. One of the key advantages of the grid architecture is that there is no degradation of performance even when a controller fails because the surviving controllers will have sufficient cache memory to mirror the write cache, and as a result, they will service the host I.O. using write-back caching mode. That brings us to the end of this lesson.
Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned what a dual controller architecture is, and then we looked at what a mid-range storage array is. We also looked at the two types of modes in which the controllers can work, active-active and active-passive mode. We then talked about how the DRAM cache accelerates the performances of the storage array. We also looked at the major disadvantage of the dual controller storage array, which is the irrelevance of write-back cache when one of the two controllers fail. Next, we looked at the grid architecture, and then we looked at the scalability in grid storage architecture. In the next lesson, you will learn about the basics of RAID. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 1, Introduction to RAID. In this lesson, you will learn the basics of RAID. We're going to start by looking at what RAID is, and then we will take a look at its brief history. Next, we will look at why there is a need for RAID. We will then look at RAID concepts, and these are RAID group, parity, striping, mirroring, hot spare, and hot swap. Now let's begin with what RAID is. RAID is an acronym that originally meant redundant array of inexpensive disks, but now it commonly represents redundant array of independent disks. So what exactly is a redundant array of independent disks, or RAID? RAID is a storage virtualization technology that combines multiple drives to create one or more logical drives for providing redundancy and enhancing performance. Let's explain this with the help of an example. On the slide, you can see there are nine physical drives. The RAID technology is what virtualizes the performance and capacity of these drives to create logical drives. In our example, it creates two logical drives of varying capacities. There cannot be a better preface to RAID than to find out how it came into existence. RAID came into existence in the late 1980s, and it was invented by David A. Patterson, Garth Gibson, and Randy H. Katz at the University of California, Berkeley. The acronym then stood for Redundant Array of Inexpensive Disks, and it was based on the inexpensive magnetic disk technology that was developed for personal computers. Behind every invention, there's a need. This applies to RAID as well. The purpose of RAID, then, was to provide an attractive alternative to the expensive mainframe drives in terms of performance, reliability, scalability, power consumption, and cost. At that time, it was felt that there was no I.O. crisis because the performance of the mainframe drives was modest compared to the increasing performance of CPUs and memory. So the solution of the RAID inventors was to have a collection, or an array, of inexpensive magnetic disks, which not only provided higher I.O. bandwidth than the mainframe drives, but also included extra disks for storing redundant data, to recover the original data when a disk failed. Thus, RAID was born. Now let's look at the concepts that are fundamental to the understanding of RAID. Let's start with the RAID group. A RAID group is also known as a RAID set or RAID array. It is a group of two or more physical drives that are configured to work together in order to provide data redundancy and increased performance. Now let's look at parity. Parity is a technique used for detecting errors and correcting them. In this technique, the parity data is computed from the actual data in the RAID set. When a drive fails, the parity data is used with the existing data to reconstruct the lost data. Parity data is constructed using the Boolean operator called exclusive OR or XOR. What XOR does is it takes two inputs and produces one output. 
The output of the XOR is based on the rule that if the two inputs are identical, then the output is zero. Otherwise, the output is one. Let's explain how it is done with the help of an example. In our example on the slide, we have a RAID set with three drives, A, B, and C. Our parity data will be computed from the actual data that is stored in drive A and drive B, and it will be stored in drive C. In the first row, drive A has bit zero and drive B has bit zero. Since they have identical data, applying XOR will give us the parity data as bit zero, and it is stored in the first row of drive C. In the second row, drive A has bit zero and drive B has bit one. Since they don't have identical data, applying XOR will give us the parity data as bit one, and it is stored in the second row of drive C. Similarly, in the third row, drive A and drive B don't have identical data bits, and XORing the bits will give us the parity data as bit one, and it is stored in the third row of drive C. The last row of our example has identical data bits in drive A and drive B, and XORing the bits will give us the parity data as bit zero, and it is stored in the last row of drive C. If one of our drives fail, let's say drive B fails, then we can reconstruct the data in drive B using the existing data in drive A and the parity data that is available in drive C. This is done by applying XOR to data bits in drive A and drive C. In the first row of the table, drive A has bit zero and drive C has bit zero. Since they have identical data, applying XOR will give us the reconstructed data as zero. In the second row, drive A has bit zero and drive C has bit one. Since they don't have identical data, applying XOR will give us the reconstructed data as one. We can repeat these steps to reconstruct all the data of drive B. There are two types of parity in RAID, dedicated parity and distributed parity. In dedicated parity, the parity data is stored on a separate drive, whereas in distributed parity, the parity data is spread across all the physical drives. Now let's look at striping. Striping is the technique of writing data by distributing it equally across all the physical drives in a RAID set. When data is stored on all the physical drives, it is said to be striped. Striping is done by dividing data into chunks or stripes. Chunks can be bytes or blocks. Let's explain striping with the help of an example. In our diagram, we have two physical drives. These two physical drives support a single logical drive. The data to be written is split into blocks. Let's say block 0, block 1, block 2, and block 3. The first block, that is block 0, is written to drive A. The second block, block 1, is written to drive B. Since there are no additional drives, the third block, that is block 2, is written to drive A, and the fourth block, block 3, is written to drive B. This ensures that the blocks are equally spread across all of the drives. When the same data needs to be read, the blocks can be accessed from all the drives. Striping improves the performance of a RAID array. When data is written in small chunks across all the physical drives, it makes the physical drives work in parallel to service the write operation. It also allows the data to be read in parallel. The combined I.O. performance of all these physical drives improves the performance of the RAID array. Let's explain this with the help of an example. On the slide, you can see a RAID set that comprises four physical drives. Let's say that each of these drives offers a throughput of 100 IOPS. So in our example, the RAID set with four physical drives will give a total throughput of up to 400 IOPS. It is worth noting that the size of the chunk affects the performance of the RAID set. 
When the chunk size is small, many chunks will be striped across many physical drives, so there will be many drives that will work in parallel to service read and write operations. However, the downside is that, as chunks increase, the positioning time to access the chunks across all the drives increases. On the other hand, when the chunk size is big, there will be a few chunks that will be striped across a few drives. Though the positioning time to access the chunks reduces, there will be many simultaneous I.O. operations across the few drives. Choosing the chunk size should depend on the characteristics of the workload that the RAID set is required to handle. The determining factor is the average I.O. size of the workload. A rule of thumb is that, if the average I.O. size is big, then the chunk size should be small, and if the average I.O. size is small, then the chunk size should be big. For example, transaction environments, such as those running databases, involve a huge number of small read and write operations, and for such use cases, the preferred chunk size is big. A big chunk size could be anything starting from 64 kilobytes. On the other hand, applications such as video editing applications require a small number of big files to be read promptly. And for such use cases, the preferred chunk size is small. A small chunk size could be anything between 512 bytes to 8 kilobytes. Stripe width is the number of stripes or chunks that can be written or read simultaneously. It is equal to the number of physical drives present in the RAID set. So we can say stripe width equals number of physical drives in the RAID set. Now let's discuss mirroring. Mirroring is a technique in which all data written to a physical disk drive is also written to another physical disk drive. Mirroring provides redundancy because if one physical disk drive fails, then the data can still be recovered from the other physical disk drive. However, it is expensive because it involves duplication of physical disk drives that results in using only 50% of the total storage capacity. In mirroring, the write operation can be marginally slow because the data has to be written to two physical disk drives. However, mirroring provides improved read performance as the data can be read in parallel from the physical disk drives. Let's explain mirroring with the help of an example. In our diagram, we have two physical disk drives. These two physical drives support a single logical drive. Let the two physical drives be drive A and drive B. When data is written to drive A, the same data will also be written to drive B. So when data 1 is written to drive A, it will be written to drive B. Similarly, when data 2 is written to drive A, it will also be written to drive B, and so on. If each of these two physical disk drives has a capacity of 500 gigabytes, the logical disk drive will not have an aggregated capacity of 1 terabyte, it will only have a capacity of 500 gigabytes. This is because there is a loss of 50% capacity due to data duplication. Now let's see what hot spare and hot swap means. Hot spare is a spare physical disk drive used to automatically replace a failed physical disk drive in a RAID array. Hot swap is the ability to replace the failed physical disk drive with a good drive without disrupting the functioning of a RAID array. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what we have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, we learned what RAID is, and then we looked at its brief history. Next, we looked at why there is a need for RAID. We then looked at RAID concepts, and these are RAID group, parity, striping, mirroring, hot spare, and hot swap. In the next lesson, you will learn about the RAID levels. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 2, RAID Levels. 
In this lesson, you will learn about the RAID levels. We're going to start by looking at what a RAID level is, and then we will be looking at the important RAID levels. These are RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 10, RAID 01, RAID 5, and RAID 6. Lastly, we will look at the two types of RAID implementation, and these are Software RAID and Hardware RAID. Now let's look at RAID levels. So what is a RAID level? The array of drives in RAID can be arranged in various ways to provide a variety of choices that differ in performance and reliability. Each such arrangement is referred to as a RAID level. There are many RAID levels, but we will focus on the important ones, and these are RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 10, RAID 01, RAID 5, and RAID 6. We will start with RAID 0. RAID 0 doesn't offer redundancy. The only thing that RAID 0 does is striping the data equally across the RAID set. RAID 0 requires a minimum of two physical drives. As we have seen before, striping improves the performance of the RAID set. RAID 0 is not recommended for any critical data as it doesn't offer data protection. However, it can be used along with other RAID levels that do offer data protection. Now let's look at RAID 1. RAID 1 is based on mirroring. It requires at least one pair of physical drives. As we saw before, the data that is written to a physical drive is also written to another physical drive. This means that the second physical drive contains an identical copy of the data that is in the first physical drive. Such a pair of physical drives is referred to as a mirrored pair. So, RAID 1 requires at least one pair of physical drives in which one drive acts as a duplicate of the other. RAID 1 provides absolute redundancy because even if a physical drive fails, the other physical drive continues to function and the data is safe in it. Write performance in RAID 1 is marginally affected because data must be written twice. In contrast, the read performance improves as data can be read in parallel from the physical drives. RAID 1 is expensive because twice the storage capacity must be purchased to provide the required storage space. For example, if the required storage capacity is 1 terabyte, then we need to purchase two physical drives, each with a capacity of 1 terabyte. So, to provide 1 terabyte of storage capacity, we are actually purchasing a total capacity of 2 terabytes. When a physical drive fails, the RAID set goes into a degraded mode. In a degraded mode, the performance of the RAID set is degraded, and there is a risk of losing data if another disk also fails. RAID 1 allows faster rebuild of the failed drive because the complete data exists in the surviving physical drive. Now let's look at RAID 10. RAID 10 is the combination of RAID 1 and RAID 0. In this arrangement, RAID 1 is first applied to the RAID set, followed by RAID 0. This provides the best of both the levels. When RAID 1 is applied first, we create a mirrored pair providing redundancy to our data. On top of this mirrored pair, when we apply RAID 0, we take advantage of striping, which improves performance. RAID 10 requires a minimum of four physical drives. In our example on the slide, the first two mirrored physical drives occupy half of the striped data and the second two mirrored physical drives occupy the other half of the striped data. In a nutshell, RAID 10 provides high performance with absolute redundancy. It is also expensive because mirroring demands that we purchase twice the storage capacity needed. Now let's look at RAID 01. RAID 01 is the combination of RAID 0 and RAID 1. It is not the same as RAID 10. In RAID 01, the RAID 0 level is applied first, and on top of that, RAID 1 is applied. 
RAID 01 requires a minimum of four physical drives. The first two physical drives occupy the striped data, and the second two physical drives mirror the first pair. Now let's look at RAID 5. RAID 5 is a block level striping combined with a single distributed parity. It requires a minimum of three physical drives. RAID 5 stripes blocks of data along with parity across three or more physical drives. So the chunks used for striping are blocks. The parity data is computed and spread across the physical drives as a single chunk of parity data. RAID 5 is known for good performance, redundancy, and storage efficiency. The advantage of RAID 5 is that it can survive a single disk failure without losing data because of the single distributed parity. RAID controllers that support RAID 5 usually feature hot sparing and automatic rebuilding of the failed physical drive. RAID 5 does have a capacity overhead, and it is calculated as 1 divided by the number of drives multiplied by 100. We saw earlier that the parity data, along with the existing data, is used to rebuild the lost data. But if there are many physical drives, then the rebuild of the failed drive takes more time. Now let's look at RAID 6. RAID 6 is a block level striping with double distributed parity. As with RAID 5, the drives are striped with blocks of data, but in this case, there is dual parity data distributed across the drives. RAID 6 requires four or more physical drives. The advantage of RAID 6 is that it can survive two drive failures without losing data because of double distributed parity. When it comes to performance, RAID 6 is marginally less compared to RAID 5, but RAID 6 offers additional redundancy. RAID 6, like RAID 5, does have a capacity overhead, and it is calculated as 2 divided by the number of drives multiplied by 100. Now let's look at how RAID is implemented. There are two types of RAID implementation, software RAID and hardware RAID. Software RAID is implemented at the operating system level and all the functions of the RAID are carried out by the processor of the host computer. Software RAID is best suited for simple RAID levels such as RAID 0, 1, and 10. There is no additional cost that needs to be incurred for software RAID, since it is a part of the operating system. On the downside, a software RAID impacts system performance. The impact is substantial on the overall system performance when it requires processing complex RAID levels such as RAID 5. A software RAID is specific to an operating system, meaning their functionality depends on the specific operating system. This also creates compatibility issues because a RAID set up in an operating system cannot generally be shared or accessed using other operating systems. Hardware RAID is implemented using dedicated hardware that performs all the functions of the RAID. The dedicated hardware is called the hardware controller because it controls the RAID array. The hardware controller is like a miniature computer because it has its own processor and memory. A hardware RAID that is implemented in the host computer's hardware is either integrated into the motherboard of the host computer or as a controller card that is plugged into an expansion slot of the host computer. All RAID operations are processed by the hardware controller and, as a result, a hardware RAID does not impact the performance of the host computer. A hardware RAID offers advanced features and these are write back cache mode, hot spares, and hot swapping. Write-back cache dramatically improves the performance of the RAID array. And that brings us to the end of this lesson.
Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you have learned what a RAID level is. And then we looked at the important RAID levels, which are RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 10, RAID 01, RAID 5, and RAID 6. Next, we looked at the two types of RAID implementation, and these were Software RAID and Hardware RAID. In the next lesson, you will learn the basics of a Storage Area Network, or SAN. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 1, Introduction to SAN. In this lesson, you will learn the basics of SAN. We're going to start by looking at what a SAN is, and then we will take a look at why we need a SAN. Next, we will look at the evolution in data storage technology, starting with the Direct Attached Storage, or DAS. We will then look at the Network Attached Storage, or NAS which is the next stage of advancement in storage technology. After NAS, it is the Storage Area Network, or SAN, that has marked the next stage of evolution in storage technology. So we will see how SAN solves the limitations of DAS, and then we will look at the media that connects the servers to the storage devices in a storage area network. We will also talk about the fiber channel technology that has become extremely popular as media used for SAN. We will then introduce you to Fiber Channel SAN, or FC SAN, which is a SAN built using Fiber Channel technology. Lastly, we will look at the benefits of Fiber Channel SAN. Now, let's look at what a SAN is. So, what is a SAN? SAN stands for Storage Area Network. Storage Area Network is a high-speed network whose main function is to allow data transfer between the computer systems and the storage devices, and also among the storage devices. Why do we need SAN? Let's answer this question. SAN represents the evolution in data storage technology. There has been progress in the data storage technology from DAS to SAN. In the traditional client-server systems, each server had its own storage, and that storage was directly attached to the server, either internally or externally. Such server-attached storage is referred to as direct-attached storage, or DAS. DAS provides the servers with high-speed exclusive access to the storage, and it is preferred by small companies, considering cost and performance. However, the disadvantage of DAS is that it creates pockets of isolated storage that are not efficiently utilized. For example, when one server has plenty of free storage capacity available, another server may be running out of space, and by the direct attached storage design, the free capacity of the servers cannot be shared. In addition to this, when a business deploys more servers in a network, not only is there an increase in the waste of storage capacity, but there is also an increase in the complexity of managing isolated storage resources. The next stage of advancement in storage technology was the Network Attached Storage, or NAS. The concept of NAS is to decouple storage from the servers and make it a centralized pool of shared storage that can be accessed by all the servers connected to the network. Technically speaking, NAS is not a network, but a storage array that is hooked up to an existing network to provide shared storage. NAS can provide centralized shared storage with terabytes of storage capacity. However, it doesn't provide the high-speed data protection needed in enterprise environments because it typically sits on an existing shared corporate network, and a complete data backup will not only take a considerable time, but it will also bog down the network. After NAS, it was SAN that marked the next stage of evolution in storage technology. 
SAN is a dedicated network that transfers blocks of data at a high speed to a storage device, and it offers low latency for the I.O. requests to access the storage device. In addition to that, SAN allows several servers to connect to several storage devices in order to share data, and also allows the storage devices to communicate with each other. SAN helps to solve many of the challenges faced in the traditional server-attached storage. For example, the traditional server-attached storage cannot satisfy the ever-increasing demands for storage capacity, as it is not scalable due to the restrictions in the number of storage devices that can be added to the servers. Such problems can be solved by SAN, as it is scalable. SAN allows many new storage devices to be added to the network without adding new servers. The storage devices in SAN can be aggregated into a central pool of shared storage that can be accessed by the servers. The server-attached storage also doesn't provide high availability of data, because if a server goes down, the data becomes inaccessible since the storage is tied to the server. SAN overcomes this problem because it segregates the storage devices from servers. So, if a server goes down in a storage area network, data is still accessible. Though SAN connects a multitude of servers and storage devices, the performance doesn't suffer because the network is characterized by both high-speed and low-latency features. The high-speed data transfer and low-latency of the I.O. requests in SAN can be compared to the high performance of storage directly attached to a server, as in direct attached storage. So the I.O. requests in SAN access storage devices similar to DAS. So, in a nutshell, SAN is a dedicated network that is scalable and highly available with the primary purpose of providing high speed and low latency access to storage devices. The next thing that we will talk about is the media that connects the servers to the storage devices in a storage area network. Media is the actual cables and physical wiring that connects the storage devices to the servers. The media is associated with a unique protocol, and it is always managed by that protocol. The protocol specifies the format and sequence of data exchange between the servers and the storage devices. Fiber channel is a technology that has become extremely popular as a medium used for SAN. The actual media used in fiber channel technology can be different types of optical and electrical transmission media such as fiber and copper respectively. SANs are typically built using the fiber channel technology based on a family of standards developed by the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI. These standards define high-speed network technology that provides fast data transfer rates that are commonly over 2 gigabits per second. The standards also define the properties of the media and how data is transmitted across the media. Fiber Channel has become a de facto standard in SANS for connecting client computers and server computers to a highly scalable, voluminous data storage. A SAN built using Fiber Channel technology is called a Fiber Channel SAN, or FC SAN. The goal of Fiber Channel SAN is to increase the accessibility of data across the organization. Since organizations have heterogeneous combinations of operating systems, such as Windows, Unix, Linux, and OS 390, Fiber Channel was designed to accommodate these operating systems and the applications that run on them. Fiber Channel SAN solves a fundamental problem of reliably making terabytes of information available to hundreds of servers. For making data available to servers, applications, and users across the enterprise, FC SANs provide a network of storage resources that decouple storage from individual servers. While direct attached storage and network attached storage may be appropriate for small networks, Fiber Channel SAN is most appropriate for large storage networks. The benefits of Fiber Channel SAN are speeds up backup and restore processes, provides business continuity, 
increases high availability. Provides storage consolidation. Let's look into these benefits one by one. Speeds up backup and restore processes. The growth of data and its criticality in organizations has made it a valuable business asset that needs protection and stability. FCSAN can speed up and simplify data backup processes. Fiber channels are designed to transport large blocks of data with great efficiency and reliability. Two popular SAN-based backup and restore models are the LAN-free and server-free models. We will talk more about LAN-free and server-free in a separate module titled Backup and Recovery. Provides business continuity. The distributed network approach of FC SANS helps to recover data and bring it online in the event of a disaster. Many organizations cannot afford downtime of even a few minutes. In such cases, SAN protects against downtime in the following ways. By ensuring that there is no single point of failure, by integrating failover software, by rationalizing data backup and recovery, and enabling mirroring of data in remote locations. Increases high availability. The key availability benefits of SAN include built-in redundancy, dynamic failover protection, and automatic rerouting capabilities. With flexible connectivity options, a SAN can be developed with no single point of failure. FC SANs also provide hot plugging features that allow storage to be plugged into the network without experiencing any server downtime. Provide storage consolidation. Fiber channel storage area networks have become a stronghold for companies that are looking to increase their storage utilization and manageability while at the same time cutting costs. FCSAN allows any-to-any -any connectivity between heterogeneous servers and storage systems. This allows efficient use of servers and storage resources by consolidating the widely distributed, underutilized storage into centralized storage. Though SAN has gained massive popularity because of fiber channel technology, the concept of SAN itself is not tied to any form of technology. So SAN can also be built using other technologies, such as Ethernet-based technology, like Internet SCSI or iSCSI. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned what a SAN was, and then we looked at why we need a SAN. Next, we looked at the evolution in data storage technology, starting with Direct Attached Storage, or DAS. We then looked at Network Attached Storage, or NAS, which is the next stage of advancement in storage technology. After NAS, it was SAN that marked the next stage of evolution in storage technology. So we saw how SAN solves the limitations of DAS, and then we talked about the media that connects the servers to the storage devices in a storage area network. We also talked about the fiber channel technology that has become extremely popular as a media used for SAN. We then introduced you to Fiber Channel SAN, or FC SAN, which is a SAN built using fiber channel technology. Lastly, we looked at the benefits of the Fiber Channel SAN. In the next lesson, you will learn about the Fiber Channel architecture. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 2, Fiber Channel Architecture. In this lesson, you will learn about the Fiber Channel Architecture. We're going to start by looking at what a fiber channel is, and then we will talk about the channels and the networks in the context of fiber channel technology. Next, we will look at the features of fiber channel, and then we will look at why there is a need for fiber channel technology. We will look at how Fiber Channel works, and then we will look at the Fiber Channel protocol. Before we get into the depth of Fiber Channel, we will look at the commonly used terms in Fiber Channel. 
and these are node, port, link, and frame. We will then look at how Fiber Channel is logically structured into layers. And then we will look at the functions of each layer. Next, we will look at the flow control in Fiber Channel SAN. And then we will talk about the two types of flow control that can be implemented in Fiber Channel SAN. These are end to end flow control and buffer to buffer flow control. Lastly, we will look at the classes of services in Fiber Channel SAN. And these are class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4, and class F. Now let's look at what a fiber channel is. Fiber channel is a set of standards that define a high performance data transmission technology that can transport data of varying types and sizes at high speeds over computer peripherals and networks. The name fiber channel can be misleading because the words fiber and channel could make us think that the technology is limited to fiber optics and channels. But the fact is, Fiber Channel also supports copper as a transmission media and carries channel and network traffic with equivalent efficiency. Let's shed some light on channel and network. A channel is a peripheral input-output interface that allows direct data transfer between the computer and the devices attached to it. The primary purpose of channels is to provide error-free data delivery through hardware support. Being hardware-based, channels provide high data transfer speeds for large data with minimum overhead. Channels are typically used for the communication of peripheral devices with the host computer, such as disk drives, tape units, and printers. On the other hand, networks connect a large number of devices to each other, allowing any device to communicate with any other device. There is a high overhead associated with data transfer because the packets are routed to the correct destination, usually with software support, which slows down the network. The network is used for a wide range of tasks, such as delivering data that requires error-free delivery, as well as data that requires on-time delivery. For example, voice data transfer requires on-time delivery. Fiber Channel overcomes the limitation of network data transfer by combining the best of both channel and network technologies. As a result, channel and network protocols can share the same transmission media. Fiber channel can be compared to a telephone network in that it provides a temporary direct connection between the nodes with the option of utilizing the full bandwidth of the transmission media as long as the connection exists. It is implemented as an interface that acts as a general purpose transport vehicle for simultaneously delivering command sets of various protocols, such as IP, SCSI 3, and so on. Fiber Channel allows data transfers of varying sizes, be it large data transfer or small data transfer. As a result, they are used in transmitting data in diversified systems that range from workstations to supercomputers. The way Fiber Channel works is it defines the method of transporting the data from one device to another device, regardless of the type of data being transmitted. For example, the devices can be two computers on a network exchanging data, or a computer sending data to its peripheral device, such as a disk array. Let's discuss the important features of Fiber Channel. Fast. Fiber Channel provides high speed data transfer rates with the common speeds of 2 gigabits per second, 4 gigabits per second, 8 gigabits per second, and 16 gigabits per second. Flexible. Fiber Channel allows multiple protocols to be transported over a common transmission media. Asynchronous. Fiber Channel handles the transmission of both channel and network kinds of traffic in the very same protocol for the purpose of fully utilizing the available bandwidth. Long distance. The cable lengths between devices can be from 30 meters to 10 kilometers. We can have 30 meters when using copper as the transmission medium and 10 kilometers when using fiber optics as the transmission medium. Scalable. 
more number of devices can be connected. A simple arbitrated loop topology can have up to 126 devices connected, and a switched fabric topology can support millions of devices. Reliable. Fiber Channel provides superior data encoding and error checking mechanisms, along with the improved reliability of serial communications. Backward compatible. Fiber Channel is compatible with older technologies, such as SCSI and Ethernet, using bridges. Standardized. Fiber Channel is an industry wide standard, so the products developed by different vendors will work together. Over the years, the speed of processors and peripheral devices kept improving, but the network and channel interconnect technologies, such as Ethernet and SCSI, couldn't cope with the improvement and have become bottlenecks in system performance. Fiber Channel was developed as a solution to the growing need of an interconnect technology that supported both high speed and high volume data transfers for network and storage services. Fiber Channel was the generic name given to the set of standards developed by the committees accredited by the American National Standards Institute, ANSI. These standards define the physical characteristics of the transmission media and the connectors that connect the devices and also describes the related network topologies. Since Fiber Channel only provides a data transport mechanism, the standards define how to map the upper level protocols such as SCSI and IP, to the fiber channel data format without replacing them. The advantages of mapping the SCSI command set to fiber channel when compared to SCSI are as follows. High speed data transfers. Greater number of devices can be connected together. Large distances are allowed between the devices. Fiber channel protocol is the serial SCSI command protocol used on fiber channel networks. Let's look at a few terms that are commonly used in fiber channel. Fiber channel devices are called nodes. A node is a generic name used to denote any device such as a disk drive, printer, workstation, scanner, etc. Each node has at least one port that provides access to other nodes. A port is the interface in a node used for external communication. A node will have at least one port. Each port has two connections designated as transmitter TX and receiver RX. Fiber channel allows transmission of data over different kinds of electrical and optical cables. The pair of cables that connect two nodes is called a link. One cable plugged into TX is used to carry information out of the node and the other cable plugged into RX is used to receive information into the node. Data is broken into frames, which are transmitted from one node to the other via a link. The link can handle multiple types of frames. For example, a frame containing SCSI information can be sent along with a frame containing IP information, and so on. A frame is the smallest unit of data that can be transferred across a link and is composed of a string of four contiguous encoded characters, such as data characters or special characters. The frames are typically constructed by the node that transmits the frames. A sequence in data transmission is one or more frames. An exchange is one or more sequences. The main constituents of a frame are a header, a payload, and a cyclic redundancy checksum, CRC. In addition to that, it is also surrounded by a start of frame delimiter and an end of frame delimiter. The header contains source, destination, and other frame information. It tells from where the frame came and to where it is destined to. Start of frame and end of frame delimiters indicate the beginning and the end of a frame respectively. A payload contains the useful data carried by the frame and has a maximum length of 2,112 bytes. Cyclic Redundancy Checksum, or CRC, is the scheme that detects errors by checking the integrity of the header and the payload. 
Fiber channel is logically structured into five layers based on their functions as shown in the figure. These layers are similar to layers of the OSI model and have interfaces for interlayer communication. Let's discuss the functions of each layer. FC0. FC0 defines the physical interfaces, including the physical transmission media, connectors, and the parameters for optical and electrical data transmission. FC1 is the transmission protocol layer that does the serial encoding, decoding, and error control of the data. FC2 is the signaling protocol that breaks the data into frames for transport and reassembles them at the receiving end. It defines the framing rules of the data that is sent from one port to another. It also has mechanisms for managing three service classes and controls the sequence of data transfer. FC3 provides a set of services that are common for multiple ports on a node. FC4 defines the interface mapping between the upper layer protocols and the lower layers of fiber channel. Examples of upper layer protocols are SCSI and IP. Next, we will look at flow control. Flow control restricts the flow of frames from the transmitter port to the receiver port in order to prevent overflow at the receiver port. Fiber Channel uses a credit model to implement flow control. A credit is the maximum number of frames that can be transmitted to a recipient. There are two types of flow control, end-to-end -end flow control and buffer-to-buffer -buffer flow control. In end-to-end -end flow control, the credits are negotiated between the source end device and the destination end device before the data transmission takes place. The source end device decreases its credits by 1 when it sends a frame to the destination end device. On receipt of the frame, the destination end device sends an acknowledgement frame or ACK frame to the source end device. When the source end device receives the acknowledgement frame, it increases its credits by one so that it can send one more frame. Buffer to buffer flow control is used between an end device and a switch, or between end devices in a point to point topology. The credits are negotiated before data transmission takes place. In buffer to buffer flow control, the receiver sends a receiver ready frame to the sender when it is ready to receive the frames. The sender decreases its credits by one for every frame sent and increases its credit by one for every receiver ready frame it receives. Next, we will look at the classes of services. Classes of services are different methods of communication between two nodes. There are five classes of services. Class one is a dedicated connection between two nodes. It allows the nodes to communicate using the full bandwidth of the dedicated connection without being affected by other network traffic. As a result, the frames are guaranteed to be delivered in the order of their transmission. End-to-end -end flow control is used in Class 1. Class 1 is good for high-throughput transactions. Class 2. Class 2 is a frame-switched service with no dedicated connection. Class 2 allows different nodes to share the bandwidth of the service by multiplexing frames. Since there is no dedicated connection, a node can transmit frames to and receive frames from multiple nodes. The transmitting node receives an acknowledgement that confirms the frame delivery. Class 2 uses both buffer-to-buffer -buffer and end-to-end -end flow control. Class 2 can be compared to typical LAN traffic where order and on-time delivery is not crucial. Class 3. Class 3 is a frame-switched connectionless service similar to Class 2, but does not use acknowledgements to confirm frame delivery. Class 3 is also referred to as datagram service. When the frames are lost during delivery, the upper layer protocol efficiently ensures retransmission. Class 3 uses buffer-to-buffer -buffer flow control. Class 4 provides multiple dedicated connections from one node to many nodes at the same time. 
It differs from class 1 because in class 1, there is only one dedicated connection between two nodes, but in class 4, a node may be connected to more than one node via separate logical circuits. Each path provided by a logical circuit between two nodes receives only a portion of the bandwidth because it is shared among multiple logical circuits. In class 4 service, the frames are guaranteed to be delivered in the order of their transmission, and acknowledgments are used for delivered frames. End-to-end -end flow control is used in class 4. Class F is a reserved service used for switch-to-switch -switch communications in a fabric. It is a connectionless service that provides acknowledgement for the delivery of packets. It is used only for ports that connect two switches and for various tasks, such as exchange routing, name service, and delivery of notifications between switches. Class F uses buffer-to-buffer -buffer flow control. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned what a fiber channel is, and then we talked about channels and networks in the context of fiber channel technology. Next, we looked at the features of fiber channel, and then we looked at why there is a need for fiber channel technology. We also looked at how fiber channel works, and then we looked at the fiber channel protocol. Next, we looked at the commonly used terms in fiber channel technology, and these are node, port, link, and frame. We then looked at how fiber channel is logically structured into layers, and then we looked at the functions of each layer. Next, we looked at the flow control in fiber channel SAN, and then we looked at the two types of flow control that can be implemented in fiber channel SAN. These are end-to-end -end flow control and buffer-to-buffer -buffer flow control. Lastly, we looked at the classes of services in Fiber Channel SAN, and these are Class 1, 2, 3, 4, and F. In the next lesson, you will learn about the components of Fiber Channel SAN. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 3, Components of FC SAN. In this lesson, you will learn about the components of Fiber Channel SAN. We will look at the components of a Fiber Channel Storage Area Network, and these include servers, host bus adapters, cables, hubs, switches, bridges, and storage. When we talk about the host bus adapter, or HBA, we will look at what the worldwide name is, and then we will look at the two types of worldwide name. These are worldwide node name, or WWNN, and worldwide port name, or WWPN. In the context of HBA, we will look at what a gigabit interface converter, or GBIC, is, and then we will look at what small form factor pluggable or SFP is. We will also look at the types of SFPs, and these are electrical SFP and optical SFP. We will cover the optical SFP in detail when we talk about the connectivity of the fiber optic cables to the fiber channel devices. Next, we will look at the converged network adapter, which is a PCI expansion card, which combines the functionality of both the host bus adapter and the network interface card. When talking about the converged network adapter, we will look at what data center bridging, or DCB, is. When talking about data cables, we will take a detailed look at the type of cables that are used in fiber channel SAN. These are copper cables and fiber optic cables. We will also look at what fiber optic connectors are and then we will look at the two most popular fiber optic connectors. These are Lucent Connector and Subscriber Connector. When talking about fiber channel switch, we will also look at what InterSwitch Link or ISL is. Lastly, we will look at what a fiber channel port is, and then we will look at the different port names.
These are N port, F port, E port, G port, and U port. Now, let's start with the components of a fiber channel storage area network. The components of a fiber channel storage area network are servers, host bus adapters, cables, hubs, switches, bridges, and storage. Let's look at them one by one. Servers in a SAN environment do not have storage tied to them. As the data management is taken by the storage devices, such as storage arrays, the servers can efficiently handle their other tasks. The next component we will be looking at is the host bus adapter, or HBA. A host bus adapter is an I.O. adapter, typically in the form of a PCIe expansion card or a component on the motherboard that connects the server's memory bus to its I.O. bus. The I.O. adapter accepts input and generates output in a specific format. The I.O. bus refers to the path used for transferring data and control information either to a storage device or to a network. HBA typically is a standard PCI expansion card that is plugged into the expansion slot of the server. It connects the server to a storage device either as direct attached storage or as networked storage. A host bus adapter looks like a network interface card, or NIC. Compared to an HBA, a NIC only frames packets and controls the flow of data to the data link layer. A NIC depends on the server CPU for other tasks, such as protocol processing. Each entity in a fiber channel network is uniquely identified by a 64-bit address called a worldwide name. They are represented in eight hexadecimal pairs separated by colons, as shown in the slide. There are two types of worldwide names, worldwide node name, WWNN, and worldwide port name, or WWPN. The worldwide node name uniquely identifies each device on the fiber channel network. The worldwide port name uniquely identifies each port in a device. Each HBA has a unique worldwide node name and a unique worldwide port name. The worldwide node name identifies the entire device and, in this case, the entire HBA. The worldwide port name identifies each port and, in this case, the HBA port. The worldwide name is similar to the MAC address of a NIC card. But, unlike a MAC address, it cannot be used to transport frames on the network. An HBA contains a processor, memory, and firmware. HBA frees the server CPU by offloading the critical tasks such as protocol processing and error detection. During the offload process, the HBA caches the incoming data into memory to improve performance. In addition to that, the intelligence of the HBA's firmware takes care of useful features such as load balancing and failover. The biggest advantage of HBA is that it gives a throughput close to that of data link speed with a negligible impact on the CPU. The BIOS in the fiber channel HBA allows diskless servers to boot from the storage array that has the operating system. When a diskless server is powered on, the HBA BIOS of that server connects to the SAN and locates the storage array that has the operating system. Since fiber channel HBAs operate at 1 or 2 gigabits per second, booting from SAN shouldn't be a problem. The host bus adapter contains the gigabit interface converter, or GBIC, into which the network cable is plugged in. These networking cables can either be fiber optic cable or copper cable. GBIC is a hot swappable transceiver that takes care of the conversion between the electrical signals used by the HBA and either electrical or optical signals suitable for transmission over the network cables. The purpose of GBIC was to provide a gigabit port that can support a number of fiber channel media types. The upgraded version of GBIC is called Small Form Factor Pluggable, or SFP. An SFP module is half the size of a GBIC, but provides double the number of ports. SFP modules are also called mini-GBIC. There are two types of SFPs, 
electrical SFP, and optical SFP. The electrical SFP connects the HBA to the copper networking cable, and the optical SFP connects the HBA to the fiber optic networking cable. The optical SFP has a laser emitting diode, or a laser diode, that emits optical signals used for transmission of data over the fiber optic cables. The optical SFP is the type of SFP that is dominant in the market. We will talk more about optical SFP when we talk about the connectivity of the fiber optic cables to the fiber channel devices. The next thing we will talk about is the converged network adapter. The converged network adapter is a PCI expansion card that combines the functionality of both the host bus adapter and the network interface card. The converged network adapter supports simultaneous LAN and SAN traffic over a shared Ethernet link. In addition to that, it offloads the server CPU with the protocol processing. Let's say we want to connect our server to both fiber channel SAN and Ethernet LAN. In a traditional setup, the server would need two adapters, a fiber channel host bus adapter and an Ethernet NIC. As you can see in the diagram, the server can access both the storage area network and the local area network, but with the help of two different adapters, that is, fiber channel HBA and NIC respectively. We mentioned that CNA provides the functionality of both fiber channel HBA and NIC in a single adapter. Now in the diagram, you can see that the server is using only one converged network adapter that connects to a DCB switch. DCB, or data center bridging, refers to the enhancements made to the Ethernet protocol in order to allow Ethernet-based LAN switching to support fiber channel traffic. Now let's talk about the data cables that are used in a fiber channel storage area network. We know that a cable is one or more wires with a protected casing used for transmitting either electricity or signals. A data cable is a cable that physically connects the computers and devices for the purpose of data communication. There are two types of cables that enable data transmission in a fiber channel storage area network, copper cables and fiber optic cables. The early implementation of fiber channel used copper cables. Copper cables use electrical signals to transmit data. The data transmission distance of copper cables in fiber channel cabling is limited to a maximum of 30 meters. It is ideally used within buildings. Let's look at a few characteristics of copper cables. They are inexpensive, they use electrical pulses to transfer data, and they can be used for short distance data transmission. Copper cables have their downsides. The downsides are, data transmission in copper cable is disrupted when exposed to electromagnetic interference. There is also a loss of signal strength when the signal travels long distances. Copper cables are not immune to external noise. Copper cables have a lower bandwidth than fiber optic cables. Now let's look at the types of copper cables. There are four types of copper cables. Coaxial, twin ax, unshielded twisted pair, or UTP, and shielded twisted pair, STP. Coaxial cable has a solid copper wire at its center. It is surrounded by a plastic layer of insulation, and this insulation is covered by the braided metal shield that protects against electromagnetic interference. A final layer of insulation covers the braided metal shield. Twinax has two solid copper wires at its center instead of one. It is the only type of cable that is widely used in fiber channel copper cabling. Unshielded twisted pair cable has four pairs of twisted copper wires. Each of these wires is covered by color-coded plastic insulation. All the wires are bundled inside a plastic jacket. Both ends of a UTP cable are terminated using a RJ45 connector. One end of the UTP cable with the RJ45 connector is plugged into a computer's NIC card and the other end with the RJ45 connector is plugged into a female RJ45 port. There are different categories of UTP cables. At present, there are six categories based on data transmission rates. We will look at the popular ones, CAT5, CAT5E, 
and cat6. Here, cat is the abbreviation of the word category, and e in cat5e stands for enhanced. Cat5 is capable of a data transmission rate of 100 megabits per second. Cat5e is capable of a data transmission rate of 1 gigabit per second. Cat6 is capable of a data transmission rate of 10 gigabits per second. A shielded twisted pair cable has four pairs of twisted copper wires, with each pair shielded with foil, and they are all bundled inside a braided jacket. STP cables are costlier than UTPs and support higher transmission rates across long distances. Copper cables are seldom used in fiber channel SAN. Fiber optic cable is typically used for cabling in FC SANs. However, fiber optic cables are costlier than copper cables. Since fiber channel devices are not compatible with copper cables, an SFP transceiver is used to interface between a fiber channel device and a copper cable. Now we will talk about fiber optic cables. Fiber optic cables use light pulses to transmit data. Depending on the type of optical cable, the data transmission distance can be up to 2 kilometers or up to 10 kilometers. Now let's look into the composition of a fiber optic cable. A fiber optic cable is made up of one or more optical fibers. An optical fiber is the medium through which light signals are transmitted from one place to another. These signals are digital pulses or continuously modulated analog streams of light that represent information such as data, video, and audio. Each optical fiber consists of a core, a cladding layer, and a protective buffer layer as shown in the diagram. The main part of an optical fiber is the core through which light travels. The core is made up of an extremely thin, flexible strand of pure glass with a diameter between 8.3 microns and 10 microns. A micron is a thousandth of a millimeter. Data is transmitted through the core in the form of light signals. The core is covered by a layer of a different type of glass called cladding. The cladding has a higher refractive index than the core, which keeps the light signals contained inside the core by bouncing them back and forth when the light signals hit the cladding. The protective buffer layer is made of plastic material that protects the core and the cladding from any damage. There are two types of buffer, tight and loose tube. In a tight buffer, the protective layer is coated on each side of the optical fibers in the cable. In a loose tube buffer, one or more optical fibers are placed inside a tough plastic tube, which is then filled with protective gel to provide cushioning. Optical fibers inside a fiber optic cable are often designated as a ratio of core size and cladding size. The core size is the diameter of the core, and the cladding size is the outer diameter of the cladding. Typical core size by cladding size ratios are 9 by 125, 50 by 125, and 62.5 by 125. In addition to the core size by cladding size ratio, colors are used to differentiate fiber optic cables. For example, the jacket colors yellow, orange, and slate gray are used to identify the core diameters of 9, 50, and 62.5 microns, respectively. The primary advantages of using fiber optic cables are higher bandwidth, more information can be transmitted in less time, less attenuation, lower signal loss than copper, no electrical interference, not affected by electromagnetic interference. Let's see how fiber optic cable works. A laser diode, or LED, emits light signals into the fiber optic cable. These light signals travel through the core by bouncing back and forth on the edges of the core covered by cladding. This is because when the light signals are sent at a certain angle to hit the core, it propagates through the core by being reflected back and forth 
as if the edges of the core were a mirror. This process is called total internal reflection. Transmission of light occurs due to total internal reflection. Though there is no loss of optical power at the core cladding interface, the light is still lost while it travels through the core. This loss of light is called attenuation. Now let's discuss the types of fiber optic cables. There are two types of fiber optic cables, single mode fiber cable and multi-mode fiber cable. This classification is based on the mode in which the light signals travel in the optical fiber. In a single mode fiber cable, the light signals travel in a single path by being reflected at a consistent angle. The most common core diameter of a single mode fiber is 8.3 microns. This requires a laser as the light source since the light has to travel long distances. Single mode fibers support data transmission up to a distance of 10 kilometers. They are characterized by extremely low signal attenuation and high bandwidths. The single mode fibers are primarily used for telecommunication systems. In a multi-mode fiber cable, the light signals travel in different paths by bouncing off the walls of the core at different angles. The most common core diameter of a multi-mode fiber is either 50 or 62.5 microns. Both laser and light emitting diodes can be used as light sources since the light travels only short distances. Optical fibers with multi-mode transmission experience higher attenuation than single-mode transmission. Multi-mode fibers with 50 microns and 62.5 microns can support data transmission up to a distance of 500 meters and 175 meters, respectively. The multi-mode fibers are primarily used within data centers. Fiber optic cables are categorized based on the number of individual optical fibers present in the cable. The use, cost, and size of the cable determines the number of optical fibers. The three categories are as follows, simplex cables, duplex cables, and multi-fiber cables. A simplex cable has only one tight buffered optical fiber inside it. They are typically used for interconnections on the front side of a patch panel. A duplex cable has two tight buffered optical fibers inside it. In a duplex cable, one optical fiber is used for transmission and the other is used for reception for a connection. They are typically used as fiber optic LAN backbone cables. A multi-fiber cable has more than two tight buffered optical fibers inside it. They are typically used for interconnections on the back side of a patch panel. Now that we have discussed fiber optic cables, we will discuss the connectivity of the fiber optic cables to the fiber channel devices. Fiber optic cables connect to the fiber channel devices using small form factor pluggable or SFP transceivers. A transceiver is both a transmitter and a receiver in one module. An SFP transceiver is used to interface between a fiber channel device and a fiber optic cable. An SFP transceiver receives data from the fiber channel device in the form of electrical signals and converts the data into light pulses, which are then transmitted across the fiber optic cable. The SFP transceiver at the other end of the fiber optic cable receives these light pulses and converts them back to electrical signals, which are then used by the other fiber channel device. There are two types of SFP transceivers, shortwave SFP transceivers, and long-wave SFP transceivers. Short-wave SFP transceivers have short-wave lasers that transmit data over a short distance. It is used to transmit data through multi-mode fiber cables. Long-wave SFP transceivers have long-wave lasers that transmit data over a long distance. It is used to transmit data through single-mode and multi-mode fiber cables. Now let's look at connectors. Fiber optic connectors connect two fiber optic cables, or a fiber optic cable and a fiber channel device. The most popular fiber optic connectors are Lucent Connector and Subscriber Connector. 
Lucent Connector, or LC, was developed by Lucent Technologies, and hence was named Lucent Connector. LC is an RJ45 type male connector in duplex configuration. It is the popular small form factor connector. LC connectors are also available either in simplex or duplex configuration. Subscriber connector, or SC, was developed by a company called Nippon Telegraph and Telephone. SC is a snap-in male connector that is available either in simplex or duplex configuration. SC simplex connectors are color-coded beige for multi-mode fibers and blue for single-mode fibers. The next thing we will talk about is Fiber Channel Hub. A hub is a device that has ports for interconnecting other devices. All the devices attached to the hub form a circular path called a loop and they communicate with each other. The bandwidth in a hub is shared among all the connected devices. Fiber channel hubs were developed to solve problems associated with the loops created by connecting the transmit link to the receive link between multiple devices. For example, if a new device had to be added to the loop, the entire loop must be brought down. These problems were resolved by the star configuration offered by the hub. The downside of hubs is that by cascading hubs, a SAN cannot be built with more than 127 nodes. Now let's talk about a fiber channel switch. A fiber channel switch is a device that provides central connection points for servers and fiber channel devices to communicate with each other. This switch temporarily sets up logical connections between the fiber channel devices for routing data through the connection points. The switch learns which devices are connected to which ports and uses that information to forward traffic to the correct device. A fiber channel switch has at least eight ports. Each port of the switch has a dedicated bandwidth. A storage area network built with at least one fiber channel switch is called a fabric. A fiber channel switch also offers certain services, such as management service, name service, and so on, to the devices and servers attached to it. These services are called fabric services, and they simplify the management of the devices that are interconnected on the fabric. A fiber channel switch can also be connected to another fiber channel switch so that the existing fabric can be a large scale SAN. The cable that connects two fiber channel switches is called an interswitch link or ISL. There are three types of fiber channel switches entry level switches, fabric switches, and director switches. Entry level switches are low cost switches with limited scalability. They are typically used as replacements for hubs. Fabric switches are expensive switches that are scalable. They are used to interconnect other switches to form a large fabric. Director switches are highly expensive switches that form the core of a large storage area network. They are typically blade based with each blade having up to 64 ports, so director switches usually have a high port count. For example, Brocade DCX can handle up to 512 ports. Director switches are known for high performance, high availability, and high scalability. They are known for high availability because they are redundant, hot swappable components and redundant power supplies and cooling systems, which ensure that there is no single point of failure. In addition to that, the director switches have dual controllers, which provide active passive failover. Next, we will look at bridges. Bridges are the devices that connect the parallel SCSI devices to the fiber channel storage area network. For example, they connect a SCSI tape device to an FC SAN. Let's now talk about storage. Storage is one of the main components of the fiber channel storage area network. It can either be fiber channel based or SCSI based. Let's look at the fiber channel based storage devices. Fiber channel disk drive. In its simplest form, a storage device can be a disk drive with a fiber channel interface that provides dual porting capability. JBOD. JBOD stands for Just a Bunch of Disks. It is a collection of disk drives connected together in a cabinet. 
Storage Array A storage array is a storage system that provides data storage to computers connected to it through a shared network. A storage array contains a collection of disk drives and one or more controllers enclosed in a cabinet. The controllers in a storage array have the intelligence to manage the disk drives and to provide redundancy of data through RAID. Let's talk about fiber channel ports in FC SAN. A fiber channel port is an interface where the fiber channel cable is plugged in for the purpose of communication. The ports are implemented on devices such as a fiber channel switch, a host bus adapter on a server, and a storage array. Fiber channel ports have different port names based on their mode of operation, which depend on the kind of device connected to the other end of the port. We will start with end port. An end port is a node port available in end devices, such as servers and storage arrays. It is used to connect to a port on the fiber channel switch in a fabric. An F port is the port on a fiber channel switch that connects to the end port of an end device, such as a server or a storage array. An E port is an expansion port that resides on fiber channel switches. It is used to connect a fiber channel switch with another fiber channel switch. The fiber channel cable that connects two fiber channel switches is called an inter-switch link. A G port is a generic port on a fiber channel switch. It becomes either an F port or an N port, depending on whether the device connected at the other end is a fiber channel switch or an end device. A U port is a universal fiber channel port. All unidentified and unlisted ports are considered as U ports. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about the components of a fiber channel SAN. These components are servers, host bus adapters, or HBA, cables, hubs, switches, bridges, and storage. When we talked about the host bus adapter, we also looked at what a worldwide name was. And then we looked at the two types of worldwide name. These are worldwide node name, or WWNN, and worldwide port name, or WWPN. We then looked at what Gigabit Interface Converter, or GBIC, is. And then we looked at what Small Form Factor Pluggable, or SFP, is. We also looked into the types of SFPs, and these are Electrical SFP and Optical SFP. We covered the Optical SFP in detail when we talked about the connectivity of the fiber optic cables to the fiber channel devices. Next, we looked at the Converged Network Adapter, which is a PCI expansion card that combines the functionality of both the host bus adapter and the network interface card. When talking about converged network adapter, we looked at what data center bridging or DCB is. While talking about data cables, we took a detailed look at the types of cables that are used in fiber channel SAN. These are copper cables and fiber optic cables. We also looked at what fiber optic connectors are and then we looked at the two most popular fiber optic connectors. These are Lucent Connector and Subscriber Connector. When talking about the FC switch, we also looked at what Inter-Switch Link or ISL is. Lastly, we looked at what a fiber channel port is. And then we looked at the different port names. These are N port, F port, E port, G port, and U port. In the next lesson, you will learn about the topologies of Fiber Channel Storage Area Network. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 4. FC SAN Topologies. In this lesson, you will learn about the topologies of Fiber Channel Storage Area Network. We're going to start by looking at what a topology is, and then we will look at the types of Fiber Channel SAN topologies. These are point to point topology, arbitrated loop topology, and switched fabric topology. We will also look at what a fabric is. And then we will look at the types of switched fabric topologies. 
These are cascade topology, ring topology, mesh topology, and core edge topology. Then we will illustrate a simple fiber channel SAN using the switched fabric topology. And then we will explain the terms of high availability and scalability with reference to fiber channel SAN. Lastly, we will illustrate a good fiber channel SAN using the switched fabric topology. Now let's take a look at what a topology is. A topology is a logical layout of a computer network. It deals with the layout of the logical connections between the components of the network, such as computers, switches, storage devices, and other peripheral devices, irrespective of their actual physical locations. Fiber channel architecture provides three topologies, point-to-point, -point, arbitrated loop, and switched fabric. Each topology is meant for a specific purpose. However, there is no strict rule that only one topology should be used to deliver a solution. These topologies can be joined together to provide a solution that serves a specific need. Let's discuss these topologies one by one. Point-to-point -point topology is a direct connection between two devices. The transmit or TX port of a device is connected to the receive or RX port of the other device through a fiber channel cable and vice versa, as shown in the diagram. Since there is always a dedicated connection between the two devices, the bandwidth of the transmission media is fully available to these devices. Point-to-point -point topology is typically used for directly connecting servers to storage arrays. For example, if a storage array has four fiber channel ports, then four servers can be directly connected to the storage array. The advantage of point-to-point -to -point topology is that it provides shared storage for multiple servers with minimum configurations. In arbitrated loop topology, the devices are connected to each other to form a circular data path called a loop. The arbitrated loop topology allows up to 126 devices to be connected to each other in the form of a ring. The ring is formed by connecting the transmit or TX port of a device to the receive or RX port of the other device through a fiber channel cable. This process is repeated until the receive port of the first device is connected to the transmit port of the last device in the ring, as shown in the diagram. In this topology, all the devices have a shared transmission media, and they communicate with each other on a time-sharing basis. Let's say the two devices in an arbitrated loop topology wanted to communicate with each other. One of the devices will own the shared transmission media in order for the communication to take place. During this period of communication, the other device has to wait. There is an arbitration of control over the loop among the devices to share the bandwidth of the single shared transmission media, hence the name arbitrated loop topology. Arbitrated loop topology is typically used to connect strings of hard drives to a server, as shown in the diagram. A fabric is a storage area network built with at least one fiber channel switch. In a switched fabric topology, each device is connected to a fiber channel switch, and the switches, in turn, interconnect all the devices in the network through inter-switch links. A device in a switched fabric topology can communicate with other devices simultaneously at full bandwidth, since switches can efficiently route traffic between them. The advantage of switched fabric topology is that it is scalable and the devices can be added or removed to the network without disrupting other devices. There are different kinds of fabric topologies and we can use a combination of these fabrics to build a highly available and scalable network. The common fabric topologies are as follows. Cascade topology, ring topology, mesh topology, and core edge topology. Cascade topology is a series of switches connected to one another through inter-switch links to form a chained network. However, the switches at the end of the chain are not connected to each other. Cascade topology is unreliable because each switch is a single point of failure, so if a switch fails, the network is disrupted. 
it is typically used in circumstances where most of the traffic is restricted to individual switches, and the management traffic can be routed through the inter-switch link. Ring topology is similar to cascade topology, but with switches at the end of the chain connected to each other to form a circular network. Ring topology has better reliability compared to cascade topology because the network is not disrupted, even if one of the switches or ISLs fail in the ring. However, ring topology is not scalable without disrupting the fabric, because if we want to connect a new switch to the fabric, at least one ISL must be disconnected. Mesh topology is an interlaced fabric of interconnected switches. There are two types of mesh topology, full mesh topology and partial mesh topology. In full mesh topology, every switch is directly connected to every other switch in the fabric. Let's explain this with the help of an example. If we have eight switches in our fabric, then each switch in the mesh topology will connect to seven switches in the fabric, reducing the available ports by seven. Full mesh topology is resilient because it provides multiple redundant inter-switch links. So if an inter-switch link fails, traffic can still be routed through other inter-switch links. Full mesh topology is not scalable without disrupting the fabric because if we want to connect a new switch to the fabric, the edge devices must be disconnected. Partial mesh topology is similar to full mesh topology, but has some switches that are not directly connected to each other. As you can see in the diagram, two switches are not directly connected to each other, as there is no inter-switch link or ISL between them. The ISL between two switches is removed if there is no traffic flow between them. Like full mesh topology, partial mesh topology is also resilient. Partial mesh topology is also not scalable without disrupting the fabric, but it has more free ports than full mesh topology. In core edge topology, two or more switches form the center of the network and are interconnected with other switches. The switches that form the center of the network are called core switches. The switches connected to the core switches are called edge switches. In a typical core edge topology, Director switches are used as core switches. It is a common practice to have the storage devices directly connected to the core switches and the hosts or servers connected to the edge switches. Core edge topology is scalable without disrupting the network. It is also reliable and offers high performance. Now let's construct a simple SAN using the switched fabric topology, and for this, we will need a server with a host bus adapter a fiber channel switch, fiber channel cables, and a storage array. In our diagram, this server is a diskless server with an HBA card. We will connect the server to the fiber channel switch by plugging one end of a fiber channel cable into the host bus adapter of the server and its other end into one of the ports of the fiber channel switch. In the next step, we will plug one end of another fiber channel cable into one of the free ports of the FC switch and connect its other end into the port of the storage array. We have created a simple FC SAN using switched fabric topology. It is a simple SAN, but definitely not a good one, because a good SAN should be highly available and scalable. By high availability, we mean the SAN should be able to survive any kind of failure. In our simple SAN, if any one of the components fails, it disrupts the entire network. High availability can be achieved by configuring redundant components, so if one component fails, the redundant component comes to the rescue. We will add redundant components to our simple SAN and make it highly available. By scalability, we mean that more servers, more storage, and more switches can be added to the SAN without affecting performance. Now let's construct a good SAN using the switched fabric topology. And for this, we will need a server with two host bus adapters, two fiber channel switches, fiber channel cables, and a dual controller storage array. As you can see in our diagram, the diskless server has two host bus adapters. Each host bus adapter is connected to a fiber channel switch. 
which in turn is connected to the same dual controller storage array. If you notice, there is a dual path between the server and the storage array. If one path fails, the redundant path provides the alternate path between the server and the storage array. For example, if host bus adapter X fails, the server can still access the storage via host bus adapter Y. Even the cables and switches can survive the failures. For example, if one of the fiber channel cables connecting switch X and the dual controller storage array breaks, switch X can still access the storage through the redundant fiber channel cable. In a worst case scenario, if the fiber channel switch X itself fails, the server can still access the storage through fiber channel switch Y. That brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about the topologies of fiber channel storage area network. We started by looking at what a topology is, and then we looked at the types of fiber channel SAN topologies. These are point-to-point, -point, arbitrated loop, and switched fabric topology. We also looked at what a fabric is, and then we looked at the types of switched fabric topologies. These are cascade topology, ring topology, mesh topology, and core edge topology. Next, we illustrated a simple fiber channel SAN using the switched fabric topology. And then we explained the terms high availability and scalability with reference to the fiber channel SAN. Lastly, we illustrated a good fiber channel SAN using the switched fabric topology. In the next lesson, you will learn about the different features and capabilities of fiber channel switches. Thank you for watching. Hello, and welcome to Unit 5. Characteristics of FC switches. In this lesson, you will learn about the different features and capabilities of fiber channel switches. We're going to start by looking at what a domain ID is in the context of a fiber channel switch. And then we will look at the fabric services provided by the fiber channel switches. These fabric services are name server, login server, fabric controller, management server, and time server. After talking about the fabric services, we will talk about the fabric login process and the port login process. Next, we will look at what zoning is, and then we will look at what a zone set is. We will also look at the types of zoning, and these are worldwide name zoning and port zoning. We will look at the advantages of zoning, and then we will look at the implementation of zoning. We will also look at what a zone alias is, and then look at the best practices in zoning. Next, we will look at what a virtual fabric is, and then we will look at its features. We will also look at what oversubscription is, and lastly, we will look at what oversubscription ratio is. Now let's look at what a domain ID is. Each switch in a fabric is identified by a unique ID called a domain ID. Domain IDs are assigned to the switches by a switch in the fabric called the principal switch. Fiber channel switches in the fabric provide a common set of services to devices in the fabric. These services are called fabric services. The fabric services provide information to the devices connected to the fabric. We will discuss these services one by one. Let's start with name server. The name server is a central repository of information about the fabric. Whenever a device is added to the network, it registers itself with the name server. There is only one name server for the entire fabric. The name server information is shared with the name servers of all the switches, making it a distributed name server. Just like nodes have network addresses, the fabric services also have network addresses. 
but these addresses do not change and are known as well-known addresses. Now we will talk about the login server. A device that needs to connect to the fabric must send a login request to the well-known address 0xffffe of the login server. The login server processes the request. Now we will talk about the fabric controller. The well-known address of the fabric controller is 0xffffd. This address sends a state change notification to all the registered devices in the fabric. A state change notification is used when there is a change in the fabric topology. A device registers for a state change notification by sending a state change registration frame, or SCR, to the well-known address of the fabric controller. The fabric controller lets the device know of any change by sending a notification, called a registered state change notification frame, or RSCN frame, to the device. Now we will talk about the management server. The well-known address of the management server is 0xffffa. The fabric can be managed by using the management server from any switch in the fabric. Now we will talk about the time server. The well-known address of the time server is 0xffffb. The time server maintains a uniform system time across all the devices in the fabric. Now we will talk about the fabric login process. Though a server or a storage device is physically connected to a fabric, the logical connection is established only when it executes the fabric login or F-Loggy process. The F-Loggy process is done to discover the existence of a fabric. If a fabric is found, the fabric login sets up a session between an end port and the participating F port. Once the session is established, the end port will send an F-Loggy frame to the well-known address of the login server with its details, such as node name, end port name, and service parameters. When the f -loggy is successful, the F port assigns a 24-bit dynamic address to the end port of the device. In addition to that, buffer-to-buffer -buffer credits are also negotiated. Now we will talk about the port login process. The next step after the f -loggy process is the port login or p -loggy process. Port login is necessary for the data exchange to take place between the end devices. It is used to establish a session between the two end devices or end ports. During the port login process, the two end ports negotiate service parameters such as end to end credit, and the information about a device is entered into the name server. Now let's talk about zoning. The drawback of server operating systems of the servers attached to a SAN is that they are not aware of each other and this will result in uncoordinated actions of the SAN attached storage. Techniques were developed to provide the servers restricted access to the storage devices by subdividing the SAN into private networks. Each such private network provided coordinated sharing of shared storage within its network. These techniques have different names depending on where they are implemented. If it is implemented in a switch, it is called zoning. If it is implemented in a host bus adapter, it is called LUN masking. If it is implemented in a RAID, it is called LUN mapping. All the techniques work on the principle of restricting access by blocking a range of addresses. So, zoning is a technique of subdividing a SAN into private networks called zones. A zone is essentially a collection of end devices or end ports that are allowed to communicate with each other. It is recommended for a zone to have a single server and one or more storage ports. This approach is called single initiator zoning. The initiator is a device that first initiates the communication or requests an action. For example, a server is an initiator. 
A target is a device that responds to the requests of an initiator by providing the required data. For example, storage is a target. Now we will talk about the restrictions imposed by zoning. When zoning is enabled, a device in a zone can only communicate with other devices within the same zone. This also means that the device in the zone cannot communicate with devices outside the zone. Devices not included in any zone are not accessible to any other devices in the fabric. When no zoning is enabled, the fabric is said to be in a default zone. The default zoning access can either be open or closed. When the default zoning is open, all devices can see all the other devices. When it is closed, all devices are isolated. Now we will talk about zone set. A zone set is a collection of zones. There can be hundreds of zones in a fabric. A fabric can have a single or multiple zone sets, but at any given time, only one zone set can be active for a fabric. When any changes are done to an active zone set, such as adding a zone or removing a zone, it should be reapplied to the fabric for the changes to become effective. There are two types of zoning, worldwide name zoning and port zoning. Worldwide name zoning allows the connectivity between the attached devices based on their worldwide names. The benefit of this zoning is that the attached node can be moved anywhere in the fabric and it will still be in the same zone. Port zoning. Port zoning allows the connectivity based on the port numbers of the switches. In this zoning, all devices connected to all the switch ports that are members of a zone can communicate with each other. The benefit of port zoning is that ports can easily be added to the zone irrespective of whether a device is connected to a port or not. The advantage of zoning is that it not only prevents unauthorized access of storage, but it also prevents the unwanted host-to-host -host communications and the fabric-wide registered state change notifications. The reason to prevent fabric-wide registered state change notifications is that it has the potential to disrupt the storage traffic. Since we talked about the two types of zoning, we will now cover the implementation of zoning. The worldwide name zoning and port zoning can be implemented either as soft zoning or hard zoning. This is like asking if we are going to take a soft approach or a hard approach in implementing the worldwide name zoning and port zoning. The hard zoning and soft zoning should not be confused with worldwide name zoning and port zoning. Soft zoning is implemented by the name server. When an end device queries the name server about other devices in the fabric, the name server provides only the list of devices that are in the same zone. As a result, the end device receives a restricted view of the fabric. However, the downside of this zoning is that if an end device knows the address of another end device, it can still communicate with it, so it is not considered secure. Hard zoning is implemented by switch hardware. It checks the frames that cross the fabric and allows only those frames that belong to the zone. It is used in conjunction with soft zoning. Now we will talk about zone alias. A zone alias is the custom name that is assigned to a port address or WWN address in a zone. This is because the port addresses and WWN addresses are difficult to read and remember and a human-friendly name or alias is needed that simplifies the zone administration. Once the zone alias is assigned, the zoning operation can be performed using the alias. Now we will talk about best practices in zoning. It is recommended to use single initiator, single target, or single initiator, multiple target zone sets. It is recommended to create a zone with only a few members. It is recommended to define zones using worldwide port names. The default zone setting should be set to no access because when zone setting is disabled, the device will be isolated. 
Zoning changes affect the entire fabric. Several minutes should be allowed for the changes to propagate across the entire fabric if the fabric is large. Now let's talk about virtual fabric. Virtual fabric is known as virtual SAN or vSAN. The vSAN technology allows a large SAN to be logically partitioned into small SANs called virtual SANs or virtual fabrics. A virtual fabric is created by partitioning a physical switch into multiple logical switches. Each virtual fabric is just like a separate physical fabric containing its own dedicated fabric services, data paths, and management capabilities. Hosts and devices that belong to a virtual fabric communicate with each other using a virtual topology implemented over a physical SAN. The virtual fabrics cannot communicate with each other because they are separate entities. As you can see in the diagram, the fiber channel switch has 16 ports. We will create two virtual fabrics by partitioning this switch into two logical switches. The first six ports are configured as vSAN1, and the remaining 10 ports are configured as vSAN2. These vSANs do not communicate with each other. A port in the physical fabric switch cannot belong to two vSANs. For example, port 2 only belongs to vSAN 1. Now let's talk about the features of virtual fabric. Shared topology. All virtual fabrics implemented on a physical SAN share the same topology. Isolation. Virtual fabrics cannot communicate with each other. The traffic of a virtual fabric is contained within its boundaries. Scalability. The ability to create multiple virtual SANs from a single physical SAN increases the scalability of SAN, since it can be suited for different applications. Redundancy. Having more than one virtual SAN provides redundancy, because if one virtual SAN fails, another virtual SAN can be configured as a backup path between the server and the switch. Ease of configuration. It is very easy to move a device from one virtual SAN to another virtual SAN by configuring it at the port level instead of physically moving it to another location. Independence. A change in the fabric configuration of one virtual fabric doesn't affect the other. Now let's look at oversubscription. When several devices contend for the same link, there may not be sufficient bandwidth available over the link to support all the devices. And when this happens, we say the link is oversubscribed. Having oversubscription doesn't mean that it will result in congestion because not all the devices will operate at the maximum throughput at the same time. If the combined throughput of all the devices does not exceed the bandwidth of the link, only then is it safe to oversubscribe the link. There are some cases for which oversubscription is not suitable. For example, traffic generated by video streaming content that is continuous and constant, it is not suitable for oversubscription because it needs sufficient bandwidth. Interswitch links are usually oversubscribed. In order to ensure that performance is not affected over the ISL, the number of devices that can contend for an ISL's bandwidth is calculated as a ratio number called an oversubscription ratio. Oversubscription ratio is the ratio number of non-ISL ports to the number of ISL ports on a switch. Let's say our edge switch has 16 ports, all operating at 4 gigabits per second. And it has two ISLs that are each connected to two core switches. Since there are 16 ports and two are used for ISL, the remaining three ports or non-ISL ports are 14. Hence, the oversubscription ratio is calculated as follows. Oversubscription ratio equals number of non-ISL ports to number of ISL ports. That is equal to 14 to 2. It reduces to 7 to 1. So the oversubscription ratio is 7 to 1. Oversubscription is just a possibility indicating that the seven devices may contend for an ISL and it doesn't mean that all seven devices are really contending for an ISL. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. 
Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about the different features and capabilities of fiber channel switches. We started by looking at what a domain ID is in the context of fiber channel switch, and then we looked at the fabric services provided by the fiber channel switches. These fabric services are name server, login server, fabric controller, management server, and time server. After covering the fabric services, we looked at the fabric login process and the port login process. Next, we looked at what zoning was, and then we looked at what a zone set was. We also looked at the types of zoning, and these are worldwide name zoning and port zoning. We looked at the advantages of zoning, and then we looked at the implementation of zoning. We also looked at what a zone alias is, and then we looked at the best practices in zoning. Next, we looked at what a virtual fabric was, and we looked at its features. We also looked at what an oversubscription was, and lastly, we looked at what an oversubscription ratio was. In the next lesson, you will learn about the end port ID virtualization. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 6, End Port ID Virtualization. In this lesson, you will learn about the End Port ID Virtualization. Since End Port ID Virtualization is based on server virtualization, we're going to start by looking at what server virtualization is, and then we will look at what hypervisor is. Next, we will talk about the virtual machines sharing the host I.O. connections and the problems associated with it. We will then look at the challenges faced with server virtualization. Next, we will recall what endport is, and then we will talk about the fabric login or flogi process. We will also talk about the port login or plogi process. We will then look at endport ID virtualization or NPIV. While talking about endport ID virtualization, we will look at fabric discovery. And then we will look at the implementation of endport ID virtualization. We will also look at the advantages of NPIV. Next, we will look at the challenges faced in a traditional environment. And then we will see how Endport Virtualizer, or NPV, addresses these challenges. We will also look at how Endport Virtualizer works, and then we will look at the benefits of Endport Virtualizer. Next, we will look at what multipathing is, and then we will look at the implementation of multipathing. We will also look at redundancy in the context of multipathing. We will look at why there's a need for multipathing software, and then we will look at the types of multipathing software based on their modes of operation, and these are active passive mode and active active mode. Lastly, we will look at the logical drive visibility of the host operating system in the contents of multipathing. Endport ID virtualization is based on server virtualization, so we will talk about that first. The present day trend in data centers is to use server virtualization to avoid proliferation of physical servers. Server virtualization is the partitioning of a single physical server into multiple virtual servers. These multiple virtual servers are called virtual machines. Each virtual machine behaves like a physical server. The software that implements server virtualization is called a hypervisor and it runs directly on the physical server in place of an operating system. When it comes to accessing storage, these virtual machines share the I.O. connections of the physical server. Sharing the I.O. connections leads to the problem of bandwidth contention among the virtual machines, which in turn affects the quality of service received by the applications running in these virtual machines. In addition to this, Storage administrators don't have application-level visibility in the tools used for the following monitoring, troubleshooting, and securing SAN. This is because IOs come from the same physical HBA. Before server virtualization, a typical practice was to create a zone to allow a server access to a storage LUN. This was done using worldwide name zoning, 
where the WWN of the server's host bus adapter was assigned to a LUN. Since WWN is a unique identifier of HBA, this method not only allowed secure access to the LUN, but it also provided a customizable quality of service for the application. With server virtualization, this practice came to a halt, because a physical server may have multiple virtual machines, and each virtual machine shares access to the server's host bus adapter, and as a result, has the same WWN identification to the LUN. There was no mechanism in place to identify individual virtual machines, to track their use of SAN resources, or to ensure they didn't conflict with the SAN resources. There is also another challenge with server virtualization because it provides live migration of virtual machines from one physical server to another. When live migration is done, storage administrators need to remember to include the WWN of the second physical server's HBA in the zone. Otherwise, the migrated virtual machine will not see its LUN. This is because the virtual machine, after migration, will have the WWN of the second physical server's HBA, and not that of the first physical server's HBA, and SAN will block its access to the LUN, treating it as an unauthorized WWN. One might think that adding dedicated physical server HBAs to each virtual machine would solve the problem, instead of having the hypervisor manage the virtual HBAs. But that's a costly affair, and it doesn't provide much value on investment. In addition, including more physical HBAs would require more endports in a fabric, resulting in a bigger SAN fabric. In order to address these concerns, Endport ID Virtualization, or NPIV, was developed. Before we look at what Endport ID Virtualization is, we will first cover a few basic things, such as Endport, Fabric Login Process, and Port Login Process. We know that an Endport is a node port that refers to the ports on the end devices in a fabric. And it could be either an HBA port in the server, or a target port in storage. Each end port of an end device has a unique 64-bit identifier called the Worldwide Port Name assigned by its manufacturer. In a non-virtualized environment, where an end device is first attached to a fabric switch, it will execute a fabric logon process, or FLOGI process. An FLOGI is a service that establishes a logical connection between the end port of the end device and the F port of the fabric switch. Once the session is established, the endport will send an FLOGI frame to the well known address of the login server with its details, such as node name, endport name, and service parameters. When the FLOGI is successful, the FPort assigns a 24 bit dynamic address, called an endport ID, to the endport of the device. The endport ID assigned to an endport will change each time when the endport is reinitialized. It is used by the endport for communicating with the fabric. The next step after the FLOGI process is the port login, or PLOGI. During the PLOGI process, the end device registers its information, such as endport ID, with the name server. So, in a non virtualized environment, an endport has both a worldwide port name and an endport ID. If we take Fiber Channel HBA as an example, its endport will have a single worldwide port name and a single endport ID associated with it. Endport ID Virtualization, or NPIV, is an ANSI standard that allows the following Single Fiber Channel HBA port, or endport, to register as multiple worldwide port names in the fabric. Each registered worldwide port name is assigned a unique endport ID. In simple words, endport ID virtualization allows a single physical endport to acquire multiple endport IDs. Each endport ID can be mapped to a different initiator, such as a virtual machine. This allows the creation of multiple virtual links over a single physical link by mapping many endport IDs with one fport. 
an end device that supports NPIV features will use the FLOGI process only once to get the first end port ID. In order to acquire additional end port IDs, it will start executing a fabric discovery process or an FDISC process as many times as needed. Fabric discovery is a service that verifies if the existing login in the fabric is still valid. However, it is also used to obtain additional end port IDs. In order to implement NPIV, the SAN itself should be NPIV capable. That is, it should contain NPIV capable HBAs and NPIV capable switches. An NPIV capable HBA can be virtualized into multiple virtual HBAs. Each virtual HBA will have its own virtual worldwide port name and its own virtual end port. The virtual end port, like a physical end port, can register with the fabric to get an end port ID. The end port ID can then be used by the virtual HBA to communicate with the fabric. The advantages of NPIV. In a virtualized environment, each virtual machine can have a separate worldwide port name and its zoning can be managed independently. In addition to that, there would be no need for extra physical HBAs to be connected to SAN, so there would be no need for more edge switches. One major concern when it comes to designing and building a SAN is the number of switches that can exist. Each fiber channel switch in a fabric requires a unique domain ID. When a lot of switches join a fabric, the number of domain IDs becomes a concern. The fiber channel standard allows a maximum of 239 port addresses that can be used for domain IDs. In addition to that, having more domain IDs creates complexity in managing the fabric. And it also impacts the performance because of a lot of switch connectivity. One other design issue that administrators face is the interoperability with the third-party switches. This is because the vendor-specific attributes used for switch-to-switch -switch connectivity between different vendor switches make inter-switch connectivity challenging. In order to address these concerns, Endport Virtualizer was developed. The Endport Virtualizer, or NPV, is based on an Endport ID virtualization but is implemented at switch level. It allows an NPIV-enabled switch to bundle the connections it receives from end devices or end ports into one or more connections that link to a core switch. The requirement for NPV is that the core switch support NPIV features. The NPIV-enabled edge switch registers with the fabric as an end device. The end port virtualizer provides the NPIV-enabled edge switch with a unique port name and node name used for the fabric login, or FLOGI process. Therefore, the NPIV-enabled edge switch is not assigned a domain. The connection from an NPIV-enabled edge switch to a non-NPIV fabric switch is treated as an N port to F port connection rather than an E port to E port connection. An NPIV-enabled edge switch shares the domain ID of the core switch. It doesn't require separate domain IDs to receive connectivity from the fabric and doesn't participate in fabric services. The end ports of the end devices that log in to the NPIV enabled edge switch have a unique node name and port name, and these are seen by the NPIV enabled edge switch as a group of NPIV ports behind a single physical port. The NPIV enabled edge switch maps them to its permanent port name. Now let's look at the benefits of the Endport Virtualizer. The benefit of an Endport Virtualizer is that it makes SAN scalable by allowing more switches to be added to the fabric without using extra domain IDs. It also solves the problem of interoperability between switches that come from different vendors. Now let's talk about multipathing. In a SAN fabric, if a server has only one I.O. path to access the storage device, then in the event of the I.O. path failure, it will not be able to access the storage device. Multipathing is a technique that allows a server to use more than one path to access a storage device. 
it offers both redundancy and performance to the fabric. In order to implement the multipathing technique, the fabric should have redundant components such as the following, fiber channel HBAs, fiber channel switches, and fiber channel cables. These components provide multiple physical paths from the servers to the storage device. Setting up multiple paths with redundant components ensures that there is no single point of failure. So, even if one of the physical paths fails owing to a component failure, the server can still access the storage device using an alternate path. Now let's talk about multipathing software. Having multiple paths alone will not help reroute the input-output requests from one path to another in the event of a component failure. The server should be aware of the existence of multiple paths, otherwise it will not route the I.O. requests to an alternate path in the event of a component failure. Here's where multipathing software comes to our aid. Multipathing software differs in the way it uses multiple paths. The types of multipathing software are as follows. Active-passive mode, active-active mode. In active-passive mode, the multipathing software takes care of only failover recovery. Though the multipathing software manages all the paths between the server and the storage device, it uses only one path for sending the I.O. requests. If that path fails, the multipathing software will identify and access an alternate path to redirect the I.O. requests. In active-active mode, the multipathing software shares the I.O. requests equally across all the available paths. In order to do this, it continuously monitors the paths to see which one is available and enables or disables them based on their availability. The advantage of active-active mode is that it makes the best use of underlying hardware by combining failover recovery with load balancing. The multipathing software ensures that the storage device's logical drive is visible to the host operating system or its application without any duplication, even though the same logical drive is made available several times to the host using each and every path. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about endport ID virtualization. Since endport ID virtualization is based on server virtualization, we started by looking at what server virtualization is, and then we looked at what hypervisor is. Next, we talked about the virtual machines sharing the host I.O. connections and the problems associated with it. We then looked at the challenges faced with server virtualization. Next, we recalled what endport is, and then we talked about the fabric login or F loggy process. We also talked about the port login or P loggy process. We then looked at endport ID virtualization or NPIV. While talking about endport ID virtualization, we looked at fabric discovery. And then we talked about the implementation of endport ID virtualization. We also looked at the advantages of NPIV. Next, we looked at the challenges faced in a traditional environment. And we saw how Endport Virtualizer, or NPV, addresses these challenges. We also looked at how Endport Virtualizer works. And then we looked at the benefits of Endport Virtualizer. Next, we looked at what multipathing is. And then we looked at the implementation of multipathing. We also looked at redundancy in the context of multipathing. We looked at why there is a need for multipathing software, and then we looked at the types of multipathing software based on their mode of operation, and these are active passive mode and active active mode. Lastly, we looked at the logical drive visibility of the host operating system in the context of multipathing. In the next lesson, you will learn about IP SAN. Thank you for watching. Hello, and welcome to Unit 1, Introduction to IP SAN. In this lesson, you will learn about IP SAN.
We're going to start by looking at the evolution of IPSAN, and then we will look at what IPSAN is. Next, we will talk about combining both the application network and the storage network on the same IP network. We will also talk about the IT skills required for IPSAN, and then we will talk about the cost of IP components. Next, we will talk about consolidating storage using IPSAN, and then we will look at the advantages of consolidating storage. We will look at the disadvantages of using FCSAN for storage consolidation, and then we will look at the benefits of IPSAN. We will also look at the types of IPSAN, and then we will look at the three protocols for implementing IPSAN. These are Internet SCSI, or iSCSI, Fiber Channel Over IP, or FCIP, and Internet Fiber Channel Protocol, or IFCP. Lastly, we will look at the types of IPSAN deployments. These are native, bridging, and extension. Now let's look at the evolution of IPSAN. SAN became popular because of fiber channel technology. FCSAN, a high-speed dedicated network with low latency and high availability features, is a perfect choice for mission-critical applications. However, its implementation is complex and requires new skills to manage it. In addition to that, the relatively higher cost of FCSAN infrastructure compared to the Ethernet-based networks affected the adoption of SAN in many organizations. This led to the development of standards and technologies that used Ethernet and IP for storage networking. Its goal was to deliver a SAN that could use the following, existing network infrastructure, existing IT skills, and leverage of low-cost Ethernet to offer performance and scalability with the ease of simplified management across the organization. When storage is networked over an IP network, it offers many of the benefits of fiber channel SAN along with cost savings. Fiber channel SAN uses block IOs to communicate with the storage devices. Block IOs are the storage protocols, such as SCSI, that issue IO commands for reading and writing blocks of data to storage. With the advancement in IP technology, Block IOs can now be handled over an existing IP network. And as a result, we have a storage solution that can connect servers to storage devices using block IOs over IP networks. In simple words, storage area network over IP is referred to as IPSAN. What makes IPSAN more attractive is that it makes storage networking possible over an IP network at low cost and great efficiency. IPSAN leverages the existing IP network infrastructure. The protocols that make IPSAN happen are iSCSI, FCIP, and IFCP. These run on top of TCP IP, which makes it compatible with the components of an IP network, such as cables, switches, routers, and management systems. It is possible to combine both the application network and the storage network on the same IP network by taking advantage of the existing IP network infrastructure. However, many organizations prefer to have a storage network separated from the application network for reasons such as security and performance. Organizations that have existing IP network infrastructures have IT staffs to manage and maintain the networks. While implementing IPSAN, the skills of the existing IT staff can be used instead of hiring new IT staff. The low costs of IP components can be attributed to the high level of interoperability among various vendors' equipment. For example, an Ethernet switch would cost less than a fiber channel switch. The real savings come from the decision to use NICs, which offer zero cost per host connection, over fiber channel HBAs. A NIC can handle a moderate I.O. workload. However, when the workload increases, the protocol overhead will start affecting the performance of the server. One may tend to choose NICs with TCP IP offload engines because it takes over the protocol workload from the server's processor, but it will cost more and will eliminate the savings of implementing an IP SAN. 
So, an IP SAN would make more sense in a low to moderate workload environment. Now we will talk about consolidating storage using IP SAN and its advantages. IP SAN is considered an ideal solution for consolidating storage confined to low-end servers. The advantages of consolidating storage are optional efficiency, improved data security, and lowered total cost of ownership. Now let's look at the disadvantages of using FC SAN for storage consolidation. FC SAN cannot be used to consolidate storage of low-end servers since it is an expensive solution. This is because the cost of a fiber channel HBA, along with the ports of a fiber channel switch used for connectivity, may be more costly than the low-end servers. Now let's summarize the benefits of IP SAN. IP SAN provides a standard SAN-based storage environment by providing block-level storage access to the servers. It offers an ease of migration from direct attached storage. And it has the lowest total cost of ownership when compared to FC SAN. This is because the cost associated with using and managing an existing infrastructure is less than that of FC SAN. Migration to IP SAN is easy because the IP expertise of the existing IT staff can be used. Remote data replication can be done using IP SAN. Use of well managed standards and management tools makes network management easier. While FC SAN is used for business critical applications, IP SAN can be used for applications that are not business critical. Now let's look at the types of IP SAN. IP SAN transports SCSI block IOs over an IP network in two ways. In one method, a fiber channel frame is encapsulated inside an IP datagram with the help of one of the following, FCIP protocol or IFCP protocol. In another method, a SCSI frame is encapsulated inside an IP datagram with the help of an iSCSI protocol. Now we will look at the protocols that are used to implement IP SAN. The three protocols that are used to implement IP SAN are as follows. Internet SCSI or iSCSI, Fiber Channel over IP or FCIP, and Internet Fiber Channel Protocol or IFCP. Now let's look at these protocols one by one. We will start with the iSCSI protocol. The iSCSI protocol functions as a native protocol. It is because all devices in IP SAN have Ethernet interfaces and use iSCSI to communicate with each other without any translation. iSCSI protocol works over long distances and it uses TCP IP headers to ensure that its frames are routed with guaranteed delivery. Now let's look at FCIP. FCIP is a protocol that allows tunneling of fiber channel information through the IP network. And because of this, the fiber channel devices don't know the IP network exists. Since FCIP does tunneling of fiber channel information, it is also called tunneling protocol. FCIP interconnects two isolated FC SANs and merges them into a single FC SAN with only one name server. FCIP also supports long distance connectivity using an IP network. Now let's look at IFCP. IFCP allows fiber channel devices to communicate with each other over the IP network using TCP IP. It does this by replacing the lower level transport mechanism of the fiber channel protocol with TCP IP. IFCP uses an existing IP network to interconnect isolated FC SAN networks that are often geographically distributed without merging them into a single SAN fabric. Since it interconnects FC SANs, IFCP is referred to as a bridging protocol. IFCP supports long distance connectivity using an IP network. Now let's look at the types of deployments in IP storage area networking. There are three types of deployments in IP SAN, native, bridging, and extension. In the native type of deployment, everything is IP based. 
This deployment uses existing IP infrastructure, and all the devices in the infrastructure have Ethernet devices. They connect to Ethernet LAN and communicate using iSCSI protocol with no translations or tunneling required. This is a pure IP SAN deployment, which doesn't need any fiber channel devices, such as fiber channel switches or fiber channel host bus adapters. In the bridging type of deployment, devices with Ethernet interfaces that can communicate using iSCSI protocol are joined to the existing fiber channel SAN. Bridge deployment is used in situations where a lower cost solution is required for consolidating storage in an existing SAN. Bridge deployment uses bridge equipment to join an IP network and FC SAN. In the extension type of deployment, the IP network is used to interconnect existing SANs. This is primarily done to interconnect SANs that are in different locations without having to install a dedicated network to connect them. That brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what we have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about IP SAN. We started by looking at the evolution of IP SAN, and then we looked at what IP SAN is. Next, we talked about combining both the application network and storage network on the same IP network. We also talked about the IT skills required for IP SAN, and then we talked about the cost of IP components. Next, we talked about consolidating storage using IP SAN, and then we looked at the advantages of consolidating storage. We looked at the disadvantages of using FC SAN for storage consolidation, and then we looked at the benefits of IP SAN. We also looked at the types of IP SAN, and then we looked at the three protocols that are used to implement IP SAN. These are Internet SCSI or iSCSI, Fiber Channel over IP or FCIP, and Internet Fiber Channel Protocol or IFCP. Lastly, we looked at the types of IP SAN deployments, native, bridging, and extension. In the next lesson, you will learn about iSCSI SAN. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 2, iSCSI SAN. In this lesson, you will learn about iSCSI SAN. We're going to start by looking at what iSCSI SAN is, and then we will look at the iSCSI architecture. We will also look at the components of iSCSI SAN. These are initiator, target, and IP network. Next, we will look at the physical iSCSI interfaces and then we will talk about the iSCSI networks. We will look at the iSCSI naming, and then we will look at the device discovery process in iSCSI SAN. We will also look at what a network portal is, and then we will look at how an initiator discovers a target. Next, we will talk about the iSCSI session that the initiator establishes with the target, and then we will talk about the login process. We'll look at the full feature phase that begins when the login process is complete. Next, we'll talk about the iSCSI payload and its transportation. Lastly, we will look at the two popular methods used for implementing iSCSI security. These are Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol, or CHAP, and Internet Protocol Security, or IPSEC. Now let's begin with iSCSI SAN. An iSCSI SAN is a storage area network implemented over an IP network using an iSCSI protocol. iSCSI protocol is a mapping of the SCSI protocol over the TCP protocol. It carries block level data over the IP network. As a result, the block storage can be accessed over the IP network as if it's directly attached to the server iSCSI architecture is based on the client-server model of SCSI. In an iSCSI parlance, 
it is referenced to as the initiator target model. Basically, an iSCSI SAN consists of three components, initiator, target, and IP network. In iSCSI SAN, the initiator is the system component that first initiates the read or write requests over the IP network. An example of a device that runs the initiator process is the server computer. The target is the system component that responds to the requests of the initiator over the IP network. An example of a device that runs the target process is the storage array. Initiators and targets need physical iSCSI interfaces to connect to the IP network. The iSCSI interface is available either as a PCI expansion card or it is integrated into the motherboard. There are four different kinds of iSCSI interfaces. Ethernet NIC, Ethernet NIC with TCP offload engine, iSCSI host bus adapter, and converged network adapter. We will begin with Ethernet NIC. Software on the server, called the Software Initiator, configures the standard Ethernet NIC as an iSCSI initiator. Most operating systems, such as Windows and Linux, have built-in software initiators. The second one is Ethernet NIC with TCP Offload Engine, or TOW Engine. This interface is an Ethernet NIC with a TCP Offload Engine and is also configured by a software initiator. The TCP offload engine relieves the server CPU from processing the protocol overhead of the TCP stack. However, other activities such as PDU creation and encapsulation or decapsulation of PDUs are handled by the server's CPU. The third option is the iSCSI host bus adapter. The iSCSI host bus adapter is more powerful than the Ethernet NIC with TOW because it has a CPU and memory, and it takes care of all the iSCSI related processing. The iSCSI host bus adapter has a ROM that allows diskless servers to boot from an iSCSI SAN storage volume. The last kind of interface that we will discuss is the converged network adapter, or CNA. The converged network adapter is similar to iSCSI HBA, but it has the ability to support additional protocols such as FCOE. We will now look at the three common types of IP networks that connect the initiators and the targets. These are shared IP network, dedicated VLAN, and dedicated physical IP network. We will first look at the shared IP network. This is the existing IP network in an organization. When iSCSI SAN is implemented, the IP network will carry both storage traffic and other traffic. This is the cheapest solution available and is not secure, and it has performance problems. The second type of IP network is the creation of a dedicated VLAN. Having a VLAN dedicated for iSCSI SAN ensures that storage traffic is isolated from the other traffic. A dedicated VLAN improves performance and security when compared to a shared IP network. It's also the cheapest solution available since it doesn't require any additional equipment. The last type of IP network that we will discuss is the dedicated physical IP network. This is the best solution available because having a dedicated physical IP network provides the best performance and security. However, the downside is that it is costly. In a dedicated physical IP network, high availability can be achieved by having redundant paths, as in FC SAN. This solution is well suited for business critical applications. Now let's look at the iSCSI naming. In iSCSI SAN, each and every device is identified by a unique global name for addressing purposes. The popular naming convention used in iSCSI SAN is called iSCSI Qualified Name, or IQN. The format of an IQN name is as follows. IQN represents the naming convention used in iSCSI Qualified Name. 
YYYY-MM generally represents the year and month in which the company registered its domain name. The domain name of the company represents the naming authority. The optional string is any string in UTF-8 text format to specify additional information, such as the device model and number. The dot, hyphen, and colon are delimiters that separate the naming fields. Anything after the colon is considered optional text. We will now discuss the discovery of devices by the initiators. For communication to take place between an initiator and a target, the initiator must first find the target with which it can establish contact. The process of finding the target is technically referred to as device discovery. The initiator discovers a target using the target's iSCSI name, IP address, and TCP port. The combination of a target's IP address and its listening TCP port 3260 is called a network portal. There are four ways in which an initiator discovers a target. These are manual discovery, send targets discovery, internet storage network service, ISNS discovery, and service location protocol discovery. In the manual discovery method, the initiator is manually configured with the target's address. This method is not scalable, and it is suitable only for small-scale environments. In send targets discovery method, an initiator is manually configured with the network portal of a target. The initiator then uses the target's network portal to establish contact with the target. In this process, the initiator issues a send targets command to the target. And the target responds with the list of names and IP addresses of the available targets. This method is used in small-scale iSCSI SAN implementation. In the Internet Storage Name Service, or ISNS method, the initiator can automatically discover the target. The initiator and the target register themselves with the ISNS servers. The initiator can query the ISNS for the list of available targets. This method is used in large-scale iSCSI implementation. The last method we will discuss is the Service Location Protocol Discovery. In this discovery method, the initiator issues a Service Location Protocol, or SLP, multicast request to which the target responds. This method requires the SLP user agent to be running on the initiator and the SLP service agent to be running on the target. SLP is used in the medium scale implementation of iSCSI SAN. After the initiator has discovered its target, the next step is to establish an iSCSI session with the target. An iSCSI session can have one or more TCP connections between the initiator and the target. The initiator sets up each TCP connection and initiates the login process for that connection. The initiator starts the login process by connecting to the listening TCP port 3260 on the target. During the login process, the following happens. Both the devices are authenticated, security parameters are negotiated, and optional parameters are negotiated. And finally, the TCP connection is marked as part of the iSCSI session. The login process must be completed before the iSCSI data can be transmitted on that connection. When the login process is complete, the iSCSI session is said to enter the full feature phase. In this phase, the SCSI data transmission occurs between the initiator and the target over the iSCSI session. In iSCSI SAN, the iSCSI protocol is used for transporting SCSI data over the IP network. The SCSI data consists of SCSI commands and user data, and collectively, it is referred to as iSCSI payload. We will now see how the SCSI payload is transported from the initiator to the target. The basic unit of communication in iSCSI SAN is Protocol Data Unit or PDU. The iSCSI payload is encapsulated inside a PDU. 
It is then encapsulated inside one or more TCP segments. The TCP segments are encapsulated in the IP packet, which in turn is encapsulated inside the Ethernet frame. These levels of encapsulation are necessary to transmit the SCSI data over the IP network. The SCSI payload passes through the different layers of the iSCSI protocol model. On the left-hand side of the slide, we have the SCSI payload at the SCSI layer of the initiator. At the iSCSI layer, the SCSI payload is encapsulated inside the iSCSI PDU. It is passed down to the TCP layer. At the TCP layer, the iSCSI PDU is encapsulated inside one or more TCP segments. It is then forwarded to the IP layer, where it is further encapsulated inside an IP packet. Then it is passed down to the Ethernet layer, where it is further encapsulated inside an Ethernet frame. The iSCSI PDU, with all these layers of encapsulation, is ready to be transmitted over the IP network to the target. When the encapsulated iSCSI payload reaches the target, it finds its way up the protocol stack. At the Ethernet layer, the Ethernet encapsulation is removed. It is then passed up to the IP layer, where the IP encapsulation is removed. It is then moved up to the TCP layer, where the TCP segments are removed. It is at the TCP layer that the reordering of frames is done, if they were not received in the order of transmission. The iSCSI PDU is then passed on to the iSCSI layer, where the iSCSI PDU encapsulation is removed to extract the iSCSI payload, which was transmitted by the initiator. Now let's talk about the security aspect of iSCSI SAN. The two popular methods used for implementing iSCSI security are as follows. Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol, or CHAP, and Internet Protocol Security, IPSEC. Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol, or CHAP, allows the initiator and the target to mutually authenticate each other. The authentication is based on a shared secret password. It is highly recommended to use CHAP with strong passwords. CHAP does not secure the data as it is transmitted in clear text over the IP network. This is where Internet Protocol Security, or IPSEC, comes to the rescue. IPSEC provides an end-to-end -end encryption service for the data transferred over the IP network between the initiator and the target. That brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about iSCSI SAN. We started by looking at what iSCSI SAN is, and then we looked at the iSCSI architecture. We also looked at the components of iSCSI SAN. These are initiator, target, and IP network. Next, we looked at the physical iSCSI interfaces, and then we talked about the iSCSI networks. We looked at iSCSI naming, and then we looked at the device discovery process in iSCSI SAN. We also looked at what a network portal is, and then we looked at how an initiator discovers a target. Next, we talked about the iSCSI session that the initiator establishes with the target, and then we talked about the login process. We looked at the full feature phase that begins when the login process is complete. Then, we talked about the iSCSI payload and its transportation. Lastly, we looked at the two popular methods used for implementing iSCSI security. These are Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol, or CHAP, and Internet Protocol Security, or IPSEC. In the next lesson, you will learn about the basics of network convergence. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 1, Introduction to Converged Networking. In this lesson, you will learn the basics of network convergence.
We're going to start by looking at what network convergence is, and then we will look at why there's a need for convergence. Next, we will look at the drawbacks of traditional Ethernet, and then we will compare fiber channel SAN with Ethernet. We will also look at the limitations of fiber channel SAN. We will look at the emergence of network convergence, and then we will look at what network convergence does. We will also talk about the benefits of network convergence. Next, we will talk about the two setups. One is a traditional setup without network convergence, and the other one is a setup with network convergence. Lastly, we will look at what fiber channel over Ethernet, or FCOE, is. Now let's begin by looking at what network convergence is. Network convergence concerns combining an Ethernet LAN and a fiber channel SAN into a single unified network that can carry both server traffic and storage traffic over a single network cable. The primary reasons for having the network infrastructure and storage infrastructure converge into a single infrastructure are the following. To reduce the infrastructure footprint in a data center. To improve the utilization of a data center's resources. And to reduce the cost of ownership. By having multiple types of network traffic handled in a single infrastructure, there are savings in terms of the following cost reduction associated with the purchase, installation, operation, and management of the equipment in a data center. A single infrastructure for both network and storage eliminates the need for multiple types of equipment and cables. The reduced footprint of a data center provides savings in the terms of the cost of the following, equipment, cables, power and cooling consumption, IT staff. Traditionally, Ethernet is used to provide local area connections between clients and servers. However, as a protocol, it is not meant to transfer block data in a storage network. When multiple computers in an Ethernet network try to send data simultaneously, it results in data collisions. As the network consumption increases, the data collisions will also increase significantly and will subsequently consume all the available network bandwidth. When there is network congestion, the Ethernet drops frames, so the higher level protocols, TCP IP, are used to ensure that the frames are retransmitted when they drop, based on an acknowledgement mechanism. Since Ethernet drops frames, it is considered as a lossy network. Compared to Ethernet, Fiber channel is considered a high-speed, low-latency, and lossless network. By lossless, we mean that packets are not dropped when there is network congestion. Fiber channel has desirable traits for a storage network, but it does have some limitations. Fiber channel is a separate network from the data center Ethernet network. And it requires additional infrastructure and costs. In addition to that, FCSAN is a different technology than Ethernet, so it requires different skill sets to install, configure, operate, and manage, adding to the cost in terms of IT staff requirements. One of the factors that contributed to network convergence was the continuous evolution of the Ethernet network from the transmission speed of 100 megabits per second to a widely used speed of 10 gigabits per second. At present, 40 gigabits per second and even 100 gigabits per second has become a reality. In the simple context of data transmission speeds, the speed of Ethernet have exceeded the available speeds of fiber channel. Furthermore, Ethernet can now be enriched with the capabilities that make it a low latency and lossless network similar to fiber channel. Network convergence combines network and storage traffic into a unified network that has the following high performance, low latency, high scalability, and high reliability. The benefits of network convergence are as follows it provides a single high speed network that can support both network and storage traffic. 
it offers low latency, high throughput, scalability, and reliability. It provides cost reduction. It offers simplified management and improved resource utilization. Now let's look at an oversimplified traditional setup without network convergence. As you can see on the slide, the server requires Ethernet NIC and HBA adapters to connect to both the Ethernet network and the fiber channel SAN. In addition to that, each network requires different switches and cables. As a result, purchases, installations, configurations, operations, and management are done separately for both the Ethernet network and the FC SAN. Now let's look at a setup with network convergence. The converged network uses enhanced Ethernet capabilities to combine both storage and network traffic on a single network. In this diagram, the server is using only one converged network adapter. And the converged network adapter connects to a DCB switch. A converged network doesn't require different types of adapters, switches, and cables to have the clients, servers, and storage devices connected to the network. Fewer devices results in simplified management and reduces the total cost of ownership. The convergence network uses enhanced Ethernet as its physical transmission technology. And the fiber channel frames transmitted over Ethernet are called fiber channel over Ethernet, or FCOE frames. In the next lesson, we will talk more about FCOE. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you have learned the basics of network convergence. We started by looking at what network convergence is, and then we looked at why there's a need for network convergence. Next, we looked at the drawbacks of traditional Ethernet, and then we compared fiber channel SAN with Ethernet. We also looked at the limitations of FC SAN. We looked at the emergence of network convergence, and then we looked at what network convergence does. We also talked about the benefits of network convergence. Next, we talked about the two setups. One is a traditional setup without network convergence, and the other one is a setup with network convergence. Lastly, we looked at what Fiber Channel over Ethernet, or FCOE, is. In the next lesson, you will learn about Fiber Channel over Ethernet, or FCOE. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 2, Fiber Channel over Ethernet. In this lesson, you will learn about Fiber Channel over Ethernet, or FCOE. We're going to start by looking at what Fiber Channel over Ethernet, or FCOE, is. And then we will look at FCOE encapsulation. Next, we will look at the FCOE protocol stack. And then we will look at the FCOE infrastructure. We will also look at the traditional setup in a data center, and then we will look at the FCOE setup. While talking about the FCOE setup, we will look at the Converged Network Adapter, or CNA, and the FCOE switch. Next, we will look at what lossless Ethernet is, and then we will look at what Data Center Bridging, or DCB, is. While talking about DCB, we will also look at what DCB task groups are. We will look at three Ethernet enhancements, and these are Priority Flow Control, or PFC, Enhanced Transmission Selection, ETS, and Data Center Bridging Exchange, or DCBX. Lastly, we will look at the three common FCOE deployments, and these are I.O. Link Consolidation, top-of-rack deployments, and end-of-road deployments. 
Now let's look at what Fiber Channel over Ethernet, or FCOE, is. Fiber Channel over Ethernet is a protocol that allows Fiber Channel frames to be transmitted over Ethernet. It's used for transmitting storage traffic along with the network traffic over enhanced Ethernet. In FCSAN, the SCSI data is encapsulated inside a Fiber Channel frame on the Fiber Channel host bus adapter of the server before being transmitted over the FC network. In a converged network, the SCSI data is also encapsulated into an FC frame, but the FCOE protocol encapsulates the fiber channel frames into Ethernet frames that can be transmitted along with the IP traffic. The sizes of the FC frames are over 2 kilobytes, so it becomes necessary for the adapters and switches in the converged network to support baby jumbo frames in order to prevent the segmentation of the FC frames. During the encapsulation process, FCOE wraps the complete fiber channel frame without modifying it. The encapsulation provides one-to-one -one mapping of the fiber channel frames with the Ethernet frames, which means that a fiber channel frame is not segmented, nor are multiple frames placed inside a single Ethernet frame. FCOE ensures that the construct of a fiber channel frame is preserved to provide for the following. An FCOE frame can be seamlessly integrated with the existing FC environments. An FCOE frame can use fiber channel technologies, such as zoning, distributed name server, registered state change notification, and management tools. Now let's look at the FCOE protocol stack. An FCOE protocol stack is constructed by replacing the lower layers, FC0 and FC1, of the fiber channel protocol stack with the physical layer and the data link layer of the lossless Ethernet. However, the FCOE protocol stack retains the upper layers of the FC protocol stack, that is, FC4, FC3, and FC2. As you can see in the diagram, the FCOE protocol lies in between the FC layers and the Ethernet layers. Now let's look at the FCOE infrastructure. The FCOE infrastructure consists of three components. A converged network adapter, lossless Ethernet links, and an FCOE switch. In a traditional data center approach, the server has a NIC for network traffic and a fiber channel HBA for storage traffic, as shown in the diagram. With FCOE, these two adapters in the server are replaced with a single converged network adapter. A single CNA connects the server to an FCOE switch, which in turn provides connectivity to LAN and SAN. A converged network adapter, or CNA, is a network adapter that can function as a standard Ethernet NIC, as well as a fiber channel HBA. It supports both protocols. When a CNA is installed in a server, the server operating system will not see any FCOE device, but it will see a NIC entity and an HBA entity, so that the CNA can function as a storage adapter as well as a LAN adapter. The CNA has an FCOE entity that completes the encapsulation before sending it over the Converged Enhanced Ethernet, or CEE, link. It also completes the decapsulation of Ethernet frames when it receives from the CEE link. An FCOE switch is a network device that connects both FCSAN and Ethernet LAN environments. It contains an FCOE entity that extracts the FC payload from the Ethernet frames and forwards it to the FC storage devices. It also encapsulates FC frames that need to be transmitted over Ethernet links. FCOE switches inspect the ether type of the frames that they receive from the servers. If the ether type of the frame is FCOE, 
Then the switch recognizes that it contains the FC payload and forwards it to the FCOE entity within the switch, as you can see in the diagram. The FCOE entity extracts the FC payload and forwards it to the FC port. If the ether type of the frame is not FCOE, then, as shown in the diagram, the switch handles the traffic as network traffic and forwards it over the Ethernet ports. Since FCOE switches support both storage traffic and network traffic, they can seamlessly integrate into FC SAN and Ethernet environments. FCOE frames are transmitted over an Ethernet that does not drop frames in the event of network congestion. Such an Ethernet is called a lossless Ethernet. With FCOE, any lost frames can be recovered only at the SCSI layer because it has no transmission control protocol, TCP. Fortunately, a set of enhancements are available to the Ethernet to support the lossless behavior. This is called data center bridging, or DCB. DCB is also referred to as converged enhanced Ethernet. The IEEE workgroup that provided these extensions to enable the enhanced Ethernet is the DCB task group. We will look at three such enhancements that provide a lossless transport for FCOE frames over the Ethernet. These are Priority Flow Control, or PFC, Enhanced Transmission Selection, or ETS, and Data Center Bridging Exchange, or DCBX. Now let's look at Priority Flow Control, or PFC. Priority Flow Control is a link layer protocol that allows high priority traffic to flow while temporarily stopping the low priority traffic when network congestion occurs. Now let's look at Enhanced Transmission Selection, or ETS. Enhanced Transmission Selection is a link layer protocol that controls the bandwidth management by ensuring that one kind of traffic doesn't consume too much of the overall bandwidth. ETS can be used to allocate bandwidth by prioritizing the traffic. Now let's look at Data Center Bridging Exchange, or DCBX. Data Center Bridging Exchange is a discovery and configuration protocol that allows for the discovery and configuration of fiber channel devices on the converged network. It is an extension of Link Layer Discovery Protocol, or LLDP. Now let's talk about FCOE deployments. FCOE deployments are seen in three areas. I.O. link consolidation, top of rack deployments, and end of row deployments. We will first look at I.O. link consolidation. Server I.O. link consolidation occurs because of server virtualization. The I.O. link consolidation results in higher I.O. needs because of the applications in multiple virtual machines. CNAs with 10 GBE throughputs can be used to satisfy the higher I.O. needs that arise from I.O. link consolidation. CNAs with 10 GBE throughputs also allow for a consolidation of slower Ethernet and FC connections onto a faster connection. Next, we will look at top-of-rack deployments. A rack is a standardized frame used in data centers to mount multiple computing devices. In top-of-rack deployments, the switches are placed on the top shelves of the rack, while the physical servers that connect to the switches occupy the shelves beneath them. Most server racks in data centers connect to LANs and SANs using two redundant Ethernet switches and two redundant fiber channel switches. In such environments, a single pair of FCOE switches can simultaneously replace all the Ethernet switches and fiber channel switches in the rack that connects to LANs and SANs. An FCOE switch eliminates the need for separate switches and cables for LANs and SANs because both LAN and SAN traffic can travel over a CEE link. 
This results in less rack space usage and simplified cabling throughout the data center. Since we touched on cabling, we need to mention that the copper twin axial cabling is an available option for FCOE solutions of a 10 gigabit ethernet. It uses SFP plus interface for copper connection. It consumes low power and is low cost. The copper twin axial cabling supports short distances less than 10 meters. It is ideal for server to top of rack or end of row switch environments. Next, we will look at end of row deployments. In data centers, the server racks are arranged in rows. In end of row deployments, a common switch is placed at the end of the row, and the servers in the individual racks of a row are connected to it. There is no need for top of rack switches in this kind of deployment. The number of FCOE switches that participate in end of row deployments is fewer than top of rack deployments, but they provide high availability with no single point of failure since they have redundant components. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about Fiber Channel over Ethernet, or FCOE. We started by looking at what Fiber Channel over Ethernet, or FCOE, is. And then we looked at the FCOE encapsulation. Next, we looked at the FCOE protocol stack. And then we looked at the FCOE infrastructure. We also looked at the traditional setup in a data center, and then we looked at the FCOE setup. While talking about the FCOE setup, we looked at the converged network adapter, or CNA, and the FCOE switch. Next, we looked at what lossless Ethernet is, and then we looked at what data center bridging, or DCB, is. While talking about DCB, we also looked at what DCB task group is. We looked at the three Ethernet enhancements. These are Priority Flow Control, or PFC, Enhanced Transmission Selection, or ETS, and Data Center Bridging Exchange, or DCBX. Lastly, we looked at the three common FCOE deployments. These are I.O. Link Consolidation, Top of Rack Deployments, and End of Row Deployments. In the next lesson, you will learn about environmental concerns and physical safety in data centers. Thank you for watching. Hello. And welcome to Unit 3, Data Center Operations. In this lesson, you will learn about the environmental concerns and physical safety in data centers. We're going to start by looking at what a data center is, and then we will look at why there's a need for data centers. We will also look at the data center environment. Next, we will look at the heating, ventilation, and cooling, or HVAC system of the data center and then we will look at how HVAC works in a data center. While talking about HVAC, we will look at the typical hot aisle, cold aisle conditions in a data center. We will also look at the rack mount servers, and then we will talk about rack loading. We will look at the power distribution in data centers. And next, we will look at the fire risk in data centers. While talking about the fire risk, we will look at the impact of fire, and then we will look at fire suppression agents. We will also look at the types of fire suppression agents, which are wet pipe, dry pipe, and gaseous agents. Next, we will look at the lifting techniques, and then we will look at what an anti-static device is. Lastly, we will talk about rack stabilization. Now, let's look at what a data center is. According to Wikipedia, a data center is a facility used to house computer systems and associated components, such as telecommunications and storage systems. 
It generally includes redundant or backup power supplies, redundant data communications connections, environmental controls, for example, air conditioning and fire suppression, and various security devices. But why do we need data centers? Data centers help organizations centralize the management of computing resources. They reduce the total cost of ownership by consolidating power, cooling, and maintenance required for running servers in a single place. Now let's talk about the data center environment. Racks and rack-mounted servers are used in data centers. The components of a data center, such as servers, storage arrays, power distribution units, switches, etc., generate a lot of heat. Heat should be removed because it affects the electrical equipment, resulting in equipment malfunction or failure. Since heat affects the reliability of the electrical equipment, we need to keep the data center cool. This requires exhausting the hot air from the machines and moving in cold air, just like in a PC chassis. Hot air and cold air within the data center should not be mixed, and for this reason, we have the hot aisle, cold aisle arrangement. If the cold air mixes with the hot air without going through the equipment, then it becomes useless. Now let's talk about HVAC. HVAC stands for heating, ventilation, and cooling. An HVAC system provides optimum temperature and indoor air quality for data center performance. The HVAC system not only keeps things cool and keeps things humid to an extent, but it also removes contaminants from the air. Let's see how HVAC works. As you can see in the diagram, cold air is pumped from the HVAC system into the cold aisle as an input for the servers. Servers pull in cold air from the front to cool themselves, and they exhaust hot air, which goes into the hot aisle. The AC duct carries the hot air from the hot aisle to the HVAC to cool it again, or exhaust it elsewhere. Now let's look at the typical hot aisle, cold aisle temperatures. The cold aisle temperature is between 55 degrees and 78 degrees Fahrenheit and the hot aisle temperature is between 73 degrees and 96 degrees Fahrenheit. The amount of heat carried by the stream of air exiting the heat load should be 15 degrees to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Now let's talk about rack mount servers. Racks in data centers contain servers. Rack mount servers have a different form factor than desktop servers. When it comes to rack loading, Large rack mount servers and equipment are installed at the bottom of a rack to ensure the rack doesn't fall. Rack loading should not exceed the weight rated capacity of the raised floor to ensure that the raised floor doesn't collapse because of overweight. Now let's talk about power distribution in data centers. Data centers are usually connected to multiple power grids for redundancy. If power on one grid is lost, a data center will still continue to operate normally. For devices with redundant power supplies, power comes from separate circuits providing redundancy. Power requirements of a data center are determined by taking into account the power requirements of all the equipment and factoring in future growth. All data center equipment is grounded and independent of other building grounds. Now let's talk about fire risk in data centers. The demand for power increases with an increase in the amount of equipment. Many types of equipment with increased power consumption when confined in small spaces are susceptible to fire accidents. Fire in a data center can have a catastrophic impact on business operations. Financial loss to the business due to fire can be staggering. The downtime of business operations due to fire can be days or weeks. Data centers have fire detection systems that detect fires. Portable fire extinguishers are placed at critical locations in the data center. Data centers have emergency power off switches, which are big red buttons on the wall that cut off all power. Emergency power off switches should be used in emergencies because servers are not friendly to hard power shutdowns. 
In the event of a fire, fire suppression agents put out the actual fire. Selecting the right fire suppression agent is critical because it can either allow quick recovery or it can result in weeks of recovery. There are three types of fire suppression agents, wet pipe, dry pipe, and gaseous agents. A wet pipe sprinkles plain water in the presence of smoke or heat. The biggest disadvantage of a wet pipe is that it drenches servers, storage devices, and other equipment in water, and water can catastrophically damage the equipment. Putting out a fire using water can cause the data center to be down for weeks. A dry pipe works just like a wet pipe, but the water is not kept in the pipes. This is because a water pipe can accumulate moisture due to condensation and drip on the equipment. Since a dry pipe is a water-based system, the disadvantage is the same as wet pipe. Gaseous agents provide immediate fire suppression by denying heat and oxygen to a data center fire. Clean agents such as FM200 remove heat from a fire, and inert gases such as carbon dioxide deprive a fire of oxygen. Gaseous agents provide immediate recovery of business operations. However, they are expensive and may require training the staff to handle a fire. Now let's talk about physical safety techniques. We'll first talk about proper lifting techniques and weight considerations. The easiest way to injure ourselves is through improper lifting of heavy equipment. It happens constantly, and almost everyone lifts improperly. The first thing is, don't attempt to lift anything that is more than a quarter of your weight. For example, if the equipment is 50 pounds and you weigh 175 pounds, then don't lift it. You need to be at least 200 pounds to lift something that is 50 pounds. If you're not, then have someone help you. You also want to lift from your legs with a straight back. This is difficult to describe, but easy to do. Generally speaking, a lot of people will lift with their back bent over, not bending their legs, just their torso. Putting so much stress on their back. Your back is not meant to take that much stress. So bend your legs and stand up from your legs, bending your knees and straightening them. That way, the bulk of the weight is going down into your quads, into your hamstrings, and into your calf muscles, rather than into your lower back. We know that static electricity damages hardware components, so we use anti-static devices to help us neutralize static electricity, preventing damage to devices such as hard disk drives. Examples of anti-static devices are anti-static bags, anti-static mats, and anti-static straps. Last but not least, we will talk about rack stabilization. Rack stabilization is critical to the technician's physical safety as well as for the stability of the equipment. Racks that are not stable are likely to collapse at any time. For rack stability, large servers and equipment must be installed at the bottom of the rack. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what we've learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about the environmental concerns and physical safety in data centers. We started by looking at what a data center is, and then we looked at why there's a need for a data center. We also looked at the data center environment. Next, we looked at the heating, ventilation, and cooling system, or HVAC system, of the data center. And then we looked at how HVAC works in a data center. While talking about HVAC, we looked at the typical hot aisle, cold aisle conditions in a data center. We also looked at rack mount servers and then we talked about rack loading. We also looked at power distribution in data centers. Next, we looked at fire risk in data centers. While talking about fire risk, we looked at the impact of fire, and then we looked at the fire suppression agents. We also looked at the types of fire suppression agents. These are wet pipe, dry pipe, and gaseous agents. Next, we looked at lifting techniques and then we looked at what an anti-static device is. Lastly, we talked about rack stabilization. In the next lesson, you will learn about replication. Thank you for watching.
Hello and welcome to Unit 1, Replication. In this lesson, you will learn about replication. We're going to start by looking at what replication is. Since replication is one of the methods employed to ensure business continuity, we will touch upon business continuity. We will also discuss the purpose of replication. Next, we will look at the characteristics of a replica. These are recoverability and restartability. We will look at the two important aspects of replication planning. These are Recovery Point Objective, or RPO, and Recovery Time Objective, or RTO. We will then talk in detail about the two categories of replication. These are Local Replication and Remote Replication. Lastly, we will look at Site Redundancy. Now let's look at what replication is. Replication is the process of making an exact copy of data, either locally or remotely. It's one of the methods employed to ensure business continuity. Business continuity is the process and procedures for ensuring that an organization's critical business functions will either continue to operate in the event of a disaster or recover in a short time after a disaster has struck. It is critical that data should be continuously available for the smooth functioning of a business. But its availability can be disrupted by threats such as natural disasters, unplanned IT outages, cyber attacks, adverse weather, security breaches, and so on. The main purpose of replication is to provide a replica or exact copy of data that is suitable for recovering the data in the event of data loss. Now let's look at the important characteristics of a replica. A replica should offer both of the following, recoverability and restartability. Recoverability is the ability to restore the data from the replica to the point of failure in the event of data loss or corruption. Restartability means that data is in a consistent state and the application that has had its data replicated is completely aware of the replicated data. There are two important things that need to be considered in replication planning. These are Recovery Point Objective, RPO, and Recovery Time Objective, or RTO. Now let's talk about Recovery Point Objective, or RPO. Recovery Point Objective is the maximum tolerable time period before an outage, during which loss of data is considered acceptable. It also specifies the time interval between two consecutive backups. We will explain this with the help of an example. Let's say our RPO is 10 minutes as per the service level agreement with the business. This means that the acceptable data loss can be a maximum of 10 minutes prior to an outage. For example, if we had taken a complete replication of our production data at 9 a.m. and the outage occurred at 9.09 a.m. as shown in the diagram, then the production data written for 9 minutes between 9 a.m. and 9.09 a.m. will be lost and cannot be recovered from the replica. The data lost during this period is considered acceptable because of the 10-minute RPO, and it has to be recovered through other means. It is always better to have a smaller RPO because the smaller the RPO, the lesser the difference between the replica and the production data. Now let's talk about Recovery Time Objective, or RTO. Recovery Time Objective is the maximum tolerable time period within which a business process must be restored to an operational state after an outage. Going back to our example, let's say our RTO is two hours. And if the outage occurs at 9.09 a.m., then the business will be expected to be up and running before 11.09 a.m., with the service as good as it was at 9 a.m. before the outage occurred. There are two categories of replication, local replication and remote replication. 
Local replication refers to the replication that is done within a storage array or a data center. Remote replication refers to the replication that is done at a remote site. Now let's talk about local replication. The local replication concerns snapshots and clones. The purpose of the snapshot technology is to capture the data copy of a disk volume at a specific moment of time without affecting the business operations. The created data copy is referred to as a snapshot. Snapshots allow access to their contents regardless of the modifications done to the original data. The primary purpose of a snapshot is to provide the ability to go back to a certain point in time to recover data. This feature helps to instantly restore business operations. For example, restore the business operation to a time just before the data loss or data corruption has occurred. There are two ways in which a snapshot can be created, full snapshot and space efficient snapshot. Now let's talk about full snapshot. A full snapshot creates a full copy of the entire disk volume, and for this reason, it is also called a clone. A full snapshot, or clone, requires as much space as the disk volume itself. For example, if we are going to take two full snapshots of a disk volume, then we would need 200% capacity of the disk volume. Though it is not an efficient replication model, it is still valuable for disaster recovery. Now let's talk about space efficient snapshot. A space efficient snapshot creates the snapshot based on the changes since the last snapshot. As the name suggests, space efficient snapshots require less space, allowing administrators to take frequent snapshots of the disk volume. Regardless of the type of snapshot taken, it is important to note that a snapshot will be usable only if it is in a consistent state. A snapshot can be in a consistent state only when the application is aware of it. Let's look at the key benefits of snapshot technology. Snapshots allow creating multiple recovery points that help in reducing the amount of data loss after a disaster and thus supplements daily backups without affecting the production systems. Snapshots provide instantaneous access to data, and thus have an RPO of seconds, which makes them suitable for supplementing backup technologies. Snapshots allow creating data copies that can be used for business continuity, rapid application development, and regulatory requirements. It should be noted that snapshots do not replace traditional backups, but rather supplement them, because snapshots can help in the quick recovery of data at a specific point in time. Now let's talk about remote replication. In remote replication, data is replicated from the production site to the remote site. Since data is replicated from the production site to the remote site, the production site is referred to as source and the remote site is referred to as target. Remote replication solutions are broadly categorized into the following, synchronous replication and asynchronous replication. In synchronous replication, whenever the server writes data to the storage system in the production site, it is concurrently written to the storage system in the remote site. As a result, synchronous replication guarantees zero data loss. Let's demonstrate synchronous replication with the help of an oversimplified example. In our example, as shown in the diagram, the production site has a server and a storage system. And our remote site has a storage system. When the server writes data to the storage system at the production site, this data is replicated from the source storage system to the target storage system at the remote site. Once the data is written to the target storage system, an acknowledgement is issued to the source storage system, which in turn issues an acknowledgement to the server, indicating that the write operation is complete. 
Since the server's write operation is committed to both the source storage system and the target storage system, synchronous replication provides zero RPO after a disaster. However, the downside of this replication is that the server's input-output operations are affected because of the time taken to replicate the data on the remote storage system. The distance between the primary site and the remote site is dependent on the application's tolerance for latency and is typically less than 125 miles. In addition to that, the link between the primary site and the remote site must be able to handle peak workload bandwidth. Now let's talk about asynchronous replication. In asynchronous replication, the server's write operation is committed to the storage system of the primary site and acknowledged immediately by the server. Unlike synchronous replication, the write operation to the remote storage system in asynchronous replication is no longer tied to the acknowledgement of the server. There is no impact on the application's response time since the write operations are acknowledged immediately. But on the downside, the data on the remote site will lag behind that of the production site. The RPO of asynchronous replication is non-zero. It depends on the available network bandwidth of the replication link between the primary site and the target site. RPO also depends on the workload transferred from the primary site to the target site. While the performance is increased compared to synchronous replication, there is no guarantee that the remote site will have the current copy of the data in the event of data loss at the primary site. The main benefit of asynchronous replication is that it allows replication over long distances because the application's response time is not dependent on the distance between the primary site and the remote site. Let's explain this with the help of an example. In our diagram, the production site has a server and a storage system, and our remote site has a storage system. They are all linked. When the server writes data to the source storage system, an acknowledgement is sent immediately to the server from the storage system. The source storage system replicates the data to the target storage system by transmitting the write data to the target storage system as they are received from the server. If the write data is more, it is buffered and sent to the remote storage system. Once the target storage system commits the data, it sends an acknowledgement to the source storage system. In essence, Asynchronous replication decouples the remote replication process from the acknowledgement sent to the server by the source storage system. Now let's discuss site redundancy. In earlier lessons, we saw redundancy is achieved through redundant components. Now we will go one step further to look at how redundancy is achieved at a higher level through redundant sites. The redundant site is a secondary site that is ready to resume the operations of the primary site in the event of a disaster. The redundant site ensures that business operations don't suffer when disaster devastates an entire primary site, such as by an earthquake, flood, or hurricane. It should be noted that under normal circumstances, the secondary site is not used for production workloads. When configuring redundant sites, we can use either synchronous replication or asynchronous replication, depending on the distances between the primary site and the remote site. We will explain this with the help of an example as shown in the diagram. Let's say the distance between the primary site and the remote site, S1, is less than 125 miles. In this case, we can configure synchronous replication between them. The data replication between the primary site and the remote site provides a disaster recovery solution. By this, we mean if the primary site goes down, then the remote site can be active and resume the operations of the primary site. Site redundancy ensures smooth running of the business because the remote site is now providing the services of the primary site 
even though the primary site is down. The downside of site redundancy in case of synchronous replication is that a local disaster such as a hurricane, flood, or earthquake will bring down both sites at the same time. So an alternative would be to have one more secondary site that is geographically distant from the primary site. Asynchronous replication is configured between the primary site and the new secondary site, S2. So we have data being replicated from the primary site to two secondary sites. The data is replicated from primary to secondary site S1 using synchronous replication, and to secondary site S2 using asynchronous replication. With this site redundancy disaster setup, even if a local disaster affects both the primary site and secondary site S1, the secondary site S2 can become active and resume the primary site's operations. Since we are dealing with asynchronous replication for the secondary site S2, the data at S2 will lag behind the primary site, and the users will see a hit in the application response time because of network latency. However, a drop in performance is better than no service at all. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about replication. We started by looking at what replication is. Since replication is one of the methods employed to ensure business continuity, we touched upon business continuity. We also discussed the purpose of replication. Next, we looked at the characteristics of a replica. These are recoverability and restartability. We looked at the two important aspects of replication planning. These are recovery point objective, RPO, and recovery time objective, RTO. We then talked in detail about the two categories of replication. These are local replication and remote replication. Lastly, we looked at site redundancy. In the next lesson, you will learn the basics of backup and restore. Thank you for watching. Hello, and welcome to Unit 1, Introduction to Backup and Recovery. In this lesson, you will learn the basics of backup and recovery. We're going to start by looking at what a backup is, and then we'll talk about the purposes of backup. These are disaster recovery, operational backup, and archive. While talking about disaster recovery, we will look at tape-based backup and remote replication. Next, we will look at considerations for a backup strategy. Lastly, we will talk about backup performance. Now let's look at what a backup is. A backup is a copy of data that is meant for recovering the data when it is lost or corrupted. Backups are primarily done for three reasons, disaster recovery, operational backup, and archive. Let's look at disaster recovery. We need backups to recover data in the event of a disaster. When the primary site goes down due to a disaster, the backups are used to restore services at the secondary site. Different backup solutions are implemented by organizations depending on their RPO and RTO requirements. When a tape-based backup medium is used as a backup solution, it is shipped and stored at an off-site location. When a disaster strikes the primary site, these tapes are brought to the secondary site to restore services. When organizations have strict RPO and RTO requirements, they use remote replication technology to replicate data at the secondary site. In the event of a disaster at the primary site, the services are restored at the secondary site in a relatively short time. Now let's talk about operational backup. Backups are not only needed in the event of a disaster, but also when the production data gets corrupted or lost. 
The backups used in such cases are the operational backups, which are backups of data at certain points in time. For example, if a user deleted a file unknowingly, it can be restored using the operational backup. Operational backups are created using incremental or differential techniques. We will discuss these techniques in an upcoming video. Now let's look at archive. Backups are done for the purpose of archiving and for legal compliance. Content addressable storage is used as a primary solution for archival. However, small and medium sized organizations are still using traditional backups, such as optical disks and tapes. We will discuss more about content addressable storage in an upcoming video. Now we will look at the considerations for a backup strategy. The primary factors that are taken into account when deciding on the backup strategy are the RPO and the RTO, which specify the acceptable data loss and the time taken to recover the service. Another factor that is taken into consideration is the retention period for the backed up data. For example, operational backups are retained for a relatively shorter period of time than archives. Backup strategy should also take into account the time to perform the backup operations because it should not affect the production. Now we will talk about backup performance. The performance of the backup is affected by the media used for making the backup. For example, if it takes 20 hours to back up with a physical tape library, the same data will take less than one hour to back up using a virtual tape library. That brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned the basics of backup and recovery. We started by looking at what a backup is, and then we talked about the purposes of backup. These are disaster recovery, operational backup, and archive. While talking about disaster recovery, we looked at tape-based backup and remote replication. Next, we looked at considerations for a backup strategy. Lastly, we talked about backup performance. In the next lesson, you will learn the basics of backup and restore methods. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 2, Backup and Restore Methods. In this lesson, you will learn about backup and restore methods. We're going to start by looking at the types of backup methods, and in specific, we will look at full backup, incremental backup, differential backup, and synthetic full backup. Next, we will talk about verifying backups, and then we will talk about checksums. We will also look at what application verification is, and then we will talk about data retention schemes. While talking about data retention schemes, we'll look at one such scheme called Grandfather, Father, Son, or GFS. Now let's look at the types of backup methods. Backups are primarily done to secure data. There are different types of backup methods based on the level of detail that a backup encompasses to suit a particular business need. The major types of backup methods are full backup, incremental backup, differential backup, and synthetic full backup. A full backup is a backup of all the data on the production volume. A full backup is created by copying all the data to a storage device, such as a tape library, where it will be stored for future use. For example, if we are creating a full backup of a disk, then it would be a complete backup of all the files and folders on that disk. The advantage of a full backup is that it minimizes the downtime in the event of an outage, because the data can be restored quickly. The disadvantages of a full backup 
is that it consumes a lot of time because it has to back up all the data. Irrespective of the changes done to the production volume, even if there is a minor change or no change at all, a full backup will do a complete backup of all the data, consuming a significant storage capacity on the storage device. As the production data grows, the time to create a full backup of that data also increases. Businesses have a backup window or a time slot dedicated for taking backups. If the full backup is done over a network to a tape library, the backup window may not be sufficient to back up all the data. In addition to that, a full backup carried out over the network consumes the network bandwidth because it has to transport a lot of data from the production volume to the storage device. Now let's look at incremental backup. An incremental backup is a backup of the data that has changed since the previous backup. The previous backup can either be an incremental backup or a full backup. We will explain this with the help of an example. Let's say on Sunday we performed a full backup of our data that is on the production volume. On Monday, let's say a few changes were done to the data on the production volume. In the diagram, we will highlight these changes in blue. An incremental backup on Monday will copy only the changes that were done to the production volume after Sunday's full backup. On Tuesday, let's say a few more changes were done on the production volume. In the diagram, we'll highlight these in pink. An incremental backup on Tuesday will copy only the changes that were done on the production volume after Monday's incremental backup. On Wednesday, let's say a few more additional changes were done on the production volume. In the diagram, we will highlight these in orange. An incremental backup on Wednesday will copy only the changes that were done on the production volume after Tuesday's incremental backup. The advantage of incremental backup is that it takes less time to back up and consumes less storage capacity than a full backup because it only copies the changes, and not all the data. In addition to that, an incremental backup carried out over the network will not be network intensive because it has less data to transport from the production volume to the storage device. The disadvantages of incremental backup is that restoring data from the backup can be a time-consuming process. If the data must be fully restored, the restoration process must begin with the full backup and then involves all the intermediate incremental backups that were taken since the full backup. We will explain this with the help of our previous example. Let's say on Wednesday, we lost our production data because of a disk failure. Now, if we want to restore the complete production data, then the last available backup that is, Tuesday's backup alone, will not help. It's because Tuesday's backup contains only the copy of the data that has been changed since Monday. Having Monday's backup alone will not help because it contains only the copy of data that was changed since Sunday. So, if we have to restore the complete production data as it was on Tuesday, we need Sunday's full backup and all the incremental backups from Monday and Tuesday, as shown in the diagram. It should be noted that the restore process of an incremental backup is more complicated than that of a full backup. Now let's take a look at the differential backup. Differential backup is the backup that copies all the changes since the last full backup. This type of backup is also known as cumulative backup. We'll explain this with the help of an example. Let's say on Sunday, we performed a full backup of our data that is on the production volume. On Monday, let's say a few changes were done to this data. In the diagram, we will highlight these changes in blue. A differential backup on Monday will copy the changes done to the production volume after Sunday's full backup. 
Till now, it looks similar to an incremental backup, but you will notice the difference soon. On Tuesday, let's say a few more changes were done on the production volume. In the diagram, we will highlight these changes in pink. A differential backup on Tuesday will copy all the changes that were made on the production volume after Sunday's full backup. On the contrary, an incremental backup will copy only the changes that were made on the production volume since the previous incremental backup. This is the main difference between the differential backup and the incremental backup. On Wednesday, let's say a few more additional changes were done on the production volume. In the diagram, we will highlight these in orange. A differential backup on Wednesday will copy all the changes that were done on the production volume after Sunday's full backup. The advantage of differential backup over full backup is that it takes less time to back up and takes less storage capacity than a full backup, as it does not copy all the data. It is easier and takes less time to restore than an incremental backup. In the event of data loss, the full restoration requires the last full backup and the last differential backup to fully restore the production data to the state it was on the day of the last differential backup. We will explain this with the help of our previous example. Let's say on Wednesday we lost our production data because of a disk failure. Now, if we want to restore the complete production data, we need only Sunday's full backup and the last available differential backup, that is, Tuesday's backup. This is because Tuesday's backup contains the copy of all the data that changed since Sunday's full backup. There is no need for intermediate differential backup of Monday because the changed data of Monday is already available in Tuesday's differential backup. So, if we have to restore the complete production data as it was on Tuesday, we need Sunday's full backup and Tuesday's differential backup. The restore process of a differential backup is easy compared to an incremental backup's restore process. Now we will look at synthetic full backup. Synthetic full backup is a full backup created using the last full backup and all the subsequent incremental backups. It's also called progressive backup. It is used in production environments that cannot extend their backup window to accommodate full backups. The primary purpose of synthetic full backup is to create a full backup offline without affecting the production I.O. workloads. We will explain this with the help of a previous example that involved incremental backup. Let's say that on last Sunday, we performed a full backup of our data that is on the production volume. And from Monday to Saturday, we will be taking incremental backups. Let's say we want to take a full backup on the coming Sunday. Now, instead of taking a full backup again, what the synthetic backup does is, it aggregates the incremental backups of all days from Monday to Saturday and merges it with the existing full backup as shown in the diagram. The resulting backup will be the full backup that we wanted on the coming Sunday. The reason why synthetic full backup is possible is because the incremental backup, so aggregated, reflects all the changes that were made since the last full backup. The advantages of synthetic full backup is that it frees the network bandwidth from the backup process. The downside of synthetic full backup is that it is complicated because it involves merging the incremental backups with the last full backup. It should be noted that backups are no good if data cannot be recovered from them. It is likely that the data stored on the backup media can become corrupted because of demagnetization or defects. So, whenever data is backed up, we must verify the backup to ensure that data in the backup can be read and restored when needed. However, 
Verifying a backup doesn't ensure that the structure of the data in the backup is correct. And for this reason, backups are created with backup checksums. Checksums are used to verify the integrity of the data. A successful verification of a backup with checksums ensures that the data on the backup is reliable. Some software applications or their agents perform a consistency check on their data. This type of verification is called application verification. Now let's talk about data retention schemes. It is necessary to back up data regularly so that it can be recovered in the event of data loss. However, if we want to retain this backed up data forever, it will take a lot of physical space to store the backup media, such as tapes or hard disk drives that were used to store the backup data. So, the solution is to use backup media in a rotation scheme to minimize the number of tapes or hard disk drives used, but without compromising the data recovery capability. Now we will talk about one such backup media rotation scheme called Grandfather, Father, Son, or GFS. Grandfather, Father, Son is a rotation scheme that provides a regular recurring schedule for backing up data. It minimizes the number of tapes or disks used, but with the ability to recover data. In the Grandfather, Father, Son rotation scheme, Backup media are categorized into three types, son, father, and grandfather. Son backups refer to the backup media used for daily backups on a rotational basis. Father backups refer to the backup media used for weekly backups on a rotational basis. A full daily backup in a week is promoted from son to father. Grandfather backups refer to the backup media used for monthly backups on a rotational basis. The most recent full monthly father backup in a month is promoted from father to grandfather. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about backup and restore methods. We started by looking at the types of backup methods, and in specific, we looked at full backup, incremental backup, differential backup, and synthetic full backup. Next, we talked about verifying backups, and then we talked about checksums. We also looked at what application verification is, and then we talked about data retention schemes. While talking about data retention schemes, we looked at one such scheme called Grandfather, Father, Son, or GFS. In the next lesson, you will learn the various methods of backup implementation. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 3. Backup Implementation Methods In this lesson, you will learn the various methods of backup implementation. We're going to start by looking at the components of a backup environment. These are Backup Server, Backup Client, Media Server, and Backup Target. Next, we will look at how these backup components work together. Lastly, we will take a detailed look at the types of backup implementation methods. These are Direct Attached Backup, LAN-based Backup, SAN-based Backup, and Serverless Backup. Now let's look at the components of a backup environment. A backup environment typically consists of the following. A backup server, backup clients, media servers, backup targets. We will explain these terms with the help of a diagram. A backup server is the central control center for all backup activities. It is responsible for coordinating the backup operations of all the backup clients in the backup environment. It maintains a backup catalog 
which is a special purpose database that contains all the information about the backup environment. It also manages the backup schedules of backup jobs, such as when to backup a client. A backup server can be associated with many backup clients and media servers. A backup client is any computer that contains data to be backed up. It could be an application server, database server, file server, and so on. A software agent is needed on the backup client to assist with the backup process. It accesses the storage device through the media server. A media server is any computer in the backup environment to which backup devices are connected. It controls those devices. It processes all the backup jobs and writes data to the backup devices. A media server can be associated with only one backup server. A backup target is a device that stores the backup data. For example, a tape library is a backup target. It's also known as a backup device. These components work together in a client-server model. Now let's see how they work together. The backup server gets the backup-related information from its backup catalog. It then initiates the backup process as per the schedule by sending a request to the backup client's software agent asking it to start the backup job. In the meantime, the backup server instructs the media server to keep the backup device ready for storing backup data. The backup client software agent responds to the backup server's request with its metadata. The software agent then sends the data to be backed up over the network to the media server. The media server writes the data to the backup target, such as a tape library. The media server then sends the metadata information to the backup server with the status of the backup operation. Now we will look at the different implementations of backups. There are four types of backup implementation methods. These are direct attached backup, LAN based backup, SAN based backup, and serverless backup. In direct attached backup, the backup device is directly connected to the backup client, which in turn is connected to the backup server through LAN, as shown in the diagram. There is no separate media server since the backup client acts as a media server. In this arrangement, the LAN is used for sending only metadata from the backup client to the backup server. This amount of metadata traffic transported over the LAN is less than the application traffic. The advantages of direct attached backup is the backup devices can operate at high speed. Backup and restore operations are optimized for performance because the backup devices are both local and dedicated to the backup client. It is suitable for small scale environments. The disadvantage of direct attached backup is that it impacts host performance because the backup workload consumes host resources such as processor, memory, and I.O. bus. Also, it is not scalable and is not suitable for large environments. Now let's look at LAN-based backup. In LAN-based backup, the backup server, the backup client, and the media server are connected to the LAN. The backup device is directly connected to the media server that is part of the LAN. In this type of implementation, the backup data is sent from the backup client to the media server over the LAN, and the media server writes the data to the backup device. The advantage of LAN-based backup is it reduces cost because it increases storage utilization of backup devices. It improves manageability because it has a centralized backup. The disadvantage of LAN-based backup is it impacts host performance because the backup workload consumes the host resources, such as processor, memory, and I.O. bus. It affects the network performance and availability 
especially when the application traffic and the backup traffic share the same network bandwidth. The impact on the network performance can be reduced by isolating the application traffic from the backup traffic by having a separate network installed for backups. Now let's look at a SAN-based backup. SAN-based backup is also known as LAN-free backup. In a SAN-based backup, the backup client, the media server, and the backup device are connected to the SAN. In addition to that, the backup client and the media server, in turn, are connected to the backup server through LAN, as shown in the diagram. In this arrangement, the backup client sends the data being backed up over the SAN to the media server, which in turn writes the data to the backup device, as shown in the diagram. The advantage of SAN-based backup is that network performance of LAN is not affected. This is because SAN is used for sending backup traffic, and the LAN is used only for sending metadata from the backup client and the media server to the backup server. The disadvantage of SAN-based backup is that it impacts host performance because the backup workload consumes the host resources, such as processor, memory, and I.O. bus. Let's look at the serverless backup. Serverless backup is a SAN-based backup that uses SAN resources to copy data from the source storage device to the backup storage device. It is called serverless backup because it doesn't use host resources to perform the backup. Serverless backup uses the extended copy function of the fiber channel SAN to copy data from one storage device to another storage device in the SAN. Let's explain this with the help of a diagram. The backup server initiates the backup process by sending a request to the backup client over the LAN to start the backup. As you can see, the backup client, storage array, and tape library are connected to the storage area network. The data of the backup client is stored in the storage array. Using the extended copy function, the data is copied from the storage array to the tape library over the SAN. The advantage of serverless backup is that it doesn't use host resources because the data is copied between the storage devices. LAN is not used to transport backup traffic. There is an increase in performance because the backup traffic is transported over fiber channel SAN. The disadvantage of using serverless backup is that applications using SAN may be affected indirectly if the SAN experiences high backup traffic. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about the various methods of backup implementation. We started by looking at the components of a backup environment. These are backup server, backup client, media server, and backup target. Next, we looked at how these backup components work together. Lastly, we took a detailed look at the types of backup implementation methods. These are direct attached backup, LAN based backup, SAN based backup, and serverless backup. In the next lesson, you will learn about backup targets. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 4, Backup Targets. In this lesson, you will learn about backup targets. We're going to start by looking at what a backup target is. Next, we will look at the history of tape, and then we will look at what a tape is. We will also look at what a tape drive is, and then we will look at what a tape library is. We will look at the disk to tape or D2T backup solution. Next, we will look at what shoe shining is, and then we will look at multiplexing. We will also look at multi streaming, and then we will talk about linear tape open or LTO.
Next, we will talk about the performance of a media server in a typical backup environment. And then we will look at the Network Data Management Protocol, or NDMP. We will also look at what a virtual tape library, or VTL, is. Next, we will compare the virtual tape library versus physical tape library. And then we will talk about the disk to disk or D2D backup solution. Lastly, we will talk about the disk to disk to tape or D2D to T backup solution. Now let's look at what a backup target is. A backup target is a device that stores the backup data. It is also known as a backup device. An example of a backup target is a tape drive. It uses tapes as the backup media. During the latter part of the 20th century, tape was used for backup and disaster recovery purposes. Tape is still used today as a backup medium, as it has stability and low unit cost. Tape refers to the magnetic tape that is kept inside a casing, called a cartridge. Typically, it is used for offline data storage. A tape drive is a data storage device used to either write data to a magnetic tape or to read data from it. A tape drive provides sequential access to data by moving the tape forward or backward. It's not suitable for random access because the tape drive has to literally wind the tape around the reels to read any particular data. Now we will look at the tape library. A tape library is a storage device that contains the following. One or more tape drives, a bunch of slots for holding the tape cartridges, a barcode reader for identifying the tape cartridges, and an automated mechanism called a robot for loading and unloading the tape cartridges to and from the tape drives. Now let's talk about disk to tape. Disk to tape, or D2T in short, is a backup solution in which data is backed up from a hard disk drive of a backup client, such as an application server, to a tape. Tape and tape drives are not going to disappear in the near future because they offer the following advantages. Cost effective. The cost of storing data in tapes is less expensive than other storage media. For example, Tape is less expensive than hard disk drives on a per byte basis. The cost of adding tapes to a tape library is less than adding disks to a storage array. Power consumed by a tape library is significantly less than hard disk drives. Since tapes are ideally used for large archives, the data stored in tapes is not often accessed, which saves cost in power and cooling over hard disk drives. Scalability. Tape libraries are scalable because they allow tape drives to be added, and in some cases, even cartridge slots can be added. With the addition of tape drives, capacity and performance of the tape library is also increased. Consolidation. A tape library allows consolidation of individual tape backup solutions, and with a centralized administration, the entire backup process can be managed. Compression. Tape drives automatically compress the data in their hardware, whereas hard drives don't. Encryption. Tape drives have inbuilt encryption processes, and each tape drive has a key management system attached to it. Worm support. Tapes have worm capability. This means that data can only be written once and cannot be modified. Worm functionality of tapes is used for legal compliance when it comes to archiving data. Reliability. Unlike the hard disk drives, the heads in tape drives are separated from the tape media. Even if the head fails, the tape will still be in working condition. The tapes are durable because the hard casing covering the tape protects it from physical damage. Performance. The read-write performance of tape drives starts from 120 megabytes per second, whereas enterprise disk drives offer an average read-write performance of 100 megabytes per second. 
multiple disk drives running in parallel are needed to match the performance of a single tape. Removability. Tapes are designed to be ejected from the tape library. They can be moved to other locations effortlessly because they weigh less and are durable. A 3.5 inch hard disk drive weighs about 1.5 pounds, whereas a tape weighs around 0.5 pounds. Since tapes have high density, the shipping cost per gigabyte of a tape is less than enterprise disk drives. Now let's look at what shoe shining is. In a tape-based backup environment, during the backup process, if the data transfer rate is not fast enough to cope with the transfer speed of the tape drive, then the tape drive's buffer is emptied. When this happens, the tape drive will stop and will rewind to the last write position to begin writing when the buffer fills. This event is termed shoe shining. Shoe shining impacts performance as it slows down the backup process. In addition, it also causes wear and tear to the tape. Most backup applications often use multiplexing to avoid shoe shining. In multiplexing, data is sent from multiple backup clients to a single tape drive. Since these clients cannot send data fast enough to keep the tape drive busy, multiplexing allows them to send their backup data simultaneously. While multiplexing allows the tape drive to operate at full speed, it requires backups to be coordinated across several backup clients to stream this data. The disadvantage of this approach is that it increases the time taken to restore the data because the backup application now has to get the data through several backup sessions to restore data to the particular application server. Now let's talk about multi-streaming. In multi-streaming, data from a single backup client is simultaneously sent in multiple streams to multiple tape drives. Multi-streaming is required when the client's data transfer rate is faster than the transfer speed of a single tape drive. It is critical that not more than a single stream of data should be allowed to access a single tape drive at the same time because it would cause drive failure. While there are many tape technologies, the most popular tape technology is Linear Tape Open, or LTO. It is a magnetic tape-based data storage technology that was developed as an open standard alternative to proprietary tape technologies. The open nature of LTO provides compatibility among the products offered by different vendors. There are different generations of LTO tape drives, starting from LTO1 to the latest generation, LTO6. LTO drives feature high capacity and fast data transfer rates. The maximum data capacity and data transfer speed of each generation of LTO drive is tabulated on the slide. One of the highlights of LTO drives is that they provide backward compatibility to help companies protect their investments in technology. Each generation of LTO drive is backward read-write compatible with the previous generation of the LTO media, and also read compatible with LTO media two generations old. Let's explain this with the help of an example. LTO6 drives are read-write compatible with LTO5 media, and also read compatible with LTO4 media. Now let's look at Network Drive Management Protocol or NDMP. In a typical backup environment, backup data is sent from an application server to the media server over the LAN. The media server buffers the data in its disk cache until it can stream sufficient data to the tape library without slowing down the data transfer rate. While the data is buffered, the media center loads the tape for transferring the data to it. The downside of this approach is that the media server becomes a bottleneck where data has to be cached before it can be transferred to the tape library. In order to overcome this bottleneck imposed by the media server, the Network Data Management Protocol, or NDMP, was developed to allow application servers to directly backup data to the tape library. NDMP is a protocol to manage network backups. 
In NDMP parlance, the backup and restore operations are referred to as data management operations. And the backup server that coordinates these operations is called a data management application server, or DMA server. In the NDMP configuration, the DMA server manages the tape library and maintains the backup catalog. And the data gets backed up directly from the application server to the tape library. Now let's talk about Virtual Tape Library, or VTL. A virtual tape library is a disk-based backup system that emulates a physical tape library. A VTL is made up of the following. Computer hardware run by a Linux-based operating system. A software program that emulates the components of a physical tape library. And a RAID-based disk array to prevent loss of backup data in the event of a drive failure. In a backup environment, a VTL presents itself as a physical tape library, and hence it can be easily integrated with the existing backup software, backup processes, and policies. Now let's compare a virtual tape library with a physical tape library. In VTL, a new virtual tape drive can be added on demand through software configuration at no additional cost. However, in a physical tape library, to add a new tape drive, it must be purchased and manually installed. VTLs are increasingly scalable over physical tape libraries. This is because more hard disk drives can be added to the disk array enclosure to increase the storage capacity. In a physical tape library, backup failures occur when there is a problem with the tape drives and media. Whereas in a VTL, backup failures are very rare because it uses RAID-based storage. Most VTLs are capable of delivering a throughput of 150 megabytes per second, which improves performance, and allows backups to be completed within the backup window. However, modern physical tape drives that have the ability to backup data along with data compression at a throughput rate greater than 50 megabytes per second are faster than VTL, especially when backing up large amounts of multi-streamed data. Restoring backups in VTL takes less time than a physical tape library, especially when recovering particular files. This is because the VTL is a disk-based system, and disks are good at random access, while tape drives are good at sequential access. However, for restoring large amounts of data, the physical tape library can be faster when it involves parallel read access by multiple drives. We saw earlier that multiplexing data streams to a single tape drive was done to avoid shoe shining. However, restoring data from a multiplexed backup takes a long time because data from several backup clients are mixed up and are spread over the tape. So instead of multiplexing data, a VTL assigns a separate virtual drive to each backup client. The data backed up can be copied from the disk to a physical tape without multiplexing. And, as a result, recovering data from such physical tape can be faster than restoring it from a multiplexed backup. Hence, VTLs are usually deployed as a front end to a traditional physical tape library. Backup to disk is also called disk to disk backup or D to D backup because data is copied from one hard disk drive to another hard disk drive. Backup to disk has become more reliable and less expensive than in the past, making it a compelling alternative to tape technology. This is evident from the fact that Virtual Tape Library itself is a disk based system. Let's discuss the advantages of D to D. Speed of recovery. D2D offers quick recovery of lost data since hard disk drives are good at random access. Cost effective. Hard disk drives are less expensive than they were in the past. User friendly. Disk based backup doesn't require loading and unloading like tape drives. Reliability. Disk based backup has become more reliable over time 
especially when it is implemented in a RAID configuration. Flexibility. Backup disks can be implemented in storage devices that can be directly attached as follows. To an individual server, as a network attached storage on a LAN, or as storage connected to a SAN. Now let's look at disk to disk to tape or D2D to T backup solutions. In a D2D to T backup solution, data is first backed up on a disk where it is retained for a certain period of time for quick restores of lost data, and then it is moved to a tape. That brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about backup targets. We started by looking at what a backup target is. Next, we looked at the history of tape, and then we looked at what a tape is. We also looked at what a tape drive is. And then we looked at what a tape library is. We looked at the disk to tape or D2T backup solution. Next, we looked at what shoe shining is. And then we looked at multiplexing. We also looked at multi streaming. And then we talked about linear tape open or LTO. Next, we talked about the performance of a media server in a typical backup environment. And then we looked at Network Data Management Protocol, or NDMP. We also looked at what a virtual tape library, or VTL, is. Next, we compared the virtual tape library to a physical tape library. And then we talked about the disk to disk, or D2D, backup solution. Lastly, we talked about disk to disk to tape, or the D2D to T backup solution. In the next lesson, you will learn about content addressable storage and archive. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 5, Content Addressable Storage and Archive. In this lesson, you will learn about Content Addressable Storage and Archive. We're going to start by looking at Information Lifecycle, and then we will look at what Fixed Data is. Next, we'll look at Content Addressable Storage, or CAS. While talking about CAS, we will define Content Address and Fixed Content Asset. We'll also look at what an archive is, and then we will look at the types of archives. The types of archives we will cover are online archive, nearline archive, and offline archive. Next, we will look at the legal compliance associated with the maintenance of archives, and then we will talk about the traditional archives. While talking about traditional archives, we'll also look at the disadvantages of traditional archives. Next, we will look at CAS as archives, as an archive solution, and then we will talk about the benefits of content addressable storage. We'll also look at what vaulting is. And lastly, we will look at what e-vaulting is. Now let's look at information lifecycle. In the information lifecycle, once data is created, it is accessed and edited multiple times. But as the data becomes old, it is no longer edited, and so it becomes a fixed entity. Such types of data that do not change are called fixed data. Examples of fixed content are static web pages, emails, electronic documents, videos, and so on. When fixed data becomes voluminous, it's difficult to store and access. Thus, content addressable storage was developed to store fixed data. Content Addressable Storage, or CAS, is an object-based data storage technology developed for storing and retrieving fixed data. It stores user data and its metadata as separate objects. The stored object is assigned a unique global identifier called a Content Address, or CA. The CA uniquely identifies the content, but not its location. The content address is generated from the binary representation of the object. Fixed data stored for future business purposes is called a fixed content asset. 
fixed content assets are used by businesses for various purposes, such as generating revenue, improving business operations, and taking advantage of its historic value. Since fixed content assets will be accessed frequently, they should be readily available on demand. Now let's talk about archive. An archive is a storage area where fixed content is stored. There are three types of archives. Online archive, nearline archive, and offline archive. An online archive is for businesses that need frequent and immediate access to the fixed data in the archive. In this type of archive, the storage device is directly connected to the host, allowing for immediate access of data. A nearline archive is for businesses that need regular access to the fixed data in the archive. In this type of archive, the storage device is connected to the host, but has to be mounted for accessing the data. As the name, nearline, suggests, the archive is near to becoming online when the storage device is mounted. An offline archive is for businesses that don't need regular access to the fixed data in the archive. In this type of archive, the storage device is neither directly connected nor can it be loaded for real-time access. Manual intervention is needed before data can be accessed. Businesses, as part of their legal compliance, are required to ensure that data in the archive cannot be modified or deleted. This is the reason why archives are usually stored on a Write Once, Read Many device, or a worm device. An example of a worm device is a CD-ROM. Worm devices ensure that the data is not modified. Archives are traditionally stored on optical disks and tapes. The downside of archiving on optical disks and tape drives is that optical disks and tape drives are not capable of recognizing the data being stored in order to avoid the same data being stored many times. In addition to that, optical disks and tape devices can succumb to wear and tear. So, there is a risk of data being lost. And, there will also be overhead involved if the data has to be converted into new formats to allow access to the content. Content addressable storage emerged as an alternative to overcome the shortcomings of optical disks and tape drives. CAS improves data accessibility and also provides protection to the archived data. Now let's look at the benefits of content addressable storage. Authenticity. CAS provides content authenticity. All the data stored using CAS has a unique content address. The unique content address is generated using the binary representation of the object. Whenever an object is accessed, its content address is generated using a hashing algorithm and compared with the object's original content address. If the validation fails, the object is restored from the mirrored copy. Integrity. CAS ensures that content is not modified. The hashing algorithm used to check the content authenticity also ensures the integrity of the content. Single Instance Storage CAS ensures that only a single instance of data is stored. This is done using a unique signature that's generated from the binary representation of the data. Retention Enforcement CAS protects and keeps the data based on the retention policy. Now let's talk about vaulting and e-vaulting. Vaulting is the process of securing the data by copying it to a tape and placing it in a secure off-site location called a vault. E-vaulting is the process of transferring the data to a secure off-site location called an e-vault through a computer network. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about content addressable storage and archive. We started by looking at information lifecycle, and then we looked at what fixed data is. 
Next, we looked at what Content Addressable Storage, or CAS, is. While talking about CAS, we defined Content Address and Fixed Content Asset. We also looked at what an archive is, and then we looked at the types of archives. The types of archives we covered are Online Archive, Nearline Archive, and Offline Archive. Next, we looked at the legal compliance associated with the maintenance of archives. And then we talked about the traditional archives. While talking about traditional archives, we also looked at the disadvantages of traditional archives. Next, we looked at CAS as archives. And then we talked about the benefits of content addressable storage. We also looked at what vaulting is. And lastly, we looked at e vaulting. In the next lesson, you will learn about capacity optimization methods. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Unit 1, Capacity Optimization Methods, Part 1. In this lesson, you will learn about a popular capacity optimization method called data deduplication. We're going to start by looking at the need for capacity optimization. And then we will look at the popular capacity optimization method called data deduplication. When we cover data deduplication, we will look at what data deduplication is. And then we will look at the methods of data deduplication. These are file level deduplication and block level deduplication. We will also look at deduplication ratio. And then we will look at the characteristics of data which have an impact on data deduplication. After that, we will talk about the effectiveness of data deduplication. And then we will look at the types of data deduplication. Under the types of data deduplication, we will look at post process deduplication and inline deduplication. Next, we will cover appliance based deduplication. And lastly, we will look at software based deduplication. Now let's look at the need for capacity optimization methods. Storage has become a major cost component in data centers. Though the cost of storage devices is decreasing, the tremendous growth of data has increased the cost of managing the storage systems. As a result, organizations want to utilize storage more efficiently without increasing the cost. Capacity optimization methods are the methods that reduce the consumption of space required to store data. The popular capacity optimization methods are data deduplication, compression, and thin provisioning. Data deduplication refers to the elimination of duplicate data. In data deduplication, duplicate data is identified and deleted. As a result of deduplication, only a single instance of data, that is, only one copy of the data, is retained in the storage. There are two major ways in which data deduplication is accomplished. File level deduplication and block level deduplication. File level deduplication is also called single instancing deduplication. In file level deduplication, duplicate files are identified and deleted. Since an entire file is compared with other files for eliminating duplicates, the files should be exactly the same to be considered as duplicates. File level deduplication is simple and fast, but it doesn't look into duplicate content that exists in different files. For example, let's say there are two exact copies of a Word file. If we make even a negligible change to one of the Word files, such as adding a space, then it will make that file a different one. As a result, deduplication will not delete that duplicate file, and it will still be occupying storage space. Block level deduplication is also called subfile level deduplication. In block level deduplication, a file is broken into smaller, fixed, or variable size blocks, 
and duplicate blocks are found for deletion. It is more efficient than file level deduplication because it works at a block level. Block level deduplication makes it possible to deduplicate files that are similar but a little different. Unlike file level deduplication, block level deduplication does not require absolutely identical copies of the same file for deduplication. There are two types of block level deduplication fixed length deduplication and variable length deduplication. In fixed length deduplication, a file is broken into fixed sized blocks, and duplicate blocks are found for deletion. Fixed length deduplication consumes less processing power, but is less effective than variable length deduplication. This is because any change to an identical file will result in the creation of blocks that have changed. Therefore, two files with a small amount of difference will only have a few identical blocks. Let's explain this with the help of an example. In our diagram, the top line shows the original fixed size blocks of a file before any change is done to the file. The bottom line shows the fixed size blocks after a single slight change was done to the file. Though the data is almost identical in both of these lines, the blocks have changed, and hence, only a few duplicate blocks are identified. Even after deduplication, we will be storing nine blocks of the same file. In variable length deduplication, a file is broken into variable sized blocks, and duplicate blocks are found for deletion. Variable length deduplication is considered very effective because any change in an identical file will be restricted to its block alone, and it will not affect other blocks of the file. Therefore, two files with a small amount of difference are going to have many identical blocks. Let's explain this with the help of an example. In our diagram, the top line shows the original blocks of a file before any change is done to the file. When we added the changes to the block C of the file, it alone changes and other blocks are not affected. The bottom line shows the variable sized blocks after a single slight change that was done to the file. Only the block C has now changed to block F. The rest of the blocks, A, B, D, and E, are identical to the same blocks in the top line. After deduplication, we are only storing six blocks of the file. The storage space savings by deduplication are depicted by a ratio called the deduplication ratio. The deduplication ratio refers to the number of bytes input into the data deduplication process divided by the number of bytes output from the process. For example, if 100 bytes are input into the data deduplication process and the output from the process is 10 bytes, then our data deduplication ratio is 10 to 1. It means that we have saved the storage space by 90 bytes, that is, by 90%. The quantity of storage space saved in a data deduplication process depends on the characteristics of the data. For example, full backups deduplicate well because it contains most of the data from the previous backups, and only a small amount of data would have actually changed. In order to increase the effectiveness of data deduplication, it's better to avoid compression during data backups. This is because compressing data not only reduces the number of bytes in a file, but it also randomizes the leftover bytes. With randomization, a file cannot be effectively deduplicated. Data deduplication is categorized into two types based on the place where it occurs. These are post process deduplication and inline deduplication. In post process deduplication, Data is first written to a storage device, and it is deduplicated at a later time. Let's explain this with the help of an example. In our diagram, we have the existing data on our storage device. Let's say the new data, G, H, and I, arrive. Then it is immediately written to the storage device. At a later time, the data deduplication process is carried out on all the stored data. 
it looks for duplicate data that can be deduplicated. And in this case, it has found two copies of G, and it is deduplicated. Next, it has found two copies of H, and it is deduplicated. This process continues until there is no more duplicate data. The advantage of post-process deduplication is that it allows for faster writes since there is no deduplication done while storing the data. The disadvantage of post-process deduplication is that storing duplicate data may become an issue if the storage device is near full capacity. In inline deduplication, data is deduplicated in real time as it enters the storage device. If the deduplication process finds a block that already exists on the storage device, it doesn't store that block, but rather references it to the existing block. Let's explain this with the help of an example. In our diagram, we have the existing data on our storage device. Let's say the new data, G, H, and I, arrive. In this case, the deduplication process is performed as the data arrives before it is written to the storage. So when data G arrives, the deduplication process checks it with the existing data. And since it already exists, the data G is not stored, but it is referenced to the existing data G. When H arrives, the deduplication process is performed, and since it already exists, the data H is not stored, but it is referenced to the existing data H. When data I arrives, the deduplication process finds that data I doesn't exist, so it stores I to the storage device. The advantage of inline deduplication is that it consumes less storage because data is not duplicated. The disadvantage of this approach is that data intake can be slower. And, as a result, it can affect throughput of the storage device. Now let's look at appliance-based deduplication. A deduplication appliance is a computer system with a specific purpose to carry out the deduplication process using its hardware and firmware. It is also referred to as hardware deduplication. Deduplication appliances can perform either post-process or inline deduplication processes. It also offloads the deduplication load from the existing systems. The deduplication appliance accepts data streams from multiple sources to perform the deduplication process, and the resulting deduplicated data can coexist on its disk storage. It is a high-performance and high-cost solution. Now let's look at software-based deduplication. Software-based deduplication doesn't have dedicated hardware to carry out the deduplication. Since the software does the deduplication process, it needs to be installed on a host. The installed software uses the processing power of the host to carry out the deduplication process. It is a low-performance and low-cost solution. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about a popular capacity optimization method called data deduplication. We started by looking at the need for capacity optimization, and then we looked at the popular capacity optimization method called data deduplication. When we covered data deduplication, we looked at what deduplication is, and then we looked at the methods of data deduplication. These are file level, and block level. We also looked at deduplication ratio, and then we looked at the characteristics of data which have an impact on data deduplication. After that, we talked about the effectiveness of data deduplication, and then we looked at the types of data deduplication. Under types, we looked at post-process deduplication and inline deduplication. The last thing we covered was appliance-based deduplication and software-based deduplication. In the next lesson, you will learn about compression and thin provisioning. Thank you for watching.
Hello and welcome to Unit 2, Capacity Optimization Methods Part 2. In this lesson, you will learn about the two popular capacity optimization methods. These are compression and thin provisioning. When we cover compression, we will look at what compression is, and then we will look at the advantages of compression. We will also look at the types of compression in detail, and these are post process compression and real-time compression. The last thing we will talk about regarding compression is about applying deduplication before compression. Next we will cover thin provisioning. Under this topic, we will look at what thick provisioning is, and then we will look at what thin provisioning is. We will also look at what over-provisioning is, and lastly we will talk about zero-page reclaim. Now let's look at what compression is. Compression is the ability to convert data into a smaller size by eliminating similar blocks in the original data. Compression encodes the data using fewer bits than the original data. Let's explain this with the help of an example. In our example, let's say the original data is in binary format as shown in the slide. Then, if we encode our original data with fewer bits, then our compressed data may look as 110, 5 times 1, 0, 0, 1, 4 times 0, and 1, as shown in the slide. What we have done is eliminated similar bits of 1s and encoded it as 5 times 1. Likewise, we have also eliminated similar bits of zeros and encoded it as 4 times 0. This is the underlying concept of compression. The advantage of compression is that it allows data to consume less storage space. Compression is categorized into two types based on the place where it occurs. These are post-process compression and real-time compression. In post-process compression, data is first written to a storage device, such as a storage array, in an uncompressed manner and later, the data is compressed. This approach is considered inefficient as it consumes significant processing power because of the intensive disk operations. In real-time compression, data is compressed in real-time as it is stored in the storage device. This approach is considered efficient since it consumes less processing power because of reduced disk operations. Now let's talk about applying deduplication before compression. A compressed file is not suitable for deduplication because compression will remove identical blocks of data. So for this reason, compression should be applied after deduplication and not the other way around. Before we talk about thin provisioning, let's talk about traditional storage allocation methods. In the traditional storage allocation method, storage capacity is allocated up front to individual servers. This traditional model is often referred to as thick or fat provisioning. Now let's talk about thin provisioning. Thin provisioning is a capacity optimization method that optimizes the consumption of existing storage. Thin provisioning is the on-demand allocation of the storage space based on the actual need. It does not allocate the storage space up front, as in traditional storage deployment. We will explain thick and thin provisioning with the help of an example. Using the traditional thick provisioning model, let's say we create a volume of capacity 1000 gigabytes, and at the creation time, 1000 gigabytes of physical storage space on the storage is immediately reserved for the exclusive use of that entire volume, irrespective of how much space will really be used. If only 250 gigabytes of the 1000 gigabytes is actually used for writing data, then the unused allocated capacity is 750 gigabytes. Unfortunately, we have only 25% of storage capacity utilization, and the remaining unused capacity cannot be used for creating new volumes, since it is tied to the thick volume. As a result, storage capacity gets wasted. Now, using the thin provisioning model, let's say we create a volume of capacity 1000 gigabytes. 
At the creation time, there's no reservation of 1000 gigabytes of physical storage space on the storage, but the application sees it as physical storage capacity of 1000 gigabytes. The physical storage space is allocated on demand only when an application writes data to the volume. If 250 gigabytes of the 1000 gigabytes is actually used for writing data, then only 250 gigabytes of physical storage space is allocated. As a result, storage capacity doesn't get wasted. The unallocated physical storage capacity on a storage array can be used for creating new volumes. As a result, thin provisioning uses all of the physical storage capacity to create logical volumes. With thin provisioning, storage capacity utilization can be geared towards achieving 100% with a very little administrative cost. Now let's talk about over provisioning. Thin provisioning provides a mechanism that allows applications to see more storage capacity than what is physically available on the storage array. This is called over provisioning. We will explain this with the help of an example. In our example, let's say the array has a usable physical storage capacity of 50 terabytes, and that we had provisioned all of the 50 terabytes for creating thin volumes. Over a period of time, let's say only 20 terabytes has been used. Even though we provisioned 100% of physical storage capacity, we still have 30 terabytes of unallocated physical capacity on the array. So, if the business needs more storage capacity, then instead of purchasing and adding new physical storage capacity, we can over-provision the existing physical storage capacity by creating new thin volumes and having them use 30 terabytes of unallocated physical capacity that was already provisioned. Over-provisioning is done based on the past average storage utilization. So we can safely allocate 30 terabytes of thin volumes, making the storage array over-provisioned. However, it is important to closely monitor the physical storage capacity when it is over-provisioned, because when the physical storage capacity is exhausted, the servers will receive write errors. Over a period of time, when files are deleted in thin volumes, storage arrays will identify those blocks and release them back into the free pool of physical storage capacity. This technology is called zero-page reclaim. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what we have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about the two popular capacity optimization methods. These are compression and thin provisioning. When we covered compression, we looked at what compression was, and then we looked at the advantages of compression. We also looked at the types of compression in detail. These are post-process compression and real-time compression. The last thing about compression we talked about was applying deduplication before compression. Next, we covered thin provisioning. Under this topic, we looked at what thick provisioning was, and then we looked at what thin provisioning was. We also looked at what over provisioning was, and lastly, we talked about zero page reclaim. In the next lesson, you will learn about LUN provisioning techniques. Thank you for watching. Hello, and welcome to Unit 3, LUN Provisioning Techniques. In this lesson, you will learn about the LUN provisioning techniques. We're going to start by looking at what LUN provisioning is, and then we will look at a logical unit. We will also compare LUN with volume. Next, we will look at LUN masking. And in specific, we will look at LUN masking in servers and storage arrays. Now let's look at what LUN provisioning is. LUN provisioning is the process of allocating the physical storage capacity of a storage array to the server computers. When we spoke about SAN storage array, we mentioned how the storage is presented to the server computers. The physical storage capacity of a storage array has to be shared among the host servers, so it is partitioned into one or more logical disks assigned to the servers. 
these logical disks appear to the servers as local disks. The logical disk, or the logical unit as it is usually called, is identified by a unique number called the logical unit number, or LUN. It should be noted that the logical unit itself is commonly referred to as a LUN, and the logical unit number as a LUN ID. So when you hear someone say LUN, they may actually be referring to a logical unit instead of the logical unit number. And when they mention LUN ID, they are referring to the logical unit number. A logical unit can constitute a complete physical disk, or a portion of the physical disk, or a portion of the entire physical storage capacity of a storage array, or even an entire physical storage capacity itself. So, a logical unit can potentially span across a number of physical disks on a storage array, and yet it will appear as just one disk to the server. It should be noted that the storage capacity, as seen by the server, will be the same amount of physical storage capacity assigned to the LUN. The terms LUN and volume should not be confused with each other. While LUN is a unique number assigned to a logical unit, volume, on the other hand, is a broad term that denotes a contiguous area on a storage device and includes LUNs and partitions. Logical units play a vital role in the management of storage in the SAN storage array. They not only provide a logical abstraction between the host computers and the hard disk drives of the storage array, but logical units improve storage utilization. For example, if a server needs only 500 gigabytes of storage space, and if the available physical disk is 2 terabytes, then without the logical units, we would have to allocate the entire 2 terabytes to that server. On the other hand, we can create a logical unit with 500 gigabytes of storage capacity and allocate it to the server. The remaining 1.5 terabytes of 2 terabytes can be allocated to different servers. In addition to that, logical unit numbers function as logical identifiers that differentiate different logical disks and are used to assign access and control privileges. Now let's talk about LUN masking. LUN masking provides the servers with restricted access to the logical units of the storage array. It determines which logical units can be accessed by which servers. Now let's talk about how LUN masking is implemented in servers. The implementation of LUN masking in a server requires that the storage array controller supports multi-LUN capability. Software is installed in the server that provides the LUN masking capability. This software allows the server to be configured so that it can access all the logical units that are assigned to it, and ignore the rest of the logical units. The LUN masking function is carried out by one of the following, the driver and the HBA of the server, or the operating system of the server itself. This kind of LUN masking is ideally suited for environments that have a few servers connected to many heterogeneous storage devices. The drawback of implementing LUN masking in a server is that the server can actually see all the logical units, but it will ignore the ones that are not assigned. However, LUN masking at the server level is reliable, but it requires that all the servers have a common administration. Now let's talk about how LUN masking is implemented in the storage array. LUN masking is implemented at the front end controller of the storage array. Using LUN masking, we can bind a server to a specific LUN so that no other servers can access it. By implementing LUN masking, the servers can access only the LUNs they have been specifically assigned. It is important to note that servers are not aware of LUNs that were not assigned to them. And, even if they are aware of such LUNs, they still cannot access them. We will explain LUN masking with the help of an example. In our example, we have logical units of a storage array that store data of the production department and the accounts department. In this case, LUN masking is not implemented, so both the departments can access each other's data. However, 
This should not be the case if it violates the company's policy on data integrity and security. So, by implementing LUN masking, we can ensure that the departments can access only their respective LUNs. That brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about LUN provisioning techniques. We started by looking at what LUN provisioning is, and then we looked at logical unit. We also compared LUN with volume. Next, we looked at LUN masking, and in specific, we looked at LUN masking in servers and storage arrays. In the next lesson, you will learn about storage virtualization. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 4, Storage Virtualization. In this lesson, you will learn about storage virtualization. We're going to start by looking at what storage virtualization is, and then we will look at the benefits of storage virtualization. Next, we will look at a form of storage virtualization called host-based virtualization. Host-based virtualization requires software called a logical volume manager or LVM. So we will see how LVM works, and then we will look at the features of the Logical Volume Manager. After that, we will look at the storage controller-based virtualization and its benefits. Next, we will look at virtual provisioning, and then we will compare virtual provisioning with thin provisioning. Lastly, we will look at the benefits of virtual provisioning. Now let's look at what storage virtualization is. Storage virtualization is the abstraction of physical storage from the servers connected to it. It aggregates multiple physical storage devices, such as RAID arrays, disks, and tape drives into logical storage pools that can be shared among applications more efficiently. The logical storage so shared functions like physical storage. Examples of storage virtualization are host-based logical volume management, disk virtualization, and tape library virtualization. Storage virtualization also enables application and network independent management of storage by hiding the underlying complexities of configuration and management of individual physical storage devices. Now let's look at the benefits of storage virtualization. Storage virtualization increases the utilization of storage resources. This is done by aggregating the storage capacity of multiple physical storage devices into a pool of logical storage. Storage virtualization improves the performance of storage resources. The aggregation of multiple physical disks also results in the aggregation of IOPs, which improves the performance. Storage virtualization allows us to provision the storage needs of an application without having to manually configure the specific storage hardware. An application's storage capacity can be managed without bringing the application down. Host-based virtualization is a form of storage virtualization that requires software called a Logical Volume Manager to be running in the host. The Logical Volume Manager is also referred to as Volume Manager. And it is either available as part of the operating system or as a separate product. In the context of a Logical Volume Manager, the physical storage is referred to as physical volumes. The Logical Volume Manager aggregates the physical storage into a logical storage pool called a volume group. The host sees a volume group as if it were a physical hard disk. The logical volume manager then divides the volume group into one or more logical volumes. The host sees a logical volume as if it is a partition on the physical hard disk. The created logical volumes are assigned to the host applications. 
The Logical Volume Manager provides a virtualization layer that maps the physical drives to the pool of logical storage. We will explain this with the help of an example. In our diagram, we have four 500 gigabyte physical disk drives or physical volumes that can either be directly attached to the host or these could be from a SAN attached storage array. The Logical Volume Manager, or LVM, virtualizes the four 500 gigabyte physical disk drives into a single aggregated volume group of two terabytes. The volume group is then divided into two one terabyte logical volumes. These logical volumes with a file system on it will be presented to the application. So, the logical volume manager creates one or more logical volumes by virtualizing the physical storage available to the host, either locally or from a SAN attached storage array. Let's look at the features of the logical volume manager. The volume groups and the logical volumes can be managed even when the logical volume manager is used by the host. It is possible to move a logical volume during runtime to a different physical location. It's possible to increase the storage of an existing logical volume during runtime. It's also possible to group physical disks belonging to different storage subsystems into one volume group. Logical Volume Manager is not dependent on any particular storage system and treats everything as storage. Now let's talk about storage controller-based virtualization. In this type of storage virtualization, the storage array that provides controller-based storage virtualization has several heterogeneous storage arrays connected to its controllers. As a result, the storage array receives external storage, which it manages just like its own storage drives. The storage controller presents the external storage to the host as if it belonged to this storage array. This type of virtualization is block-based, hence it works with block-based logical units. We will explain the storage controller-based virtualization with the help of an example. In the diagram, we have two storage arrays whose storage needs to be virtualized. We have a few logical units configured on each of these storage arrays. In the center of our diagram, we have the storage array with controllers that are capable of virtualizing the other storage arrays. The storage arrays from vendor A and vendor B are connected to the virtualization controllers of the storage array that is at the center. This results in the storage of storage arrays being presented to the virtualization controllers, which in turn virtualizes them into a pool of logical storage. The virtualization controller then creates the logical units from the pool of logical storage and presents it to the host as if it belonged to this storage array. So, that's controller-based storage virtualization. Now let's look at the benefits of controller-based storage virtualization. It simplifies the management of heterogeneous storage arrays by consolidating management, replication, and availability tools. The enterprise storage array that provides controller-based storage virtualization can offer its features such as replication, partition, migration, and thin provisioning to the virtualized storage arrays. The Enterprise Storage Array with virtualization embedded in its controller has a large cache that can increase the performance of the external storage attached to it. Controller-based storage virtualization helps in non-disruptive migration of data without any application downtime. Now let's talk about virtual provisioning. Virtual provisioning allows a logical unit to exhibit more capacity to the host as opposed to its actual allocated physical storage capacity on the storage array. The physical storage capacity is allocated on demand based on the actual need of the application. Virtual provisioning allows for oversubscription on the storage array by presenting applications with more storage capacity than is physically available on the storage array. 
virtual provisioning is much more than thin provisioning because it includes tools for management and monitoring of logical units. The benefits of virtual provisioning are that it increases storage utilization, improves performance, and simplifies storage management when increasing capacity. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about storage virtualization. We started by looking at what storage virtualization is, and then we looked at the benefits of storage virtualization. Next, we looked at a form of storage virtualization called host-based virtualization. Host-based virtualization requires software called a Logical Volume Manager, or LVM, and we saw how LVM works. And then we looked at the features of the Logical Volume Manager. After that, we looked at storage controller-based virtualization and the benefits of it. Next, we looked at virtual provisioning, and then we compared virtual provisioning with thin provisioning. Lastly, we looked at the benefits of virtual provisioning. In the next lesson, you will learn about the monitoring and alerting capabilities needed to manage the storage infrastructure. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to Unit 5, Monitoring and Alerting. In this lesson, you will learn about the monitoring and alerting capabilities needed to manage the storage infrastructure. We're going to start by looking at the need for monitoring and alerting capabilities. And then we will talk about monitoring. After that, we will look at trending and forecasting. And then we will look at capacity planning. Next, we will look at what alerting is, and then we will look at the types of alerting. These are critical alert, warning alert, and information alert. We will also talk about the alerting methods, and these are SNMP traps, email, SMS, and call home option. After that, we will talk about the audit log. And then we will talk about the role of network time protocol in audit logging. We will also talk about the advantages and importance of audit logs. Next, we will talk about syslog. And lastly, we will talk about the benefits of syslog. Now let's look at the need for monitoring and alerting capabilities. We need monitoring and alerting capabilities to address common concerns, such as the following. How can we identify if the performance issue is because of storage? Or, how can we identify the storage bottlenecks before they slow down the applications? Or, how can we better understand the storage need of the organization? Monitoring data growth is essential for ensuring that applications don't run out of disk capacity. Without the ability to monitor the storage capacity, the storage administrators would not know when to provision the new disks. This problem is addressed by the use of trend reports provided by the storage management tools that forecast disk utilization. Trending is the analysis of data to discover recognizable patterns that indicate a particular type of behavior. Forecasting is the prediction based on those patterns on how a particular behavior will impact the business. Depending on the historic and current storage usage trends, storage administrators can forecast the future storage needs of a business. Let's explain this with the help of an example. On the slide, you can see a monthly trend report, which depicts the monthly storage use and the total available capacity in gigabytes. The blue line shows the monthly storage consumption, and the purple line shows the total available capacity. The blue line shows a trend, and to be specific, it is trending upwards. 
This means that the storage consumption is increasing on a month-to-month -month basis. Now, if we want to know how much storage space should be allocated in the month of December, then we can add a trending line based on the previous month's data. As you can see in the graph, the trending line allows us to forecast that a storage capacity of 80 gigabytes is likely to be used in the month of December. This report allows the storage administrator to track the storage usage against the total storage capacity. The next step after trending and forecasting is capacity planning. In capacity planning, we allocate storage capacity to satisfy the current and future needs of the business. Now we will talk about alerting. While monitoring the storage infrastructure, we want certain conditions to be brought to our notice. Alerting is a mechanism that notifies the designated users upon the occurrence or non-occurrence of an event. The notification so triggered is called an alert. For example, when storage allocation or utilization reaches a predefined threshold, the designated users are notified about it. Based on the severity of the situation, alerts can be categorized into three types. Critical alert, warning alert, and information alert. A critical alert is one that needs to be addressed immediately because it may negatively affect the business. For example, a storage array that is running out of capacity requires immediate action. A warning alert is one that needs to be addressed, but not immediately. For example, when a disk drive is running low on disk space, it can be addressed at a later time, but should be addressed before it becomes critical. An information alert is one that doesn't require any action. For example, if a backup is successful, it triggers an information alert. Now let's talk about the alerting methods. Alerting is commonly done through the following. SNMP traps, email, SMS, and using the call home option. SNMP stands for Simple Network Management Protocol. It is an application layer protocol meant for exchanging management data between the devices on a network. It is specifically used to monitor and manage devices on the network, such as routers, switches, servers, storage arrays, and so on. An SNMP implementation consists of the following, a managed device, SNMP agent, and SNMP manager. A managed device is the device on the network that requires some kind of monitoring and management. For example, a managed device could be a storage array. An SNMP agent is a program that runs on the managed device. SNMP collects information from the device and sends it to the SNMP manager. An SNMP manager is typically a computer that runs a network management system. It communicates with the SNMP agent. Management Information Base, or MIB, is a database maintained by an SNMP agent. It contains the information about the managed device, which is shared by both the SNMP agent and the SNMP manager. SNMP is typically enabled in a storage system. Whenever a specific event occurs in the storage system, the SNMP agent running on it will notify the SNMP manager by sending a message. Since this message is said to trap an event, it is called an SNMP trap. When the SNMP manager receives the event, it takes action depending on the event. In email and SMS alerting methods, when an event for which we had configured the alert occurs, the device will send out an email or SMS to the designated users. The call home alerting method refers to the ability of some high-end storage arrays to send encrypted email alerts to the vendor support center using SSL to notify of the faults. Now we will talk about the audit log. Audit logs provide a comprehensive history on a user's activity, such as the time of access and the changes made by the user on the applications and devices. 
Since the activities are tracked against date and time, it is necessary to use a reliable and trusted time source, such as the Network Time Protocol or NTP service. The NTP service can be configured on each system to regularly synchronize with the date and time of a common NTP server so that all the systems run with the same date and time. Let's look at the advantages of using audit logs. Audit logs help administrators to find out about any suspicious activity on the network or on the system. Audit logs provide the information necessary to validate the enforcement of security policies. Audit logs provide the information necessary for root cause analysis after a security incident. Some audit logs, such as those related to security events, must be protected from unauthorized access since they can be tampered with or deleted. In addition to that, audit logs can also be protected from incidents such as device failures by implementing cross-platform logging solutions such as syslog. Syslog is a protocol for exchanging log messages. It can be used by the devices on the network to move audit logs to a central logging server called a syslog server. Syslog allows the consolidation of audit logs from multiple devices into a single place. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about the monitoring and alerting capabilities needed to manage the storage infrastructure. We started by looking at the need for monitoring and alerting capabilities, and then we talked about monitoring. After that, we looked at trending and forecasting, and then we looked at capacity planning. Next, we looked at what alerting is, and then we looked at the types of alerting. These are critical alert, warning alert, and information alert. We also talked about the alerting methods. These are SNMP traps, email, SMS, and call home option. After that, we talked about the audit log, and then we talked about the role of network time protocol in audit logging. We also talked about the advantages and importance of audit logs. Next, we talked about syslog, and lastly, we talked about the benefits of syslog. In the next lesson, you will learn about storage performance. Thank you for watching. Hello, and welcome to Unit 1, Storage Performance. In this lesson, you will learn about storage performance. We're going to start by looking at what storage performance is, and then we will look at basic terms used in storage performance. These are I.O., I.O. request, sequential I.O., random I.O., throughput, and latency. Next, we will look at what a cache is, and then we will look at the types of cache. These are volatile cache and non-volatile cache. After that, we will talk about the write operations to cache. The write operation to cache is done in two ways. These are write back and write through. We will also look at read operation using cache, and specifically, we will look at cache hit and cache miss situations. Next, we will look at storage tiering and the purpose of storage tiering. After that, we will look at the types of storage tiering, and these are manual storage tiering and automatic storage tiering. We will also talk about an automatic storage tiering solution called Hierarchical Storage Management, or HSM. Next, we will look at what a storage profile is and then we will look at what a partition is. After that, we will talk about clusters, and then we will talk about partition alignment. We'll also talk about file fragmentation and defragmentation. Next, we will look at what baselining is. And lastly, 
we will look at the advantages of baselining. Now we will look at what storage performance is. Storage performance is a measure of how effectively a storage device operates. It deals with the I.O. performance of a storage device. Let's look at a few basic terms that are used when talking about storage performance. I.O. stands for input-output, which could be a write or read operation. I.O. request. An I.O. request is the request by an application to read or write a certain quantity of data. Sequential I.O. Blocks of I.O. requests that are consecutively read or written. Random I.O. Blocks of I.O. requests that are randomly read or written. We will see how latency and throughput impact storage performance. Throughput is the rate at which the data is delivered by a storage device. There are two ways in which throughput is measured, I.O. rate and data rate. I.O. rate is normally used for applications such as transaction processing, in which I.O. requests are small. It is measured in I.O. operations per second. Data rate is normally used for applications such as scientific applications, in which I.O. requests are large. It's measured in megabytes per second. Latency is the time taken to complete an I.O. request. It's also called response time. It's measured in milliseconds. Now let's talk about storage cache. Cache is a semiconductor-based memory. It temporarily stores data to reduce the time taken to service the application's I.O. requests. We know that a disk drive is the slowest component of a computer. Being mechanical in nature, the read-write operations on a disk will normally take a few milliseconds so there will be a delay in servicing an I.O. In other words, the response time or latency will be high. On the contrary, accessing data from a cache for read-write operations is faster than accessing it from disks. This is because a cache is semiconductor-based memory, and accessing data doesn't involve seek time and rotational latency, as in disks. When an application has a write request, the write data is placed in the cache and then written to the disk. The application receives an acknowledgement as soon as the write data is placed in the cache. From the application's perspective, the write operation is complete. The advantage of buffering the write data to the cache is that the host computer doesn't have to wait until the data is actually written to the disk. Similarly, to serve the read request of an application, the data that will be read again is placed in cache. The advantage of buffering the read data is that the host computer doesn't have to repeatedly access the data from the disk. Hence, cache increases the I.O. performances of storage devices by reducing the response time to access the data. Cache can be divided into two types, volatile cache, and non-volatile cache. In volatile cache, data is retained as long as there is power. In the event of a power outage, data in the volatile cache will be lost. This type of cache is only good for reads and non-critical writes. In non-volatile cache, data is retained even when there is no power. In the event of a power outage, data in the non-volatile cache will not be lost. It is referred to as battery-backed write cache. This type of cache is good for reads and writes. Now let's talk about the write operation to cache in detail. The write operation to a cache is done in two ways, write back and write through. In the write back approach, whenever an incoming write from the host computer is placed in the cache, an acknowledgement is sent to the host computer without waiting for the data to be written to the hard disk. At a later time, after several writes, the data of the cache is destaged to the disk. In this approach, the response time is faster because the write operation is not affected by the mechanical delays of a disk. The risk of losing data is high when there is a cache failure. In the write-through approach, 
Whenever an incoming write from the host computer is placed in the cache, it is immediately written to the hard disk, and then an acknowledgement is sent to the host. In this approach, the response time is longer because the write operation is affected by the mechanical delays of the disk. There is a low risk of losing data when there is a cache failure because data is written to the disk as soon as it arrives. Now let's talk about the read operation to cache in detail. Whenever a host computer requests access to data, the cache is first checked to see if the data is available. If the data is available in cache, then it is retrieved and sent to the host. This situation is called cache hit. On the other hand, if the data is not available in cache, then it must be accessed from the disk. The retrieved data is placed in the cache and then sent to the host. This situation is called cache miss. Now let's talk about storage tiering. Storage tiering is the method of storing data on different types of storage media based on the criticality and usage frequency of the data. In tiered storage, the tiers represent the allocation of different types of storage media based on how fast the data needs to be accessed by the system. For example, in a three-tiered storage system, the top tier can represent the allocation of SSD drives to highly accessed data. The middle tier can represent the allocation of disk drives to the less accessed data. And the bottom tier can represent the allocation of tape drives to the rarely accessed data. Normally, the high-performing storage media will be on the tier that provides a quick access to the highly accessed data. The remaining tiers will be categorized based on the performance requirement of the data. And the rarely accessed data will be stored on a tier with the slowage storage media. Storage tiering is primarily done to reduce the cost associated with storing the data because the high performance storage media is very expensive compared to the slower storage media. There are two types of storage tiering, manual storage tiering and automatic storage tiering. In manual storage tiering, data is manually moved to different types of storage media based on its criticality and usage frequency. This process is labor intensive and the administrator has to keep track of where the data was moved so that it can be made available when needed. In automatic storage tiering, the administrator defines the policies and priorities that govern what data resides in which tier, and the system automatically moves the data to the relevant tiers without any human intervention. Hierarchical Storage Management, or HSM, is an automatic storage tiering solution that was developed by IBM in the early 1980s. The HSM system will scan the data and find files that have not been accessed for some time. Then, it will automatically move them to a lower tier of storage media, such as tape. This migration of data is not visible to the user. In place of the moved files, small stubs, which have internal pointers to the actual files on the tape, are created. These stubs look like the actual file, and if a user tries to access them, then the actual files will be automatically retrieved from the tape. This recall of files may take several minutes as it involves mounting the tape, positioning it, and copying the files back to the disk. When we talk about storage performance, it's necessary to mention storage profile. A storage profile is what defines the storage performance characteristics, such as RAID level, stripe size, segment size, and dedicated hot spare. The default configuration of a storage system typically uses the default storage profile that provides balanced access to storage. However, depending on the I.O. requirements of the applications using the storage, a storage profile with different performance characteristics can be selected or created by a custom storage profile. Now let's talk about partitions and its impact on storage performance. A partition is an operating system concept of making a single physical hard disk drive function as multiple logical disk drives. For example, 
On a computer with the Windows operating system, a single physical hard disk drive can be partitioned into multiple logical disk drives such as C, D, E, and so on. The point is that a single physical hard disk drive can have multiple partitions. Each such partition is a logical disk drive that can have its own file system. For example, we can have the C drive with a Windows file system that can boot into a Windows operating system. On the same physical hard disk drive, we can also have the E drive with the EX2 file system that has the ability to boot into a Linux operating system. A cluster size is decided when a partition is formatted by the operating system. It can be expressed in sectors. For example, if the sector size of a physical hard disk drive is 512 bytes, then a 4 kilobyte cluster will have 8 sectors. One of the factors that affect the storage performance is the omission to do a partition alignment on the disks. A partition is said to be misaligned when its clusters are not aligned with the sectors of the physical hard disk drive. So, when an application tries to access the data, it may not be in the location where it is supposed to be because of a misalignment. As a result, additional read-write operations are involved to access the data, which degrades the storage performance. Now let's talk about how file fragmentation affects the storage performance by causing additional I.O. operations. File fragmentation refers to a phenomenon in which the data of a file is stored in non-contiguous clusters in the file system. This happens when the system cannot allocate contiguous disk space to store an entire file. When a file is not contiguously stored on a disk, the data in the file cannot be easily located in consecutive clusters. This affects I.O. performance because to access data from different locations on the disk, additional seek time and rotational latency is involved. Defragmentation is done to reduce the fragmentation by reorganizing the data that makes up the file. Next, we will talk about baselining. A baseline is the initial measurement of a metric, such as IOPS, that can be continuously monitored to check if anything has changed. Baselining is the method of analyzing current storage performance against a baseline. Baselining can be of great value when it comes to identifying the cause of problems. The only way to know if storage is performing as expected is to capture the performance metrics when the storage is functioning properly. At a later time, during troubleshooting, storage administrators can compare this data with the data gathered when the storage performance started deteriorating. Baselines are also used to identify trends, such as storage usage over a period of time. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about storage performance. We started by looking at what storage performance was, and then we looked at the basic terms used in storage performance. These are I.O., I.O. request, sequential I.O., random I.O., throughput, and latency. Next, we looked at what a cache is, and then we looked at the types of cache. These are volatile cache and non-volatile cache. After that, we talked about the write operations to cache. The write operations to cache are done in two ways. These are write back and write through operation. We also looked at read operation using cache. And in specific, we looked at cache hit and cache miss situations. Next, we looked at storage tiering. And then we looked at the purpose of storage tiering. After that, we looked at the types of storage tiering. These are manual storage tiering and automatic storage tiering. We also talked about an automatic storage tiering solution called Hierarchical Storage Management, or HSM. Next, we looked at what a storage profile is, and then we looked at what a partition is. After that, we talked about clusters, and then we talked about partition alignment. We also talked about file fragmentation and defragmentation. 
Next, we looked at what baselining is. And lastly, we looked at the advantages of baselining. In the next lesson, you will learn how to identify and resolve common problems in FC SAN. Thank you for watching. Hello, and welcome to Unit 1, FC SAN Troubleshooting. In this lesson, you will learn how to identify and resolve common problems in FC SAN. We're going to start by looking at what troubleshooting is, and then we'll see how to troubleshoot problems. Next, we will talk about troubleshooting in the FC SAN environment. When we cover troubleshooting in FC SAN, we will look at troubleshooting associated with the fiber optic cables. We will also look at the distances supported by fiber optic cables, and in specific, we will look at the categories of multi-mode fibers that support different speeds and distances. After that, we will talk about troubleshooting fiber channel switches, and then we will look at troubleshooting the host bus adapters. While talking about troubleshooting host bus adapters, we will look at troubleshooting the problems associated with a failed HBA, HBA dropping links between a server and an FC switch, and a corrupted HBA driver. Next, we will talk about troubleshooting the storage arrays, and then we will talk about troubleshooting the servers. We'll also look at troubleshooting the problems associated with zoning, and then we'll look at what FCPing is. Lastly, we will look at a few troubleshooting scenarios. Now let's look at what troubleshooting is. Troubleshooting is all about analyzing and solving problems. The best thing to do is not to let the problem happen in the first place. As the old saying goes, prevention is better than the cure. So it's highly recommended to do things right the first time we do them. For example, a new server may not connect to the storage because of an incorrect zone configuration. Getting the zone configuration right the first time saves the time and frustration involved in troubleshooting the issue. An important thing about troubleshooting is that we should know how things work correctly in an environment before we try to figure out what went wrong. A logical step-by-step -step approach in troubleshooting helps eliminate the possible causes in order to identify the exact cause of the issue. When the exact cause of the problem is known, the problem becomes easy to fix. In a fiber channel SAN, all the components involved should work together properly if a server has to access the storage in the storage array. So, if a server is not able to access the storage, then there is a chance the problem could lie with one or more components of the FC SAN. Let's look at troubleshooting of FC SAN components. We will start with fiber optic cable. A faulty fiber optic cable cannot transport data. If the LEDs next to the port where the fiber optic cable is plugged in don't light up, then the following options could be the problem. The cable is not plugged in properly at both ends, or the cable is broken. So, if the LED doesn't light up, even after the fiber optic cable is plugged into the port, then the problem could be with the cable. But what if the port itself is not working? So, it is recommended to check the cable by plugging the cable into the port that is working. If the LED next to the port still doesn't glow, then the problem is with the fiber optic cable. When troubleshooting, never look into the ends of a fiber optic cable, as the light coming out of it could damage your eyes. When connecting two devices such as a server's HBA and a switch using a fiber optic cable, the transmit or TX port at one end should always be connected to the receive or RX port at the opposite end. For example, the connection from the server's HBA to a switch port should be from the transmit port to the receive port and the receive port to the transmit port, as shown in the diagram. If the cable is connected the other way around, such as transmit port to transmit port, then there will be no connectivity and the switch port will show no connection. We know that multimode fibers with 50 microns and 62.5 microns can support data transmission up to a distance of 500 meters and 175 meters, respectively. In addition to that, multimode fibers are further categorized by an optical multimode or OM designator. 
These are labeled from OM1 to OM4. The maximum distances supported by each of these OM designators at different common fiber channel speeds are tabulated as shown in the slide. When troubleshooting a connectivity issue between fiber channel devices, it is necessary to check if the fiber optic cable supports the speed and distance of the link between the devices. Now let's look at troubleshooting fiber channel switches. A fiber channel switch can be configured to send SNMP alerts for failures such as port failures, power supply failures, and switch failure itself. Since it is not possible to remember all the port and zone configurations of a switch, it is important to back up the correct configuration of the FC switch. This will come in handy when we are replacing a failed switch with a new one. Now let's look at troubleshooting host bus adapters. An HBA's LED lights do not light up either when it has failed or if it is not seated properly in the motherboard. In such a situation, the applications on the server will display error messages because it will not be able to connect to the storage using the HBA's device driver. If the HBA failed, replace it with a new or working HBA. After replacing the failed HBA, if the server is not able to communicate with the storage, then it could be that the zone configuration is still using the failed HBA's WWN. In such a situation, the WWN of the new HBA should be replaced in the zone configuration in order for the server to see the storage. Instead of an outright failure, the HBA could be dropping the link between the server and the FC switch. Before we conclude that the HBA is defective, we can test it by plugging it into a test server. If the HBA works without any issues on the test server, then the problem could be related to the following, a corrupted HBA driver, or the HBA configuration file on the server changed. The issue of a corrupted driver can be fixed by uninstalling the existing driver and reinstalling the recommended driver from the HBA vendor. If the driver you are installing is a new version, then it is highly recommended to test it on a test server before installing it on a production server to avoid any issues. Now let's look at troubleshooting storage arrays. Storage arrays have redundant components, so even if a component fails, its redundant component will resume operation and the diagnostic software of the SAN array will send alerts to the designated user about the failure or use the call home option to get support from the storage array vendor. Now let's look at troubleshooting the server. Occasionally, a server may not show the storage from the storage array. In such cases, rebooting the server without affecting the production may help resolve the issue. It's a good practice to run the patches or updates recommended by the storage vendors. The patches or updates usually contain fixes for known issues or bugs. Now let's look at troubleshooting zoning. Zoning establishes a connection between the server and the storage. The zoning configuration contains the WWN of the HBA's port and the WNN of the storage array's port. If the zoning configuration is altered or if a different zoning configuration is implemented, then it will affect the connection between the server and the storage. If a server is not able to see the storage when there is no problem with any of the SAN components, then it's likely to be a problem with the zoning configuration. Now let's look at what FCPing is. FCPing is a command line utility that is used to check the connectivity to a remote device on a fiber channel SAN. In order to check if the remote device is accessible, we give the FCPing command the worldwide port name or the worldwide node name of the remote device. This is done on the command line of the host or switch by typing the FCPing command followed by the worldwide name of the remote device as shown in the slide. When we use FCPing, the command performs a zoning check between the source and the destination. Irrespective of the remote device's zoning configuration, the FCPing command sends the ELS frame to the destination port. If FCPing is successful, then the device is accessible from the source. But if the remote device doesn't respond or rejects the ELS request, then it is possible that the remote device is not supporting the ELS echo request. In such a situation, it's not safe to assume that the remote device is not connected, and you should continue with further troubleshooting. 
Now let's discuss a few troubleshooting scenarios. Scenario 1. In this scenario, we have a server with two HBAs going to one switch, which in turn is connected to a storage array. The zone configuration is based on the WWNs of the HBAs. You notice that after a cleaning person left the server room, a server lost its connectivity on one of its dual redundant paths to the SAN. Though the cables are secured tightly from the two HBAs on the server to the switch, you notice that the fault light next to the port of one of the HBAs is on, and the corresponding port on the switch is also not lit. What could be the problem? Resolution of Scenario 1 The HBA is definitely not unseated. If it were unseated, then we would not see the fault light next to the HBA port. In spite of the cable being properly plugged in to both the HBA port and the switch port, if the LED lights are not green on these ports, then the problem could be with the cable. In order to confirm this, we can plug both the ends of the cable into ports that we know work. If the LEDs next to the ports don't light up, then the problem is with the cable. It must be damaged. Scenario 2 in this scenario, a server has been in use on a storage area network for a year. All of a sudden, it cannot see the remote storage. The server HBA doesn't have its LED lit up. The switch port where the server connects also doesn't show any connectivity. Moving the cable from the server to a different working port on the same switch didn't help because there was also no sign of connectivity. Assuming the cable is working fine, what could be the problem? Resolution of Scenario 2 The problem is with the server HBA. It may be unseated from the PCI expansion slot of the server. Or it could have failed. A failed HBA doesn't have its LED lit, and the application on the server would throw error messages because it wouldn't be able to connect to the storage using the failed HBA's device driver. Scenario 3 in this scenario, we have a new server with a single HBA connected to an FC switch, which in turn is connected to a storage array. The user is experiencing connectivity issues between the server and the FC switch. The link between the server and the FC switch is running at 4 gigabits per second on a 100 meter cable that has optical multimode designator OM1. Assuming that all the other SAN components are working fine, what could be the problem? Resolution of Scenario 3 When we troubleshoot the connectivity issue between a new server and an FC switch, if the cable is a multi-mode fiber optic cable, then the first thing we need to check is the optical multi-mode designator. In our case, the cable has an optical multi-mode designator, OM1, that only supports a distance of 70 meters at 4 gigabits per second speed. Hence, the cable used should be OM2, not OM1. Scenario 4 In this scenario, all the servers in the storage area network lost their connection with the remote storage when a firewall was installed in the data center. What could be the problem? Resolution The firewall has blocked the communication between the servers and the remote storage. In order to resolve this issue, TCP port 3260 must be permitted on the firewall. Scenario 5. In this scenario, a user is not able to see the newly added LUN on the server. As a storage administrator, what should you do to help the user see the newly created storage on the server? Resolution. When we run a disk rescan on the server, the user should be able to see the newly added LUN on it. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned how to identify and resolve common problems in FC SAN. We started by looking at what troubleshooting is, and then we saw how to troubleshoot problems. Next, we talked about troubleshooting in an FC SAN environment. When we covered troubleshooting in FC SAN, we looked at troubleshooting associated with the fiber optic cables. We also looked at the distances supported by fiber optic cables, and specifically, we looked at the categories of multimode fibers that support different speeds and distances.
After that, we talked about troubleshooting fiber channel switches. And then we looked at troubleshooting the host bus adapters. While talking about troubleshooting host bus adapters, we looked at troubleshooting the problems associated with a failed HBA, HBA dropping links between a server and an FC switch, and a corrupted HBA driver. Next, we talked about troubleshooting the storage arrays, and then we talked about troubleshooting the servers. We also looked at troubleshooting the problems associated with zoning, and then we looked at what FCPing is. Lastly, we looked at a few troubleshooting scenarios. In the next lesson, you will learn about the command line tools that are used to troubleshoot TCP IP networks. Thank you for watching. Hello, and welcome to Unit 2, LAN Troubleshooting. In this lesson, you will learn about LAN troubleshooting. We're going to start by looking at the command line tools that are used to troubleshoot TCP IP networks. We will look at the ping command, which tests for connectivity, and then we will look at the traceroute command, which traces a ping route. You should know about the ICMP protocol, the control messaging protocol. It is used by both the ping and traceroute command. After that, we will talk about the NS lookup, which stands for name server lookup. It converts between an IP address to a fully qualified domain name such as yahoo.com. We will also talk about IP config or IP configuration. Next, we will look at troubleshooting common networking problems including no connectivity, intermittent connectivity, and slow connectivity. First, we will talk about the ping command. The ping command is used to test end-to-end -end connectivity. It sends the packet of information, which is ICMP, through a connection and waits to receive some packets back. It can also be used to test the maximum transmission units, or MTUs. MTU is the maximum size of a data packet that can be sent over a network. Using ping, we can test the time it takes for data to travel from source to destination. Ping can also be used on the local host. The IP address of the local host is 127.0.0.1. We can test this by opening the command prompt in the Windows operating system and typing in ping and then the IP address. We are at the command prompt and we will type, for example, ping 127.0.0.1, which is the IP address of the local host. We will press enter, and the trip time, as you can see, is less than one millisecond, and there is no loss of data. If we ping google.com, you will notice that it will first figure out the IP address. You will also notice that it also presents the time it takes to get to google.com and come back. We also see the ping statistics. For example, four packets were sent and four of them received with zero loss. On an average, it takes 27 milliseconds from here to Google. We will talk about some of the switches that are used with the ping command. Ping-t pings the host until the command is stopped manually. So let's say we want to know if a server on our local area network is up and running after we rebooted it. The ping command with a dash T switch can be used to find out if the server is up and running. Ping dash N pings a host a specific number of times. We can specify the number, for example, when we want to ping a host 10 times or 20 times. There is also ping dash L which pings a host by specifying the number of bytes we want to send as opposed to 32. For example, we might want to send 64 bytes or something for a bigger test. We will demonstrate the ping feature with the local host. So we will type ping 127.0.0.1 
followed by dash T, and then we will press Enter. What it does is it continuously pings the same IP address again and again. So if we are waiting for our server to come back online, this will tell us whether it is online or not. We can exit the running ping command by pressing Ctrl C. The next one we will talk about is Traceroute. Traceroute tests where connectivity may have been lost. Traceroute, like ping, also uses the ICMP protocol. It shows the time taken for a packet to travel between different devices from the source to destination. A portion of path traversed by a packet between the source and the destination is called a hop. For example, let's say a packet has to travel across four computers to reach the destination computer. Each one of these portions represents a hop. Traceroute is also used to find the location of a router that is down. And now we will go to the command prompt. And let's say we want to do a traceroute to google.com. Now it's going to show all the different hops and it's going to tell us how long it takes to get from one location to another. We can also see that we are in California. And now it has started to go out. It traversed different locations and it took 14 hops before it finally reached Google at this location. The next thing we will talk about is the Name Server Lookup, or NS Lookup. It is a networking tool that is used to query the domain name system to get information on a domain name or IP address. For example, we can do an NS Lookup to find out the IP address of Google.com. Let's go to the command prompt and let's type nslookup yahoo.com. As you can see, it will give us all the IP addresses of yahoo.com. It also tells us whether it is authoritative or non authoritative. Authoritative would be the information from a DNS server on the internet. Non-authoritative means it might be a local DNS server. Now we will talk about IPconfig. IPconfig stands for the Internet Protocol Configuration, or IP configuration. It shows current TCP IP network configuration values. For example, we can get information such as our IPv6 address, IPv4 address, subnet mask, default gateway, and so on. We use this as the first tool for troubleshooting network connectivity because it will tell us if the computer is receiving an IP address. Let's go to the Windows command prompt and type ipconfig. And we get all this information. We now see the IP configuration for every adapter that is on the computer. For example, we have a local area connection and wireless connection. You'll notice that we are only getting the IP address, the subnet mask, and the default gateway, and we are not getting any other information. There are several options that can be used with ipconfig. Let's use ipconfig slash all. And let's make this screen a little bigger. Now we can see a lot more information, including the DNS server address, which was not included originally, and the MAC address, which we call the physical address of the adapter. We also have the gateway address, which is provided. It also shows you whether DHCP is enabled. Now we will look at a few of the other options that can be used with ipconfig. The first is ipconfig slash release, which will release the current IP address. Let's say we have a bad IP address, 
somehow we got an IP address that another device already had. We could use IP release to release that IP address to another device. We can also use renew, which will renew the current IP address. While release lets go of an IP address, renew actually lets it go and then gets another IP address. In that sense, renew is a little more helpful. Finally, let's see ipconfig slash flush DNS, which erases and repropagates the DNS settings. So if you're having trouble, for example, the DNS is corrupted, by flushing the DNS, it erases all the DNS settings and then allows us to repropagate the DNS settings. Let's go to the Windows command prompt in an elevated mode. And let's type ipconfig slash renew, which is going to renew the IP address that we have here. With ipconfig slash flush DNS, it tells us that we have successfully flushed the DNS resolver cache and the cache being the information it stores on the computer. So now every time if we go out to a website, it's going to begin to repropagate the data from the internet. IPconfig can be used for troubleshooting because it can tell us if a computer is receiving an actual IP address from a DHCP server, or if it is receiving an APIPA, or a self-assigned address. We can also find out whether the IP address is private or public by looking at the IP address. You'll notice that 192.168.1.2 is a private IP address. This means that we are behind a router. If you're receiving a public IP address, then we know that we are directly connected to the ISP. It can also tell if something might be wrong with our setup. If the users are not able to connect to the internet, then the DNS server address is probably not configured correctly. And by releasing and renewing the IP address and flushing the DNS, it will help to resolve that problem. Now let's talk about common networking problems. We will first talk about no connectivity. The first thing we need to do is to verify the physical cables are present and properly plugged in. We should also make sure that the network adapter is enabled and has valid addressing for the subnet. For example, in the Windows operating system, we can go to Device Manager, and we can make sure the network adapter is running properly. As you can see here, there's no problem with any of them. The next thing we can do is ping the server to make sure TCP IP is installed properly. It could be that the hardware is working properly, but the protocols are not installed properly, which is not allowing us to connect. It's necessary to verify if anything has been changed recently, as it could have caused the problems. For example, sometimes firewall software updates can cause connectivity issues and rebooting the computer can sometimes fix the issue. Sometimes we might have disabled a port from a switch, so it is necessary to make sure that the disabled ports are enabled for connectivity. Basically, it's important to check all the physical connections and then the logical connections. So to summarize, no connectivity problems can result from bad cables and connectors, bad port, disabled port, or misconfigured switch port, bad NIC or misconfigured NIC, or corrupted or misconfigured software drivers. Next, we will talk about intermittent connections or connection drops. Intermittent connections can be a result of situations that prevent setting up a connection in the first place. So it's good to consider the situations that were discussed under the No Connection heading. The intermittent connections or dropped connections 
can happen because of a loss of physical or logical connectivity. Ping and traceroute can be used to find the location of intermittent problems. Intermittent connections or dropped connections typically result from bad cables and connections, bad NIC, bad port, and electrical noise. Now let's talk about networks being slow. A poor network performance can be the result of situations that prevent setting up a connection in the first place. So it's good to consider the situations discussed under the No Connection heading. The common causes for slow performance include the following. Overloaded servers, traffic congestions on a network link, severe frame loss, and inappropriate switch or router configurations. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Let's summarize what you have learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned about LAN troubleshooting. We started by looking at the command line tools that are used to troubleshoot TCP IP networks. We looked at the ping command, which tests for connectivity, and then we looked at the traceroute command, which traces a ping route. After that, we talked about NS Lookup, which stands for Name Server Lookup. It converts an IP address to a fully qualified domain name, such as yahoo.com. We also talked about IP Config or IP Configuration. Next, we looked at troubleshooting common networking problems, including no connectivity, intermittent connectivity, and slow connectivity. Thank you for watching.